Hi. Hello. Just a second. Ti jesi, dobro. Dobro, dobro sam. Leteći sam, ali dobro. Hi, Karolina. Hi, hello, everyone. Gonzalo is here. Yeah, he's there. Okay. Okay. So, um, if we are all ready or nearly ready, uh, I'm going to now officially open the last session of this third PhD seminar for PhD students or candidates as you like to call it, PhD colloquium. And uh, I have a great honor, actually, to, for the first time, uh, in cooperation with the ALF project, for those of you who don't know, and I don't think that there are many of you who don't already know the work of the ALF project. This is an, a, a project that is an EU Horizon twinning project with the, e, uh, with the aim to straighten academic research profile and research management, as well as administrative capacities, pardon, at the University of Belgrade Faculty of Law. So within the ALF program and the Institute uh, for Legal and Social Sciences at the Faculty of Law, University of Belgrade, we have a great honor to host this third colloquium, but for the first time, an international session. I would like to welcome you all, and without further ado, because time is of the essence, I would like to just briefly present myself. My name is Maria Vlajkovic, and I am a teaching assistant here at the Faculty of Law. And together with my colleagues, Anna Memeti and Valeria Dabitic, I am the, I would say, an organizer of this third colloquium. But uh, together, joining forces with the ALP team and my dear colleagues, which I am part of as well, we managed to organize this third session. So for the beginning, our first uh, PhD candidate who will open this session is Gonzalo Fabian. Fabian, did I, did I pronounce it well? I'm very sorry if I didn't. Okay, thank you, Gonzalo, who is a PhD candidate from the University of Lisbon School of Law and who will present his PhD thesis topic, Statutory Reservations as a Validity Condition on Norms Regulating Fundamental Rights. So, of course, for the commentators, we have Professor Boyan Spaic and Professor Andre Kristen. In order to respect the timeline and uh, the schedule, I would like to ask Gonzalo, firstly, to present briefly his PhD topic, and afterwards, the commentators around 10 or 12 minutes to give useful comments or suggestions, or maybe critiques, uh, to his presentation or the paper that they have received. And afterwards, we can all enjoy a, a short discussion on the topic that was presented. Thank you, Gonzalo. The floor is yours. Gonzalo, do you have a presentation to share? I don't hear you, unfortunately. I cannot hear you. But I can make you a presenter. That's very. As someone on the Buddha presenter. <laughs> so, can't you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you, but not so much. No. Really? <laughs> uh, well, let me just try to put my headset. Maybe that will help. Taking the time to greet all the others, hi Giovanni, hi Julietta, the ones I see at least. Okay, so how about now? Yes, we can hear you very well now. Okay, perfect. And I will try to share my presentation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm not. Uh, I I I can't I can't share it. But maybe if I send it to you. Uh, yeah, yeah, you can send it. You can send. 
Yeah, of course it is possible. You can send it to my email. Uh, I will write you just in the chat and I'll open it and then I can do the slides if you want. It will be easier. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about this. Okay, I've sent it. Check it. Jobs. <laughs> Jobs. <laughs> I just need to stick the one that I can, yeah. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. yes. Thank you very much. Do you see your presentation? Okay. Yeah. You start and you can just, you know, guide me with the next slide, the next slide, and I'll be your aid for today's session. All right? Deal. Thank you. Uh, so, thank you very much for having me in this uh, colloquium. I would like to thank the ELF project team and especially the Alf Belgrade team. And I would also like to especially thank professors Boyan Spaic and Andre Christian for accepting, commenting my uh, presentation. So my presentation is about my thesis, of course. Uh, and uh, my thesis has uh, this working title, which is a, a direct translation from Portuguese. Uh, and today I would like to focus on the concept of statutory reservations and how it is important an important part of my thesis. So if you don't mind changing the, to the next slide. Thank you very much. So uh, statutory reservation is a term that I intend to use to refer a phenomenon concerning the separation of powers. Uh, that phenomenon is basically a, a group of subject matters that is constitutionally allocated to the content of a statute enacted by the legislative power or to the content of the specific statute enacted by parliament uh, using of course its legislative power and i chose to fix the term uh, uh, statutory reservations and not deviate with synonyms because it refers to an established concept in constitutional law uh, it has a significant importance in German constitutional law, for instance, and its translation to English is usually statutory reservations. Um, in the Portuguese constitutional law, uh, as well as in other constitutional systems, it is frequent to say uh, or to see constitutional court's decisions declaring the unconstitutionality of norms because they breach the statutory reservation. This means that either a body uh, without legislative power enact the norm regu uh, regarding a subject matter reserved to the legislative power or a legislative body within its legislative power other than parliament enacted the norm regarding a subject matter reserved to parliament. I will focus specifically on fundamental rights as the reserved subject matter uh, because uh, in the Portuguese constitutional system, fundamental rights is a subject matter reserved to parliament. So therefore the government may not, and I stress the may, uh, may not, the, the government may not within its legislative powers enact norms regarding fundamental rights without a specific statute authorizing it to do so. And that statute is of course enacted by parliament. So far, I think it's fairly safe to assume that statutory reservations is an issue related to powers and competences. 
and for the purpose of this presentation uh, and also for the presence of my the purpose of my uh, whole dissertation i will prefer the term competence over power so uh, if uh, statutory reservation is a competence related issue one must understand what is the effect that statutory reservations have on competence so next slide please Okay, thank you. So this is the spark of my research, this article 198 of the Portuguese constitution. Uh, and basically what we have here um, needs a little context. Three quick notes on, con on contents. The first one, legislative function is the equivalent to legislative power. Second quick note, decree laws is the name of the statutes that government enacts. And third quick note, Assembly of the Republic is the Parliament. So according to this provision, the government is competent to enact decree laws on subject matters not reserved to Parliament. Fundamental rights is a, a subject matter reserved to Parliament. I understand competence as a dispositional property that is attributed to an individual through a constitutive norm and not a regulative norm. Therefore, uh, one can assume that being competent is a necessary, although not sufficient, that's contingent, condition for the result of the competence exercise to exist. So breaking this reasoning step by step and backwards. A norm exists because there is a statute with provisions that were interpreted. A statute exists because it was enacted. And the statute was enacted because someone else was competent to do so. So next slide, please. Does this mean that there, that there is only one norm that one obtains from this article, from this, from this provision? Is that norm a constitutive norm setting a negative condition on government being competent? Because if that were the case, then if the government enacted a decree law on fundamental rights, the constitutive norms negative condition would not be fulfilled and consequently the government wouldn't be competent to enact said decree law. If we conclude that the, comp the government wasn't competent, competent, then the decree law did not even exist. And I think this is not a faithful depiction of legal reality. Uh, it is often, uh, um, it is fairly often, uh, 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 rather, uh, for a decree law to be deemed unconstitutional because it concerns subject matter reserved to Parliament. But in order to a decree law to be deemed unconstitutional, it must exist. Uh, one cannot predicate uh, something unconstitutional if that something does not exist. Um, and I believe that the competence norms attribute this dispositional property of being competent to someone, and in this case, that someone is the government. So the government is competent to enact an act in the law, as Alfros mentions. And that act in the law can be about a multitude of subject matters. The government is competent to enact it. However, the second part of the legal provision mentioned, uh, um, which is underlined here, uh, is regulating the government's action of enacting a decree law. So next slide, please. I propose that when speaking of competence, one speaks of that specific dispositional property of being competent. When speaking of the content of the act in the law, one speaks on norms regulating the exercise of, the exercise of competence. Uh, thus, I suggest to tackle this issue through the notion of competence phenomena. Uh, and this term aims to comprehend competence norms, that is, norms attributing the dispositional property of being competent, this will be constitutive rules, norms. 
competence as a dispositional property, and this will be the status that enables someone to act. In this case, that action is enacting decree laws. Uh, norms regulating the exercise of competence, and these will be regulative norms that uh, permit, forbid, or impose the exercise of competence. Uh, in this case, this, uh, of statutory reservations, there is a prohibition on the exercise of the government competence. And finally, um, norms uh, uh, determining the validity and and or existence of the results of the exercise of the competence. And these will be again constitutive norms. Just a quick side note, I understand validity as legality and existence as membership. Uh, so for instance, a norm on the validity of a decree law may be one such as we have in the Portuguese constitution that determines as conditions for the validity of any act in the law or norm it's conformative with the constitution. Uh, thus, in the case of a decree law about fundamental rights, it's not like that decree law does not exist because government is not competent to enact it. It does exist and the government is competent to enact it. However, the government prima facie breached the constitutional prohibition on exercising its competence on fundamental rights. Therefore, prima facie, this decree law is invalid. And I am saying that prima facie, that decree law is unconstitutional or uh, invalid because being a statutory reservation, a regulative norm, it is perfectly possible that some normative conflict emerges between that prohibition and some other norm permitting the opposite. And I think this mindset is really important to deal with the issues relating to statutory reservations. So the next slide, please. Um, Gonzalo, so I another just have issue. to warn you that we have uh, just two or three minutes left. Uh, just to warn you, thank you very much for your understanding. Thank, thank you. you. I, I will just finish now. So uh, another issue related to statutory reservations is the one concerning the level of determinacy that a legal provision must have. Uh, and this is kind of an odd topic right now in Portuguese constitutional law, because the Portuguese constitutional court um, has been uh, deciding a lot uh, on, on, on these terms about determinacy, the problem of determinacy. And it is common to read, and the constitutional court itself has said so, that statutes should be determinate. Uh, and if they are not su sufficiently determined, they breach the statutory reservation. Uh, and this is a problem that arises mainly in the legislative administrative binomial. Does a statute which is not sufficiently determined and which deals with matters, subject matters, reserved to statutes would be at risk of not complying with the statutory reservation. Uh, the requirement of determinacy as one uh, particularity, because it concerns legal provisions established by an act in the law. Does the distinction between legal provisions, legal norms, and acts in the law takes on particular importance? And this is a question that I confess I have not yet gone into in sufficient depth. But apart from the, of course, necessary analysis of the various modalities of indeterminacy, which are studied within the philosophy of language, there is a question that I have asked myself in relation to this subject, uh, the answer to which I still do not have. How can a norm be unconstitutional on the grounds of its indeterminacy if the problems of determinacy have to be necessarily overcome in order for there to be a norm? Intuitively, intuitively, I think that the norm will not be unconstitutional because it's indeterminate. The norm will be unconstitutional because the terms used in the interpreted legal provision are indeterminate and the solution of the problems of indeterminacy has resulted 
in a situation in which the executive has an excessive level of discretion in its actions when executing the legal norm. And this concludes what I have to say. Thank you very much for your attention and I look forward for your comments. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. Once again, I apologize. I am very I'm sure that you have much more to say about your interesting topic, but unfortunately, due to time limits, we need to let the commentators give you their feedback. So, uh, Professor Boenspeich uh, asked if, uh, of course, our dear guest and friend, Professor Andre Christian, will be the first one to open the floor and give you the comments and suggestions. Thank you, Professor Christian, and I give you the word, the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Gonzalo. Thank you, everyone. Boyan. Um, I was actually planning to say that I agree with almost everything Boyan said because he was planned to speak before me. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, well, this is meant to be a comment that gives you some food for thought. Um, now, I know nothing about statutory reservations and even less about statutory reservations in Portugal. So please correct me if I say something that's utterly stupid. Um, first of all, I see, I, I think you would, it would be useful for you to clarify a few ideological presuppositions of your work, but these are probably a presuppositions of the legal discourse you're actually investigating. You say that statutory reservations have two different meanings, two different senses. Uh, in one sense, statutory reservations refer to the reservations of legislative powers, and the legislative powers are held by the parliament, the national parliament, the regional parliaments, or the government, right? On the other hand, you say that Statutory reservations refer to the legislative powers of the parliament alone. Okay. Now, how do you say statutory reservation in Portuguese? I can't hear you. But, but I've, yeah. Okay. Doesn't matter. It's it's reserve delay. Yeah, reserve delay. So now, here is an ideological presupposition, I think, in in your research, because you're saying that lay should be or could be interpreted in two different ways. Either, um, let's put it this way, lato sensu, which means lay of the parliament or decree law of the government and so on. But there's also a stricto sensu interpretation you could give to this word, to this term, and that is um, lay is the statute of the parliament and nothing else, okay? So here you've made a choice, but you haven't justified your choice. You, you didn't say why. Now, I suppose, I imagine that you did it because Basically, everyone does it in the legal discourse in Portugal. But that's not ne a necessary choice, right? You could say, no, lay is lay, and it only means something that we call lay lato sensu, or it only means something that we call lay stricto sensu. So that's my first comment. And then I'd have two more comments, I'll try to be short. When you said that if we declare a law or a decree law uh, unconstitutional, it is because it exists. We couldn't declare something unconstitutional if it didn't exist. Um, in different terms, in terms of the philosophy of language, you could say that if we say that X is unconstitutional, we are presupposing the existence of X. Fine, 
that's true. But you could also say that we use language um, somehow sloppy, you know? We have somehow sloppy uses of language. So this is a way of expression, but it's not that we actually mean everything we say, right? Um, so perhaps you're taking the expressions of lawyers in legal discourse a bit too seriously. And you could actually avoid the problem, dissolve the problem, just saying that, well, this is a sloppy use of the words that attribute unconstitutionality to a statute. By saying a statute is unconstitutional, that they could want to say both things. Because if it doesn't exist, it can't be constitutional either, right? So you could say, okay, so X is unconstitutional may mean two things. X exists, but it is in conflict with the constitution. That's the first sense. And then the second sense of X is unconstitutional is X doesn't exist and therefore it cannot conform to the constitution. I'm not saying there's any error in what you did up until now. I'm just saying you could make some clarificatory work before you start analyzing legal discourse as it's used in Portugal. And then there's my final comment. You said, how can the norm be unconstitutional because of the indeterminacy of the provision? That is, we have a legal provision that is a text. We attribute a meaning to this legal provision. So the meaning we attribute to the legal provision, that's the norm. That's how you take it, right? And you say, so why would you say that the norm is unconstitutional, that the norm has any defect if what's going on is that the provision has some defects, right? I don't see such a big problem in this because you could say, let's put it that way. If um, there's a, some problem with, no, oh, I, I was trying to find a metaphor, but I'll try to avoid it. Um, you could simply say that any norm whatsoever that would be, that would come from, that would be derived from an undeterminate provision is deficient, right? So I don't know what, why you're wondering about this question of unconstitutionality of the norm because of the indeterminacy of the provision. If the you, you go to a sink, right? You go to a sink in a bathroom. And so there's a sink. You can say this is a provision, right? This is the form. And then you open the sink and what comes out is water, right? If the sink is arsenic, would you drink the water? And what you're saying, why are we blaming the water if the problem is in the pipe? And I'm saying because anything that comes out of that pipe is deficient. Okay, so this was just some food for thought. I'll finish here and maybe come back to you in Q&A. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kristen, and thank you for your comments. Uh, I will just, before the, the Q&A, I will give the word to the other commentator, Professor Boyan Spaich. Thank you, Maria, and thank you, Andre. Um, I agree with everything that Andre said. No, but uh, with, <laughs> without agreeing, I'm actually going to um, uh, uh, to comment on this, but later on, uh, it's uh, I'm I'm very very uh, interested in this in this um, PhD proposal at least the short summary, and I think it it can go um, uh, it, it can be the project can be absolutely fantastic when it goes, if, if it goes in the right direction and hopefully will help you 
with some of these comments. The, the two topics uh, that you propose as the most prominent or the two perspectives that you propose as the most prominent in analyzing statutory reservations are actually these, this perspective of differentiating between constitutive and regulative norms. And the other one would be this issue of determinacy and, and legislative reservation. And I'll, I'll, do, uh, I'll comment on both of these and mention additionally some of the stuff that you, you wrote about in this short proposal that I have here. Some of the things that you did in the presentation, I, I think, a tad more determinate than than this uh, than the thing that we had that I had at least in this brief paper in this uh, brief PDF. Uh, but no matter, I mean, it, it's always this. It's always this developing thing. Um, now, I think that one point at least is crucial if you, if you're trying to assess statutory reservations from these two perspectives. Um, you should kind of, kind of at least try to go down these two paths without branching much. And I saw that you're mentioning um, uh, some German doctrines, you're mentioning some United States doctrines with which you try, or at least are going to try to explain uh, uh, these issues. And I'll ask you, of course, for a comment on how how can they be useful? But uh, what I want to comment is on this um, competence norms and, um, and um, constitutive and regulative rules. So it's not clear entirely to me, and I'll start from this because Andre did the determinacy thing a bit, and I'm just going to have a brief comment on this determinacy issue. It doesn't seem clear to me um, that there are any, and I want to hear your argument for this, there are any, um, let's say, well, not practical implications, but advantages from the analysis that you give in this crucial paragraph here, where you claim that answers to the questions of uh, how does one get to be competent, what does it mean to be competent, how does one exercise competence, and um, and what are the conditions for the result of the competence exercise to be existent and valid? Uh, from this strict differentiation uh, between constitutive and, and regulative norms. And I think that at least in this um, short description of your project, you're, you are making a lot of it, but I don't think that much will hinge on this. Here are my reasons. And just... As, as a side note, I'm completely thrilled that you're undertaking this analysis. This could be one of the pathways where, uh, in which this could lead you. Um, competence norms, if I understood it correctly, and knowing the other stuff done in Lisbon by, by Pedro and by David, are thought of as constitu constitutive norms. But the competence norm regulating statutory reservation is not according to you a constitutive norm, but a regulative norm. So you make this entire point of claiming that these are actually regulative norms. Now, I'm not sure about this, and I would need some clarification that you, uh, that um, it seems that you suppose that constitutive norms cannot be defeated, while regulative norms can be defeated. And this is the, the reason for you to make this short analysis of these four issues and the ones that fall under the constitutive regulative distinction, or at least the issues that are constitutive or uh, answered with constitutive norms and the issues that are answered by regulative norms. Uh, I, I would like to hear more about this when you have the chance in the Q&A. Uh, let me give you this possibility. While uh, it can, in fact, be put into question, it is commonly supposed that constitutive norms can act as reasons for action. In other words, that every constitutive norm has a, a regulative component. And this, since Searle stated it, basically most of the people and all of the people that I know of, except maybe for David, in, in legal philosophy, claim that uh, constitutive norms can have a regulative function. Now, it's a bit difficult to argue for this philosophically, but common, it's 
like quite common this position. Now, if the constitutive norms have this regulative aspect in them, it would seem that even if you suppose that constitutive norms cannot be defeated, at least this regulative part or the regulative aspect of the constitutive, constitutive norms can in fact be defeated. So that's why I'm saying that at least the way I say it, not much hinges on this differentiation, strict differentiation, I commend you for it, but not much hinges on this, uh, this strict, strict difference between constitutive, uh, constitutive parts and regulative parts when it comes to legislative uh, reservation. Um, so if this is so, then I don't really see a good reason for going through all the trouble to arguing that only some of the competence norms are exclusively constitutive and others exclusively regulative, even if the explanation of constitutive and regulative can be of some use in this case. Now, um, the, uh, as for the question that you posed, I think that you know, most of what Andre said um, most of what Andre said applies perfectly for this, but I think we are lacking some uh, maybe context because uh, actually what the Constitutional Court of Portugal is doing is some kind, it has some kind of void for vagueness doctrine or something like that. Uh, so basically they declare uh, a, a, a decree law or a decree law unconstitutional if it's not clear enough or if it's vague uh, we, uh, unfortunately i'm not I, I would like to to have some clarifications of this because many courts or at least in the jurisdiction that i don't know of don't have these strict voice for vagueness doctrines even the european court of human rights has it somewhere in the criminal law and something like that now and as a third comment uh, you mentioned that you have this basic question of what does it mean? Uh, what does statutory reservations exactly mean? But at least in your proposal, and it's a commendable question and one that is not easy to answer. But in the rest of your proposal, you have additional questions. And I, I think that it would do the proposal good if you um, scrutinize this by yourself and and uh, eliminated those questions that you don't really want to answer in different ways for example one of the questions that i noticed is in which circumstances might the executive branch enact a degree on fundamental rights when this is in the competence of the parliament this is one additional question that you mentioned and this question could be in the domain of determinacy and indeterminacy. Um, but at one point, you even mentioned balancing. Oh, and connected to this status of um, regulative rules as rules of exercising competence. So I would, of course, like to ask you, how does balancing fit in this picture that's the first question and the um like bring into question mentioning balancing here at all except in the situation where there is a conflict between two principles but I kind of so you started from this uh from this uh, one conception of uh, statutory reservations. Everything that's mentioned in the Constitution is given to the Parliament. Then you dilute this conception of statutory reservations and you claim, uh, but the government can enact decrees that conflict somehow with legislative power. Then you say, when the government does this, it's not nullified or annulled because it's in conflict with the legislative power, but it should be balanced with what the legislative power did. It would seem to me that there is a formal principle here, or Alexei would claim it's a formal principle. If there is a conflict, it's automatically defeated. 
might be that I'm missing uh, the, the act of the government is automatically defeated, basically because of this formal principle set by the Portuguese constitution. I might be wrong on this, but yeah, you, you'll def, you'll uh, think you have time to come but to answer and comment. Thank you so much, Maria. Hopefully, I did it in ten minutes. No, I five less maybe even less um yeah i i yeah i don't have a very um good timekeeping because i know how it is important to hear the 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 comments from both professors and that will really guide you to to the finish line actually to finishing your phd dissertation in a way that's in accordance to all the comments that you receive right now and i see that your mentor is here as well uh listening to this session which is good uh i have if you want, Gonzalo, and if you have the answer to the questions that were raised here by both professors, I can give you additionally, but really a few minutes, uh, and then we can continue on when we have later on the, the time for the further discussion on this topic, if you agree. I'm very sorry that I have to be the strict one here, but that is just in order to have time for the other candidates. Uh, Gonzalo? Okay, uh, thank you. So, um, you can hear me? Yeah, it's okay. Okay, perfect. So regarding um, um, the sloppy use of language, uh, well, yes, I, I agree with that. And uh, a difficulty I'm I'm feeling uh, writing these uh, PhD thesis is kind of trying to make a bridge between what is the common speech of legal scholars that deal with this. Uh, topic and this kind of more uh, legal theory approach to it that doesn't exist. Uh, um, well, it, it exists, of course, but it is not uh, uh, very common in Portugal. So, uh, yes, this is that is, of course, a struggle. And, and I realize that maybe I'm I, I'm starting uh, my starting point is uh, is itself in that struggle as well. So, uh, um, so those comments are very uh, important for me to to make it clear, of course, because I, I believe that uh, in Portugal, when one speaks of inexistence of a statute of a norm, uh, maybe what one is trying to say is not really that it doesn't exist because the necessary con conditions for it to exist were uh, 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 verified, but rather that it is a subset of invalidity. And this is, uh, uh, and this may be a, a kind of legal construction that, uh, that may be uh, sticking on me. So, uh, and regarding um, the constitutive versus regulative norms, um, why why i think this uh, okay about the regulative uh, part of constitutive norms uh yes i'm aware of it uh, i opted to make a strict distinction between those functions only because of analytical terms basically to uh, separate what is con constitutive and what is regulative uh, uh, I believe that, and this has been, of course, mentioned by many scholars, but I believe that even when Searle states that constitutive norms as also have a regulative function, uh, maybe he's thinking on a complex norm that may be divided into a constitutive norm and a regulative norm. And about the questions that I pose and I did not deal with in this presentation, and uh, mainly the balancing question, um, this all started, This my project all started because what I see the Portuguese Constitutional Court doing is balancing uh, uh, norms on competence. Norms, not norms of competence, not norms constitutive of competence, but norms on the exercise of competence. And I believe that's what happens uh, with the uh, uh, statutory reservations. And that's why uh, I believe that uh, uh, some German uh, insight is important because of their essentiality theory uh, that basically says that, uh, okay, we have a statutory, statutory reservations on fundamental rights, but only the essential part of it is reserved to parliament. Of course, this is not in the constitution, in the constitution itself, in the text. So I believe that when the, the German constitutional court introduced this theory, 
what he what it what it was doing was balancing something and my aim is to find out what what those norms balanced were so thank you again very much for your comments and questions they were very helpful Thank There's an explicit rule on this in the Serbian constitution that what can't be can't be narrowed down is the core of a human right. So it was even introduced. I'll send you the, the translation at least of, of, of this part of it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, thank you to both of you, to the commentators, of course. And thank you, Gozalo, for your presentations and for being the first one to open this international session. Uh, uh, hopefully, we'll have maybe time later on to discuss further on, as I see that some questions were raised here and that you will maybe have more questions for your commentators. And now I'll uh, just pass, if you don't mind, to the second PhD candidate here. Uh, and that is, if I'm actually <laughs> pronouncing as well, uh, Ahmed Bilal Aitekin, right? Is Ahmed with us right now, just to see if everything is all right? I see that his name is here on the screen. Okay, now I see Polieta. Um, yeah, Polieta uh, instead of Ahmed. Uh, okay. Hi, Polieta. Uh, okay. <laughs> Let me just see if Ahmed is here. Yeah. Uh, we're going to just wait for a second to see. Yeah, he sent me his presentation, so I know he was present during the Gonzalo's first session. Wait, uh, yeah. let me change this. Just to, yeah. Wait. By the end of the day. No, in this as well. Does someone sh stop sharing? Uh, stop sharing? Yeah. Okay. Is the Ilona piece? Sorry. Yes, he's here. We can see him. Uh -huh, you can yeah. see him. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Ahmed. Uh, do you hear us? Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I was just waiting yeah, for you to connect. Ahmed, let me first see if we can make your presenter here, uh, and then and then to see if you can share your presentation if you have it. And then if not, we are going to do the same as we did with Gonzalo. I, I you will lead me towards your presentation, and I, I I received it in my email. Can you share the screen? I can. I can. Can you see yes. it? Yes, we can see okay. your presentation. Yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, let me just start with the, with your part. So, Ahmed is a PhD candidate from the University of Genoa, Department of Law. And if I'm not wrong, and I think I'm not, his, uh, his mentor is uh, Professor Andre uh, Kristan. Uh, so Ahmed will present a very interesting topic. It's uh, AI-based judicial decisions, a jurisprudential inquiry. And we have the honor here to have as two commentators, Professor Giovanni Tuzet from the Uni Bocconi University in Milan and Professor Domingo Suarez Farino, sorry if I didn't pronounce it as, as it should be, from the University of Lisbon uh, School of Law. Uh, do we have, as I see, yeah, we have both commentators, right? Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. I will just now give the floor to Ahmed. Ahmed, you have now 12 to 15 minutes to present your topic, and then afterwards we'll hear, hear the commentators. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present in a, such a valuable environment with the pro the professors. Um, I really thank you the commentators before I start because I didn't make their job easier because my research summary indeed very short and maybe it's not clear because I haven't really got a really detailed research question. I'm in the stage where I am discovering what to do and creating a hypothesis. So this presentation is meant to uh, bring the problem, I, I suppose, I hope. Uh, so I can go to the second slide. Okay. Um, now with ChatGPT, everybody aware of the 
artificial intelligence. Now everybody tried him somehow uh, with awareness. Before that, we didn't aware uh, the algorithms running our systems, phones, computers in everyday life. Now it's uh, draw everyone's attention and it's been a while since the alg algorithm used in it is uh, judicial decision making, especially in the United States where they are um, determining the recommitting a crime. Uh, it's a very hot topic and there are some experiments and ongoing projects in different countries. Uh, I think they already using it in Colombia constitutional courts uh, in some small cases uh, in Estonia and it's when in the future it will become um, I think the most of the judicial work in somehow we will be using algorithm and but it's not it's very straightforward things to use because uh, in 2016 uh, there was an article which made on the compass risk assessment algorithm which use in the United States and they find out that the algorithm indeed making discrimination against the minority black groups uh, and their pulse rates against the black defendants are uh, comparably high than the white uh, criminals so it drove attention of the scholars and journalists lawyers and it, it became very hot topic and now uh, the the academia the computer scientists sorry to interrupt you ahmed for just one second giovanni is, uh, is mentioned that he can't in the chat that he can't see the slides could you at least try to make and uh, this full screen in your um and maybe since it's a pdf maybe uh, make them a bit bigger so okay yeah oh, oh, or yeah somewhere in the middle yeah cool uh, of course there are other cases which i am uh, i can mention there is a very famous case in the united states again a loomis versus wisconsin which uh, defendant accused uh, using a compass algorithm and he challenged the use of algorithm based on the right of due process a potential for bias and this is a very famous case another example is, which is used in the netherlands called the dutch system for fraud detection in social welfare so this algorithm is used for determining who is going to make a fraud in the social welfare uh, benefits. And again, it, it discovered uh, discrimination against some groups. Um, also, it, this is a very famous case in the Europe as well. And there is another case which the Allegheny family screening tool, AFST. Again, it's uh, there is a, discovered uh, potential biases and discrimination against minority so the all these are some examples of course there are others and this uh, drew attention to computer scientists and other uh, philosophers and uh, now there is a uh, the field which deals with the algorithmic fairness which is developed uh, the term and and group of AI ethicists now dealing with these matters. Um, let me show you how they are dealing with. Uh, this is a example of uh, or discussion for the algorithmic fairness, which is a, basically a mathematical problem uh, which they are dealing with. Of course, there are some philosophy behind it. Um, but th these philosophies draw from uh, the theories of justice. They are discussing whether we should use 
uh, tiers of um, distributive justice or I don't know the procedural justice. So basically, there are some discussion in the moral philosophy dealing with the theories of justice. And this point, I it seems important because they some claims that the interpret pessimistically as showing that the fair production prediction is impossible and the the moral dilemma is inevitable so some suggest that it's not possible because when you lean on more fairness you skip the the quality of the prediction when you lean on the quality you lose some uh, fairness I, which they say and that's bring my question and we know that there is a discrimination against some groups with the algorithms and there is another debate on the, the algorithms are not transparent enough so with these in our hands uh, what can we do about the algorithms used in the judiciary so I think we need to assess the validity or, or justification of these decision with non-transparent, uh, with uh, biased decisions. Uh, so this is my concept map for the ideas uh, to show wh what's going on in my head on in the judiciary. So there are in the improve of administrative of justice, which basically uh, filing cases and managing notifications. Sorry, uh, just a so, question uh, for you from your commentators. Can you zoom in a little bit more? Yeah, thank you very much. And the the algorithms used in the law enforcement for uh, predicting criminal sites, um, helping the police uh, where to investigate sort of thing and the use of in AI in the judicial decision making they are using for the evidence purposes a so classification evidence making evidence collecting evidence they are using in the legal research and I want to discuss is the predictive justice uh, there are different methods uh, so the, the predictions comes from rules maybe can be comes from rules or can be comes from cases which make use of statistics and basically what they do is uh, creating you uh, a draft for the decision which can judges can use uh, as I mentioned some concerns uh, of using predictive justice systems fairness transparency accountability um, for me, the fundamental rights at the stake is right not to be discriminating, right to fair trial, right to privacy, right to equality. Of course, there are some legal frameworks now developed, also developing in the EU. Um, there are some uh, mitigating risk methods. And what I want to do is uh put all these concerns methods frameworks and rights into a theoretical framework other than uh, discussion of uh, theories of justice to bring that discussion to legal philosophy and trying to find a framework for to understand all these matters which i'm not going to take uh, for granted I mean, what does this mean, transparency, so on, by looking from the glass of legal philosophy. And what I like to do is uh, use the, the, the theories from the legal positivism because the discussion, like mentioned before, there is an impossibility of uh, impossibility theorem for the moral discussion because they couldn't settle, so I will 
separate things and try to answer the questions uh, from a legal positivistic approach, I suppose, uh, still trying to discover that. Uh, so the subject matter for the thesis is the application of positivist theory of law to the development and implementation of predictive AI in judicial making. Uh, my research problem is uh, understanding how to ensure that AI aided decision adhere to fundamental rights while addressing potential biases um, and transparency. My solution to hypothesize by incorporating the positivist theory of law into design, implementation, and regulation of predictive AI system in the judicial decision making. Uh, so it is possible to create a framework that ensures adherence to the fundamental rights. Uh, the premises to argue for and the test the hypothesis. Let me zoom a little bit. A comprehensive review of the positivist theory of law and its relevance to the development and implementation of predictive AI in the judicial decision making. An analysis of the current state of AI application in the judicial decision making including potential biases, legal and ethical concerns, and challenges in distinguishing between legal and moral consideration, an examination of existing regulatory frameworks for AI in the legal domain uh, with a focus how legal positivism can inform the creation of more robust and comprehensive policies, a critical assessment of potential implication of adapting a legal positivism approach to predictive AI in the judicial decision making, including possible limitations and uh, future research direction. And lastly, uh, these are some examples of research questions. I think I am exceeding my time, so I just show you the questions. And finally, uh, this is some potential limitations of the proposed research. Uh, limit, one of the limitations is generalizability. The framework may not be equally applicable across different AI applications. I can focus only uh, judicial applications. So in other fields, it may not be relevant or useful uh, I'm not sure. Of course, there is a technological advancement. Still, AI is developing uh, in the future. I don't know what will come up or change the whole thing entirely. I don't know. Uh, there is a need for interdisciplinary collaboration. I am not a computer scientist, so the 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 part where I discuss the algorithms or the explanation for the, these systems uh, requires some collaboration from the computer scientists. And there is also other considerations uh, for, I don't know, it's a privacy concerns or uh, intellectual property concerns for the algorithms. Yeah, that's it, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you very Thanks. much. Uh, for your presentation, and this is definitely an interdisciplinary approach, a very complex one to somewhat and to some measure. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, you go into some areas as computer sciences and mathematics that we lawyer are lawyers are not so keen to and keen on to understand. But uh, I congratulate you on your uh, presentation. And without further ado, I will give the word to Professor Giovanni Tuzet for his comments, and then afterwards to Professor Suarez Farino. Thank you, Professor Tuzet. You have the floor. Thanks a lot for this opportunity and um, for the presentation, Ahmed. I, I'm going to start as Andre did. So I, I know nothing. <laughs> AI and law. Well, uh, 
uh, apart from the joke, I mean, I, I, I had the impression that um, um, there's a lot of stuff in what you have uh, briefly presented and uh, your, uh, your plan uh, is maybe uh, a plan that has the ambition of covering uh, uh, so many topics, addressing so many issues that it would be very difficult for you to keep all those things together and build a coherent picture. So if I may start with a sort of methodological, a piece of methodological advice, I would um, say that maybe for you it would be better to, first of all, make a sort of list as as you did, in fact, today in, in the presentation, a sort of list of the major uses of artificial intelligence in judicial decision making, right? And then select more precisely some of those uses that you want to address more specifically, because otherwise that would be uh, too much material, too, too many things will be discussed all together. And the risk is that in the end, you do not say any, anything specific on any of them. So uh, as a methodological advice, I would encourage you to be more selective in the, in the, in the focus, in, in what you focus uh, on in, in the research. But of course, at the very beginning, you can give a picture of the many and different uh, conflicting maybe uses of artificial intelligence in law. Then going to the content of what you have uh, been presented. I don't really see the connection between uh, uh, artificial intelligence based judicial decisions and uh, the positivist approach. I mean, wh what's the problem? I mean, uh, is there any natural law theory of uh, AI based judicial decision making? If yes, maybe it's good for you if you want to go that way to show that you can have a positive account of that but if not i mean what's the added value of being a positivist uh, with respect to that to that issue i mean i i don't see the problem maybe you can have a sort of uh, realist view about it maybe so you can you want to be positivist versus being a realist a legal realist about that i, I don't know because I mean, I don't see the connection between those uh, things. So if you can explain it uh, a little more, it will be helpful, I think. Um, another, another, another aspect that I find uh, important is to remember that um, um, one thing is the use of artificial intelligence uh, to uh, replace human decision making, right? Which is the sort of scenario that everyone uh, is scared of. I mean, being judged uh, by a machine or an algorithm or artificial intelligence device, it's something that we do not want to uh, occur, okay? That's one thing. The other thing is, using artificial intelligence devices and algorithms, whatever, for the purpose of helping uh, human decision makers. And this is already a practice. I mean, you, this is something that is done. And I don't think that that raises uh, the same concerns as the, the other thing. I, I think that this use of artificial intelligence is basically okay. I mean, you just use your computer, you just use your devices, your algorithms or whatever to, for instance, collect information or to uh, make the analysis of a corpus of texts or to, you know, uh, analyze information that you have of some sort. It can be factual information, can be legal information, legal text or evidence of any sort. If uh, the algorithm or the artificial intelligence device gives you some piece of analysis, advice that can help you to make a decision, I don't think that that is a sort of concern. The problem then becomes a different one. Uh, what if uh, 
the, the algorithm or the artificial intelligence device gives you a sort of advice and you as a judge, as a human decision maker, decide in a different way. That's interesting. Uh, because then you have to justify why you departed from what the algorithm suggested you to do. And that's an interesting question that can have an effect on how um, judicial opinions will be uh, written and framed. Because you have to argue that, well, I departed from what uh, the machine told me to do or suggested to do. And then you must put forward some reasons. And that's interesting because you are not the expert in that thing. The machine is the expert, so to say. So again, you have a sort of reframing of, of the old problems concerning the relationship between the judge and the expert uh, in evidence matters. Uh, I mean, when the expert uh, comes and say, well, I think that this disease depends on the exposure to that chemical, right? You don't know as a judge and the expert say so, but if another expert say a different thing, then being a non-expert, you don't know how to agree with. And, and you have a similar problem with uh, artificial intelligence uh, advice, based advice. As you said, if the machine, I say the machine to, to put it shortly, tells you a certain thing, advises uh, a certain piece of advice, and you depart from that, you have to provide a reason. And that's an interesting topic, I think. I don't know if you are interested into this. And, I personally find it a fascinating aspect. But what I want to stress again, in order to conclude briefly my, my comments, is that you need to be clearer on the jurisprudential nature of your inquiry. And if jurisprudential mean, I want to give a positivist account of this, what's the added value of being a positivist with respect to that? What's the critical target. Are there any legal realist views of that? Are there any natural law views of that? And so you want to be a positivist opposing those views? If not, what's the point? Thanks. I've been brief. Thank yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for being in the timeline and thank you very much for your comments and taking the time to give them to Ahmed and Hope. And I am very sure, actually, that they will be useful for him as he is in the beginning of writing of his PhD thesis. And I will, without further ado, of course, uh, in respect of the time, give the word to other commentator, uh, respectful Professor Domingo Soares Farinha from the University of Lisbon School of Law. And I apologize in advance if I didn't properly pronounce your name. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you. You, you pronounced it very well. <laughs> it was difficult, but uh, you got it right. Well, hello, everyone. Hello, Ahmed. I really enjoyed um, your presentation. Um, I really enjoyed also the comments uh, presented by Professor Chuzi. Actually, I'm going to start by something that Professor has already mentioned, which is, uh, I guess, the first thing that intrigued me in your proposal, which is the scope of your of your investigation, especially the connection between what you call the positivist theory of law and the IA in, uh, in the judiciary, because what do you mean by the, the positivist uh, theory of law? What, what is, what's the content of that regarding, uh, regarding the judiciary? I mean, the, it raises a lot of questions, and I think that from a, a methodological point of view, that would be my first question. Let me give you an example on how broad the scope may be for you to understand that there may be very different questions to answer. And I'll, I'll address, um, I think, the, the, the two uh, most extreme points of the spectrum. Take, take, for example, the area where I work the most, which is administrative law, and think about what we usually call the, the bounded administrative acts. There is the, the, those kinds of administrative acts where there is little room for either the administration or the judiciary to decide otherwise. For example, in the under the Portuguese law, if you have uh, a passport that is no longer valid because it went past its expiry date, uh, the law says very precisely that if you go to the administrative office that uh, uh, renew, renews the, the passport, you just have to present your old passport and present your citizen's card and you, have, you are entitled, you have the right to a new passport. So many times the administration does not give you a new passport and there is a specific uh, procedure in the law that makes you, allows you to go to court and ask the court to actually 
pass a sentence saying that in fact you are uh, entitled to a passport and that sentence actually works under Portuguese law as a passport. It has the same value as a passport, as a renewed passport. So in this case, if you apply IA to this decision, it would not raise many issues. It's not a matter of, it's not even a matter of evidence. You just load the evidence into the, into the machine. The machine would take hold of the evidence. It would put it against the rule, the applicable rules. And it was, it would be more or less what we call under uh, continental doctrine, a bound administrative act. There's no room for discretion in the decision. So of course, there can always be some kind of problem, some kind of formal requirement that was not uh, that was not complied with. But in this kind of cases, uh, I, I I don't see what you mean by when you say that I'm going to apply the positivist theory of of, of law to this case because I, I don't know what positivism here could could bring about that was different from any other theory. So that that's that would be my my first question. What what do you mean? But if you're talking about what I would put on the other end of the spectrum, and, and that's, I would say, when I was hearing you uh, at the very beginning of your presentation, I immediately thought of that. Actually, when I read your, your presentation, that's what I thought about. Uh, maybe when he's talking about applying the positivist theory of law to, to AI on, in judiciary, maybe he's, he's trying to come up with a, with a kind of like a theory of AI balancing. Because for me, when I think about positivism, and I'm a sort of positivist, uh, I think about balancing. That's I, I think the, the the interesting part of positivism. But again, this is a it comes with a disclaimer. It's it's what I find the most fascinating. Probably one of the most fascinating parts about positivism is that the theory is to to try to come up with the explanations for conflict of norms when there are no norms of conflict available. So you have to balance. And this is for me the the, the biggest challenge posed to AI because you, when you ask AI to balance, uh, you really I mean if you uh, if you are afraid of humans balancing, what what's to say when you ask machines to balance? Uh, some may find that it's going to be easier and less problematic, and others will probably think uh, otherwise. Uh, and here I, I think it's interesting. I, I, if that's what you mean, that uh, you're going to apply a positivist theory of law, for example, you're going to take out some propos proposals in doctrine uh, and in the literature on how to balance. Well, let's, for example, think of the, the big elephant in the room, the Alexian proposal, for example, the, 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 the theory, the formula of Alexi to, for example, balance. That would be interesting because uh, if you go to that kind of proposals in, in positivist theory on how to balance and uh, Alexi is one, but just to, to, to mention a, a Portuguese version of that of that theory, David has a, his own proposal for how to balance uh, on, on matters of of, uh, of conflict and that require balancing in my school. So that what I would find interesting because if you go to the and let's follow for for a few short instances. If you go, for example, if you follow some of the theories of balancing, you have different proposals within the, the positivist theory, and they probably will end up with different kind of decision making by AI, AI algorithms and I, that I find interesting you don't explicitly mention it in your in your research proposal but if that's what you mean I find that interesting because you have room to discuss things like uh, what is there for for example internal justification if you use some sort of Alexian uh, language or, or approach and then how do, do does IA respond to the external justification which is of course something uh, very debatable if it's still within the realms of law or if it's uh, something else entirely. And that I think it's, it's, it's where many of the, the questions that you're reading and hearing your proposal raised me. For example, you mentioned the, the, the discussion on whether AI should decide on rule or, or case-based approaches. Uh, it's very difficult to, to imagine how AI would not have to decide on a case-based approach for, for example, some sort of external justification. Of course, you can uh, teach uh, a machine to apply, for example, the Alexian formula, but then when you come to external justification, there's no rule to, to, uh, to apply there. I mean, you can offer, offer some kind of ethical rules or moral rules for, the, for the, the external justification part, but that would not probably be a positivist approach or, well, that's, that's debatable and I would like to hear you on that. So my problem is, what are, what are we talking about? Are we talking about covering the whole spectrum of possibilities from bounded decisions where AI, AI I think is very non-problematic, 
or are, are you trying to address the most problematic problem pro point of uh, of a uh, decisions in the judiciary which would be um making the judiciary uh compliant with some sort of uh ai techniques and then you would come about at the last mile with a problem of balancing because i, I think the rest of the road is relatively uh, straightforward. Uh, I, I agree with Professor Jose. There's probably not. Uh, there's no problem there. I mean, you can use AI is already used in in many cases. For example, I, I know a lot of. There's not so many examples in Portugal, but there's a lot of examples in Brazil, which is another Portuguese speaking country. And there you have already a lot of lots of courts, even top courts, using AI, for example, to. Uh, gather and organize evidence and to come about with uh, like all the case law regarding cer certain topics of uh, a sentence that must be must be passed. So that's not a problem. The problem is decision. And you raised that, of course, the topic of bias. And, and I'm not even go there because many of what you said about bias is, I, I think, generally agreed upon. Of course, you have to have some sort of, of control and of human review to, of course, some sort of supervisory body or council to, to control bias. But I think that's, that there's nothing special regarding the judiciary. You have the same problem elsewhere where you use IA. If you look, for example, at the last report of the European Parliament regarding the use of IA in the judiciary, basically the parliament basically says that we have to control bias here as we have to control bias in IA everywhere. So it's, it's not a, a, a special problem of the judiciary. Um, and that would be my last point. If you are indeed, uh, independently of, of if you are addressing the cases of uh, balancing positivist theory for IA, or if you're addressing more straightforward cases, for example, for, for bounded decisions uh, where there's relatively a low margin of discretion, so IA cannot make that those many, that many mistakes, even so, uh, and of course with different degrees of importance uh, depending on the case, what what have you thought about regarding review mechanisms? Because I think, of course, that's that's the the probably the last hot topic in in your in your subject. I mean, uh, review mechanisms are of course very important everywhere when we're dealing with IA, but it, when we're dealing with judiciary or law enforcement agencies, it's especially important because of the damage that is of course associated with the, those kinds of activities. Uh, again, it's something that I, I haven't seen. I mean, you mentioned it in passing in, in a certain uh, part of your text. I don't, I don't know if I've seen it in, the, in your presentation today, but that's uh, again another problem. So I think there's still a, a methodological problem of scope. Um, and, but if you are already determined, and when you you showed the, the your classification previously in your in one of the slides, if you are already more leaning on looking at how 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 are you going to have IA decide cases? It's very important to know what kind of discretion is open to the judiciary because basically IA will start from there. It will start exactly from the same kind of problem that uh, a human judge or a, a, a judge in, uh, has to deal with, which is what is my degree of discretion? What kind of balancing operations will I have to perform? And I think I'm within my time, but I, I, I thank you for your attention. I, I, I'll be here for Q and A's if necessary. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. And I will just uh, give um, a few minutes, maybe three, four minutes, to Ahmed to just if if he wants, of course, to answer to the comments or questions that were raised by uh, Professor Tuzet and Professor Suarez Farino. And then afterwards, you can continue on when we have the break after the next uh, session. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your uh, your comments. Uh... I I agree with your comments. Uh, I'm still in a struggle to uh, narrow down my project. Uh, for the beginning, uh, I limited the, the the AI to the predictive AI. So there are lots of different uh, artificial systems. In a used in a different way, so I limited to those uh, to the predictive AIs and uh, for for cases. Uh, maybe I'm thinking the criminal uh, law is specific. I'm not sure. I will try to find out. And for Professor Tuzet's um, comments, I read some papers. 
uh, suggesting we should approach it with a legal dualism and we should bring some moral consideration in the explanation of making decisions. So there are some papers, but it's uh, I will discover that as well. Uh, at this point, I have no answer to give in detail because, like I said, it's I have just the problem, uh, and I still try to find out what can I do with uh, from a legal philosophical perspective. Uh, thanks you for so uh, for your comment. It's there, duly noted. I will look into it, and I hope to share with you as well. Um, thank you. Thank you, Ahmed. Thank you once again for the presentation. And of course, I would like to thank the, the commentators. And uh, I think that the, we can say for sure that they will help you in the further work on your thesis. And uh, I will now just pass to the next PhD candidate. And it's my colleague, and it's my pleasure to, to introduce and announce the colleague of mine, Anna Zdravkovic, who is not only a PhD candidate here at the Faculty of Law, University of Belgrade, but she's also a young academic researcher under the ALF project and a research assistant at the Institute for Comparative Studies. Uh, and of course, Anna today will present the topic that she is writing her PhD thesis on, it's absolute human rights. And we have the honor for the commentators to be Professor Pedro Monis Lopez and Professor Natasha Mavronikola. I will just see if the both professors are here today with us at this moment. Just a second, just to wait for both to connect. I, I'm here. I'm here as well. Oh, good. Hello. Hi. Thank Hi. You. Thank you. Great. Uh, so, hello. Thank you for being here. Uh, uh, and thank you, Maria. Uh, as uh, um, she already mentioned, the topic of my PhD thesis is absolute human rights. And my interest in uh, the subject came about as a result of discovering that to this day, uh, scholars are debating whether absolute rights even exist or should exist, and uh, that even those who claim their existence uh, still disagree about how to define them. Nevertheless, uh, international courts and quasi-judicial bodies are using the term without defining it, uh, that is with its assumed meaning. After all, the fact that today uh, one of my commenters has been analyzing and defending absolute human rights for more than a decade, while the other probably rejects absolute thesis, speaks for itself. So, in a nutshell, uh, throughout the literature, a number of scholars insist that absolute human rights are those that can neither be limited nor derogated. I listed only a few of authors for each definition, but there are certainly more. Uh, while some claim that non-derogability is enough to qualify rights as absolute, uh, others um, assert that uh, they are absolute only if they are immune to the proportionality test. Finally, we must not omit scholars who insist that uh, either absolute rights do not exist or should not exist or both, like Stephen Greer, who even used phrases like the empty mantra of absoluteness or the myth of absoluteness, in his attempt to disqualify absolutism. And of course, there is Alan Dershowitz, who is one of the most prominent uh, opponents of the absolute prohibition of torture. Uh, now that I explained my interest and one of the reasons why I chose this topic, I'd like to elaborate a bit uh, on the structure of my thesis and go through the ideas behind the main chapters that were outlined in the abstract. To begin with, there will be a slight reorganization in the first few chapters so that the thesis can start with the chapter provisionally titled Philosophical Perspectives on Absolute Rights. It will be a sort of literature review, but it will focus on presenting main arguments of scholars that are mostly interested in absolute moral rights and gravitated uh, towards either absolutism or, consequ or consequentialism. Also, 
I'd like to note that some scholars that will be uh, included in this chapter dealt with the absolute rights only indirectly while deliberating torture. So they will be covered mostly within the discussion regarding the ticking bomb scenario. So this part will, of course, include the clash between Gevirt and Levinson, along with the views of, for example, Professor Schuhl and Dershowitz, uh, Waldron, and others. Then, uh, next chapter will be dedicated, yeah, uh, to finding absolute rights uh, in the normative framework and case law of the international courts and quasi judicial bodies. It will start with a sort of conceptual clarification regarding derogation clauses and limitation provisions in various human rights treaties, primarily International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, then European and American Conventions, African Charter, which in spite of not having the typical derogation clause, uh, still contains uh, the so-called clawback clauses, and that will also be addressed. Then, of course, EU Charter and also relevant uh, uh, soft law instruments, such as the Paris Minimum Standards. Following will be the analysis of how different international adjudicating bodies use the term absolute rights in their practice. So even though the case law of the European Court of Human Rights is probably the most famous when it comes to the concept of absolute human rights, and of course, I rely heavily on the work of Professor Mavronikola in this regard, I would like to broaden the scope of, of the analysis, especially since I find it quite interesting that both the Human Rights Committee and the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights extended the number of non-derogable rights in their general comments compared to what is stipulated in their, in their treaties. After that, we go to the next slide. Uh, the idea is to conduct similar research in regard to national legal systems and to analyze not only different constitutional approaches towards non derogability and uh, human rights limitations, but also to examine whether and how national courts use the term absolute human rights, since there are findings that they occasionally resort to this concept, and some of the examples are listed on the slide. So the aim is to cover states from all world regions and legal traditions, although I'm still not completely sure about the final methodology that will be used in regard to this chapter. Uh, additional inspiration for this angle of research was the peculiar case of the Serbian constitution, which contains as many as 17 non-derogable rights. Finally, the central uh, chapter of the thesis is the one about the legal nature of absolute rights in which I will try to offer a comprehensive definition of the notion based on all collected and previously analyzed results of the research. Only after the definition is established, a list of human rights that meet defined criteria will be determined, as well as the list of possible candidates for the absolute character, which would be the rights that fulfill only some of the criteria, but not all of them. Last chapter before conclusion will deal, we go to the next, uh, with the possible impact of absolute human rights uh, uh, on the process of constitutionalization of international law. So certain similarities between Juskogin's norms and absolute human rights are obvious even at this stage, and I would uh, like to analyze a bit more their connection and correlation uh, with the final aim of positioning absolute human rights within the international legal order. So I'd like to finish uh, with a pair of questions from my commenters. So for uh, Professor Mavronikola, do I interpret your stance correctly? If I understand that there can be no conflict between two absolute rights, because as you claimed, there is no positive duty to violate a negative duty encompassed by an absolute right. And how would you comment on the position of some scholars, for instance, Waldron, uh, that in these cases of ticking bombs, refusing to intentionally violate the right of the terrorist, even though it is crucial for saving the life of a child, can by no means amount to disrespecting rights of that child because responsibility lies solely with, with those who actually killed that child. Or in other words, right holders and duty bearers are completely separate in this situation, which is why they claim that there is no conflict of rights. And for Professor Lopez, 
I'd like to learn a bit more about the relation between defeasibility and derogability. And since you have published on the topic, I would like to ask whether you think that would be beneficial to include in my research. And if so, uh, could you uh, maybe send me the paper and uh, 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 advise me on that, on that matter? At last, uh, let me just thank you uh, in advance for being here today and for your guidance and uh, <laughs> advice. I am beyond grateful for the opportunity to discuss my research with both of you. Thank you, Anna. I am beyond grateful to have the opportunity to hear your presentation. As uh, being the colleague of hers, I actually followed her first steps in um, researching absolute human rights and writing her first papers. And I was very, I'm very happy to, to, to see how you progress. Not that I'm the expert on absolute human rights, but I have the opportunity to learn something new right now. And I will not take more of your time uh, from the Anna Sexel presentation, and I will uh, give uh, the word now to Professor Pedro Moniz Lopez uh, to answer the question and to give the comments, of course, to Anna's work and afterwards to Professor Mavro Nicola. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I'll start my timer. Uh, thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. It's very good to be here. Well, I think Anna is ready for the public defense of her thesis because she has learned to turn the tables and ask the questions to the commentators. So that's 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 the best way to start. Uh, I will I will. Um, it was actually one of the questions that I had is what do you mean by derogation and how does it relate to 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 defeating in a broader sense. So I'll, I'll try to, to get there after my my very general comments that I had on your on your paper. First of all, I think it's a very interesting topic. It's it's a very ambitious uh, research project. Uh, but this this by no means means that you should not pursue it the other way around. So it's very, very interesting. And I always need to put this disclaimer out whenever I speak about the feasibility or absolute rights. I am completely for the promotion of human rights in every situation uh, that is relevant. But it does not mean, and I have the utmost respect for those who sustain the thesis of absolute human rights, but that is the thesis that I do not sustain. So I think it's untenable. Uh, I can change my mind, of course. I, I am willing to change my mind, but I think it's untenable, even though it depends on a lot of premises that you need to put forward. So I, I don't want to be cliche, but uh, talking about absolute human rights, the basic questions would be, what do you mean by absolute? What do you mean by human? And what do you mean by rights? So on a, on a, uh, on a, in a nutshell, do you, by absolute, do you mean unconditional? Or do you mean an opposed to relative? Uh, gradable, non-gradable? Um, because if you mean unconditional, then, I think that is the, what comes to mind when you talk about absolute, when someone talks about absolute human rights, then you really need to deal with the feasibility. And you need to, um, but before we get there, first of all, there's this huge discussion in theory of fundamental rights or theory of human rights, also in Portugal, between the, the, the what is the difference between human rights and fundamental rights? So are human rights, moral rights or legal rights uh, to the extent that fundamental rights are usually uh, seen as constitutional rights? And as constitutional rights, do they need to be included in the constitution or they can exist at the international level? Or if they exist at the international level, do they cease to be legal rights uh, or not? So I would, I would only focus my comments on, on legal rights uh, even though some of them can be transposed to moral rights as well. So the issue, the main issue here is, if you think about a constitution, it's a constitution, not a recognition. Uh, that's to, they call it a constitution for, for a certain reason. Like we all, I think we all like very much that, that those beautiful sentences, we hold these truths to be self-evident uh, that all men were created equal. Well, Kind of right. They were not really created equal. Uh, we know that it might be false, but it, maybe it has a certain uh, different meaning. So, and I would advise you to read on. On I think it's. I don't know if it's published in English, but there's a this great paper by Johan Bulin on on the positivist uh, theory and uh, human rights and how 
how it is also politically important to sustain that that human rights, let's call it human rights, need to be there's there's a struggle to promote them, and they're not it's not, not just something that you can take for granted, because actually nowadays it, it it goes to show that it's not taken for granted. But well, if if there are legal rights that we're talking about, and legal rights are legal positions, and I advise you to read a little bit on Hofold uh, and on the ambiguity of uh, rights. But if rights are not just something that is flying around in the air, they derive from legal norms or moral norms, but I'm focusing on the legal aspect, then the feasibility of legal norms directly affects the feasibility of legal positions. So that is that is something that needs to be taken into account. And I think that the feasibility, and I will most certainly send you the papers that I think are relevant, but there are so many papers on the feasibility that are relevant. The feasibility abstracts like uh, from the content of a certain norm. Like the content of a certain norm is not relevant to ascertain whether that norm is feasible or not. It basically it's basically a consequence. It's a very complicated issue, but it's basically a consequence of norms being conditional and norms having an antecedent uh, that determines the conditions of the application of the consequence. Now, but here's the gist. It is not only that norm that determines all things considered and all norms considered the consequence. Uh, in a very simplified manner. So to say that a given right derives from a certain given norm and the enforcement or the, of the I wouldn't say the enforcement, but but the, the, the consequence of that right depends solely of that norm is something that is highly criticized or criticizable because uh, no norm, and I believe Robert Hart who had uh, dubious positions on this because it changed uh, minds uh, claim that. So there's no norm can by itself uh, determine the definitive conditions of its own application. Like, Anna, you're um, applying for a PhD. There's a, there's a panel that will recognize you as a, as a, as a PhD uh, successful uh, candidate that I'm sure but you cannot by yourself do that. So, so it is a matter of normative hierarchy. It depends upon the system, of course, but, but it depends on all norms that are um, summoned to the case uh, itself. And it's, it leads me to a different uh, angle, which is something that is also a problem in the Portuguese constitution, in my opinion, uh, because we have a provision that says that you, when you apply balancing tests, you cannot limit the right that much that it basically disappears. So it cannot be sacrificed uh, completely uh, in favor of the conflicting rights. Now, if you have absolute rights, it could be a good thing, but it could be a bad thing as well. You see, because they, they are, uh, unrestrictable or unlimitable uh, or non-derogable uh, even if like come rain or sun or day or night or COVID or whatever. So that is there that there's a fallacy there saying that or some people are under a, f uh, a fallacy there claiming that people that are against absolute human rights are necessarily people that are you know think that everything's relative. Well, maybe it is, and maybe it's not a bad thing that it is. So, so, but coming back to the issue of um, rights, there's a, another thing that I think that it would be important for you to clarify, um, which is the, the issue of limitation, derogation, uh, restriction. There's a lot of names for that. And uh, most of them are connected with the feasibility, but some are not. For instance, COVID in, in several constitutions, including the Portuguese uh, constitution, uh, COVID was the reason for something that had never happened in the Portuguese constitution, which was the freezing of fundamental rights. Uh, 
uh, which is a different concept. What, what does it mean for a uh, uh, president or whatever to freeze fundamental rights? And can it happen in the international uh, arena as well? It's not that they are being limited. It's not that they're being derogated or defeated. They are simply being frozen. And some people said that anything goes with frozen uh, fundamental rights. And some other people, me included, think that not everything goes with frozen fundamental rights. There's a specific uh, way to look at frozen fundamental rights that still allows for the fundamental right to be put into place whenever uh, a legal case needs to be uh, decided. So just to finish, because I, I think I have 30 seconds, and I will, I will finish with the beginning. You claim, and this is a very well-known claim, that human rights are inherent, fundamental, inalienable, indivisible, universal, and interdependent. If you read a little bit about legal positions, this might be highly disputed. Not all of those claims, but these might be a little bit disputed. And I think it will help you, even if that's not the way you want to go, because maybe you don't want to make a thesis on legal theory, of course, it's a thesis on international, international public law. It will help you try to overcome uh, arguments that might be put forward against you when your uh, theory is being um, placed under discussion. But congratulations, it's a very, very interesting project. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, very much. And thank you for keeping the time. Um, I think that for Anna, it will be a great opportunity to have both views. Uh, so we'll give the chance now to Professor Mavronikola to he give her comments on the topic, and then Anna will respond. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for accommodating me. And I'm sorry that I was a couple of minutes late. I did catch all of Anna's presentation, thankfully, but I did have some trouble connecting. Um, it's lovely to, to meet everyone. And it was um, a particular delight to to read and hear about your PhD project, Anna. Um, I, I'm a little bit biased, but I'm very, very interested in the subject matter. Um, and uh, I think your um, your motivations, your intuitions, and your your uh, inclination to probe um, both more widely and more deeply certain issues um, should be applauded. Um, and I, I thought you did a great job of conveying the significance of the issues at stake and, um, you know, your particular interest in some of the thornier aspects of the, of the, of the topic. Um, I also think you did a great job of turning uh, the tables and asking, asking a really tough question, and I'll get to that in, in a moment. Um, I suppose I, I, I will tie my answer to uh, sort of a, a question back to you in a sense, because I was interested um, in, in line also with, with um, uh, uh, some of uh, Pedro's comments. Pedro, I hope you don't mind if I, if I call you by first name and everybody should feel free to call me by my first name, um, about the relationship between sort of the moral philosophical dimension of um, the conceptualization of absolute rights on the one hand and then the legal um, uh, conceptualization of, of absolute rights. Because I was intrigued at the idea that you start with the moral debate and then you move on to identifying um, absolute rights within legal contexts and then to addressing the legal nature of absolute rights. Um, I suppose one of the things that one of the questions I was left with a little bit was, um, what's the moral or philosophical discussion going to do for you? Um, and one of the things that I was thinking it could potentially do for you is shape um, what you call, I think, finding the process of finding absolute rights in, in various different legal contexts, right? Because I had a question mark about this finding process. And my question mark was, how do you find absolute rights? Right? Um, one way is, uh, you simply look for um, authoritative bodies or texts that refer to absolute rights or absolute human rights, right, as you put it there. And you simply just rely on what, um, you know, authoritative bodies and so on are calling the relevant right or rights. Right, and that's your search, your your search criterion, so to speak. Or, and I did get the sense that you were also doing the second thing, 
you have a predetermined, um, preconceived idea of the sort of thing you're looking for, right? That you're looking for certain rights um, established in, in relevant legal instruments that are um, non-derogable and or that uh, are not subject to um, lawful uh, interference, qualification, limitation, whatever terminology you want to employ, right? So you have some sort of pre conceived idea of what it is you're looking for rather than simply um, something that is labeled absolute um, by, by, by somebody else, right? And I think that that's something that is worth um, exploring a little bit, right? Whether you're going to actually employ a substantive criterion to find absolute rights, right? That you've got an idea of what you're looking for that isn't just about what is named an absolute right. That might mean that when you come to really pin down the legal nature of absolute rights, you maybe some of that work will have been done the other way around. And again, this is a this is a question for you. It's something for you to reflect on, on sort of what comes first. Does the conceptual framework come first or does the conceptual framework flow from what um, authoritative entities are saying is an absolute right? Um, and I think that's that's something to to consider. Um, so I'll answer your question simply because I've made this point about uh, philosophy and law. I suppose I, I rely to an extent on philosophical perspectives on this idea of an absolute right to come up with some sort of framework that I then employed in relation specifically to Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the things I encountered and that I wrote about, like you said, over a decade ago uh, in 2012 was, of course, this debate between Geworth and Levinson. And actually, um, that's where my uh, perspective on negative and positive obligations came about. And I had to then address it in relation to a case that some of you may be familiar with, which was the kidnap of a young child by Magnus Gefgen, uh, who, um, unbeknownst to the authorities, had actually killed this child. The authorities were looking for the child and they threatened Gefgen with, um, with torture, at which point he revealed the whereabouts of the boy. Um, the case came to the European Court of Human Rights. The European Court of Human Rights made a finding of an, of an Article 3 violation, uh, affirming the absolute character of Article 3. And this became a, ma a major source of uh, contention, including for Stephen Greer that you mentioned. Um, now, for me, that scenario, um, for Greer, that scenario is a conflict of rights, right? There is a conflict between the rights of the child to be rescued from a potentially uh, extremely harmful or dangerous situation, right? At that point, they didn't know that the child wasn't alive. So, but we can use that idea. And on the other hand, are the kidnappers, is, is the kidnappers um, entitlement to not be tortured or, or subjected to inhuman or degrading treatment? For, for Greer, straightforwardly, the child's rights should take precedence, right? That was his perspective. From my perspective, the child who was kidnapped had an entitlement to measures to protect that child, but these measures do not extend to a duty to torture or ill treat anyone. Right. Um, that's that's the legal position as far as I'm concerned, and it is also, I think, a tenable moral position in legal terms. So this is my legal analysis. Um, you know, the child's parents couldn't bring a case uh, challenging the authorities' decision not to ill-treat Gefken because the authorities did not have a duty to ill-treat Ill -treat Gefken. So there is no conflict there, right? Um, uh, and so for me, that's how it's resolved. So you, you captured that very correctly. Now, if Waldron is to detach, is, is to completely... Um, Waldron is arguing on a moral basis, right? And, and if Waldron and Geworth, who preceded him, were to say... Uh, actually, there's no responsibility here. There is basically a novus actus intervenience. There is basically this this uh, this break in the chain of responsibility and causation because it's this evil person that is causing this harm to 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 uh, the child. I don't agree with that. I think there are obligations at stake here, right? Both moral obligations and legal obligations in this scenario. It's just that these obligations do not extend to an obligation um, to, to violate the negative duty under an absolute right. Okay, so that's sort of the, 
my my brief response and i've 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 abused the time answering your question there um i think my uh my my further comment in relation to your to your proposal anna which i thought was really exciting is that um you might have to strike find a way to strike a balance between breadth and depth in your um inquiry you are covering a lot of ground and there's a lot of of different um i think ideas you'll probably encounter right i think for example, on, um, the, on the debates on the First Amendment in the US Constitution, for instance, there is a lot of debate about absoluteness in that context or lack thereof. Um, uh, there are all kinds of thorny issues that come up in constitutional settings. So you're going to have to I think be quite discerning about how you approach uh, a sort of comparative or um, uh, or sort of attempted an overview uh, in, in, in your approach there. But, you know, that's something maybe to, to explore as you, as you go along. Um, uh, another thing that I think is very interesting and that has not been done enough is, is what you do towards the, what you were highlighting you're, you're planning to do towards the end about this kind of hierarchy uh, within international law and the constitutionalization of international law. I think there's a lot a lot of connecting threads that haven't been fully um, explored there. Um, and for me, one of the things that hasn't been sufficiently explored there is the sort of imperatives or positive obligations that emanate from um, concepts such as use Kogan's, concepts such as absolute rights and the extent of those demands Right, and particularly the extent to which um, these norms are deemed to demand the mobilization of uh, criminal sanction. So that comes up a lot in these contexts, and I think it's a very tricky uh, uh, set of issues, actually, that it gives rise to. Right, and other ideas of of the sort of um, hierarchy and non-displaceable character of certain norms vis-a-vis -vis other norms. I think there are a lot of fascinating issues there. Um, but again, you're going to have to think about what you want to focus on, what you want to prioritize, because there is so much ground to cover. Um, and, and as exciting as it is, uh, it's probably wise to, to be conscious of the limits of a, of a PhD thesis as well uh, when you do that. I'll leave my comments there because I'm conscious of time, but I'd be happy to come back uh, on anything. Um, thank you, Natasha, if I may. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that um, I will give Anna a few minutes just to respond to your uh, comments. And, um, and I completely agree with you that most of us PhD candidates have uh, the same issue or the problem we tackle when writing our thesis, this is the problem with death and the growth of the thesis where we need to focus on certain issues in our PhD thesis. So, Anna. Thank you, Maria. Uh, th thank you both for, for, the, for the comments there. Uh, I, I will, of course, uh, use them wisely and uh, learn more about uh, what you mentioned. Uh, uh, to Professor Lopez, uh, uh, just a quick remark about derogability. Well, I'm constantly referring to international sources, international documents. So when I when I talk about derogability, I'm talking about derogation clauses uh, that are contained in European Convention or uh, International Covenant. So the, the clauses that allow states to um, derogate, suspend certain rights in states of emergency. And uh, the, the, there are listed certain rights that cannot be derogated from. For example, uh, my state, when there was a state of emergency regarding pandemic, derogated from many rights, justifiably and unjustifiably. So that is an interesting uh, uh, clause that I would like to know more, more about. And uh, of course, I agree completely that uh, there are a lot of names uh, like derogation, limitation, restriction. You mentioned something that I didn't know about the freezing fundamental rights. I will learn more about it. And I think that uh, is in a way one additional reason why I want to deal, deal with this topic. I would, I think that this field needs some kind of clarification. And 
I don't, uh, I don't think that maybe I will give it, but I can try to do something in that, that regard. Um, uh, and for, for Professor Mavronikola, thank you uh, once again. Um, uh, it means a lot to, to me to meet you and uh, to follow up on your research. Um, why uh, the, the first part about the philosophy and the uh, moral rights? Well, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, I, I have a sense that there is a lot of uh, mixing uh, moral legal rights, not only in the academic uh, 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 literature. Uh, for example, in some of your papers, you tried to distinguish between moral and legal rights in order to have a certain clarification, but also in the reasoning of the European Court, I, I, I find some uh, uh, inter interchangeable use of, of certain, of certain um, notions that shouldn't be there. So, so the, the, one of the ideas was to um, have this sort of clarification of what is the moral basis so that we can go further into the legal field. And of course, I didn't feel that like I can omit De Wirt and Levinson and all those authors that did uh, uh, so much uh, regarding this topic. And yeah, uh, I'm making a, a piece uh, on that. Um, uh, regarding the, the structure and um, the broad uh, uh, scope of the research, uh, I think that you uh, are right, but I will have to make some decisions um, with, in, in that regard along the way. So uh, I hope that we can stay in touch and that maybe I can send you some of my work to, uh, for further comments. That would mean a lot to me. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, the idea of the PhD uh, colloquium or the PhD seminar is exactly maybe to put in connection our PhD uh, students and candidates with experts and professors or members of academia who can really help them in their uh, PhD thesis and their research work. So we are very happy if Anna and colleagues of ours can stay in touch with all of you esteemed commentators and colleagues. So, um, once again, thank you, Anna, for this lovely and great presentation, and thank you to both professors who participate in this part. And uh, maybe if you have further comments, we can, or questions, we can continue with that. And now I will just proceed to the next uh, candidate. This is Diego Almanasi Almarza, who is with us today at the University of Belgrade Faculty of Law. Uh, Diego is a PhD student from the University of Genova, Department of Law, and uh, his topic is, here you go, Diego, the concept of efficacy of legal norms and analysis of the instrumental social dimension of law. His uh, mentors are Giovanni Battista Rotti, Maria Cristina Redondo uh, from Genova, and Sebastian Figuero from Madrid. And today we'll have the honor to have two commentators um, on his work. This is Professor Thomas Adams from the Faculty of Law and St. Catherine's College with the University of Oxford, and uh, Professor Dottora Carolina Fernandez Blanco from the University of Girona in Spain. So I will now give the floor and give the word to my colleague Diego next to me, and the presentation is open, so hopefully you'll see his presentation. Thank you, Diego. Thanks. Um... Before I begin, I would like to thank the organizers of the PhD colloquium, and especially to Carolina and Tomas for dedicating part of their time to provide feedback uh, on my project. I am at an initial phase of my PhD journey. I started in November uh, 2022. So I have many doubts and welcome any suggestions, comments, questions, or critiques. Everything will, uh, will help me in this process. I plan to divide uh, my presentation into two parts. In the first part, I will state the aim of my research project and the central problem. In the second part, I will provide you with a broad description of the structure of the problem. Um, before continuing, uh, it is necessary to clarify, I think, two terms used in the title of the project, which is the concept of efficacy of legal norms and analysis of the instrumental social dimension of law. This clarification, the first clarification, uh, concerns the notion of instrumental social dimension of law. 
it is common to distinguish a social uh, and a normative dimension of law uh, and to approach the understanding of law based on the explanation of each of these dimensions uh, and the relationship between uh, them. That law has a normative dimension means that it aims to guide the behavior of normative subjects and can be appealed to in order to justify actions and uh, decisions. In the social dimension of law, on the other hand, um, it is possible to distinguish uh, two aspects, one ontological and one uh, instrumental. Clarifying the ontological social dimension requires uh, explaining that the existence of law uh, depends on a complex set of uh, social facts. Um, the instrumental social dimension of law um, is just a level uh, for a group of questions regarding the functions uh, that law performs and the means that law provides for the realization of those uh, functions. And this last uh, point is the one in which I want to focus on. The second clarification uh, regards the concept of efficacy. To avoid misunderstanding, I will immediately provide you with a formulation of the reconstruction of the concept of efficacy of legal norms um, that I think captures uh, a shared core of thesis regarding the notion of efficacy in the legal in the literature in the literature. So the concept is as follows: uh, a norm N that mandates the production uh, of a state of affairs or the action or extension C is efficacious if one it is obeyed by normative subjects that is they produce or perform C knowing the existence of the norm or in case uh, the norm is disobeyed, um, two legal authorities apply the norm that sanctions such uh, disobedience. This reconstruction, I think, as I was saying, cap captures a shared core of thesis regarding the notion of efficacy that I will explain uh, in a minute. You oh, okay. Um, with this, just one more time, I think it will work. Yeah. Well, let's just check. I mean, okay. I did all it. Yeah. Okay. It with goes this... on the next one. Mila, is it working? No, no. Yes. 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 No, sorry. No, sorry. Sorry. With these two uh, clarifications in mind, we can pass to the problem and the central aim of my uh, research. The problem is that. The concept of efficacy of legal norms that can be reconstructed based on the uses of the notion of efficacy uh, in legal theory, mainly continental Europe and Latin American legal theory, has difficulties to give an adequate explanation uh, that overcomes some challenges that has been presented uh, to what I call the common understanding of the instrumental aspect of law. So. My aim uh, is to reconstruct, evaluate, and fix uh, the concept of efficacy uh, of legal norms used in the explanation uh, of this instrumental social dimension of law. And now uh, the second part. And let's briefly revise the different elements uh, of the problem. That is the usual comprehension of the instrumental aspect of law its difficulties or challenges, the shared core uh, of the concept of efficacy, uh, and, and how all these uh, elements are related. Um, well, this is not seeing good, but first, the usual comprehension. Um, Jorge Rodriguez maintains that emphasizing what I call the instrumental aspect of the social dimension of law, he used a different level involves highlighting that, uh, quote, legal authorities evaluate certain situations, that is, they adopt certain political objectives and use the law as a tool to achieve uh, those objectives, attempting to get group members to do or refrain from doing certain things. Rodriguez's uh, descriptions, which is strongly influenced by Kelsen thought, sum up the, I think, the usual understanding of the instrumental aspect. 
uh, of law. And it can be expressed uh, through uh, two theses. T1, uh, the, the typical legal mean with which law can achieve any function is the regulation of the behavior. And T2, to regulate behavior, legislative authorities, in a broad sense, issue commands that obligate normative subjects to do or not to do something under the threat of a sanction. Now, the shared form. Um, if one dedicates oneself to do some conceptual lexicography, one could find a lack of a common vocabulary to speak about the efficacy of legal norms. Despite this uh, lack of a common language, it is possible to find, I think, a shared core that can be synthesized in, in the three theses that are in the slide. The thesis three, uh, three uh, states that efficacy is attributed to prescriptive or mandatory norms. Um, it is common to understand that since only prescriptive norms can be violated, only they can direct the uh, behavior. A permission or a norm of uh, competence is not violated when the permitted conduct or the conferred power is not uh, used. From this, uh, it is concluded efficacy can only be attributed to prescriptive uh, norms. The thesis T4 says that uh, the concept of efficacy of a legal norm should capture its impact on uh, human behavior. It's assumed that this uh, impact means at a minimum that the normative subject should act knowing uh, the norm. Mere correspondence between the normatively required behavior and the behavior displayed by the normative subjects lacks any explanatory power about the functioning uh, of law, about the instrumental aspect of law. Beyond that, or beyond this point, there is no agreement uh, on whether it is necessary for the norm to additionally uh, intervene in the practical reasoning of the normative uh, subject. And finally, the thesis T5 says that a truth condition of a statement of efficacy of a legal norm is its obedience by citizens, or in case of disobedience, the application by legal organs, especially courts, uh, of the norm that sanctions such disobedience. Since norm, uh, norms can be disregarded, sanctions are often institutionalized in response to disobedience, either by uh, imposing punishment or restoring uh, the ontically established uh, situation. For these reasons, uh, it is generally agreed that the efficacy of a legal norm depends not only on the acts of correspondence performed by citizens, but also on the application by uh, legal authorities. From then on, what comes as application is a controversial uh, issue. So, from this Three theses, it is possible to reconstruct the concept that I formulated uh, at the beginning of the presentation, that is in the slide. Now, I want to end my presentation describing the three difficulties or challenges to the usual understanding uh, of the instrumental social dimension. Each of these uh, difficulties have an impact or allow us to question one of the of the shared core of the concept of efficacy. The first difficulty relates to the role of interpretative activity in the production uh, of law. I think that it is easy to see that lawyers, judges, uh, lobbies, companies, etc., find in the law uh, a set of practical tools for the realization of their own purposes. This consideration uh, is not addressed by the common comprehension. In the thesis uh, T2, the law is presented as an instrument exclusively at the disposal of legislative uh, authorities. In a deep uh, level of analysis, law is not simply the discourse of legislative authorities, but rather a set of norms produced by the activity of legal interpreters. If we also assume uh, a moderated skepticism, Regarding legal interpretation, I think that we can explain, uh, or I'll see, least, or, or at 
list C, why the law can also be an instrument for the realization of the purposes of legal operators in general. This lack of attention is reflected in, I think, in the almost pacific assumption of the thesis uh, T5, which is the idea that in the absence of obedience, a norm is efficacious if it's uh, applied. That legal operators dispute over which norm should be applied and legal officers have discretion to determine the applicability of a norm, I think should lead us to question the relationship between uh, efficacy and applicability. The second difficulty concerns the existence of uh, different forms of legal normative orientation, uh, orientation and this is a, an old critique. The usual understanding uh, focus exclusively on one way of guiding the behavior of legislative authorities towards normative uh, subjects, that is, the one that is carried out uh, through prescriptive norms. However, law uh, relates to the behavior of normative subjects in other ways, for example, by providing normative significance to certain uh, actions, granting competencies to contract, etc. And this uh, questioning, uh, questioning translates into a critique of the thesis uh, T3. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, part of the dissertation aims to answer the following uh, questions. Um, does it make sense to propose a concept of efficacy of norm other than prescriptions? Um, if the answer is affirmative, which concept and how does the efficacy or inefficacy of different types of legal norms relate? And the last uh, difficulty concerns the unawareness of normative texts and norms by normative uh, subjects. The idea that the typically legal mode is the regulation of conduct leads applied to the concept of efficacy to the thesis uh, four, that is right there. However, the incidence referred uh, to by T4 assumes that the normative subjects have knowledge of legal norms. However, it is a truism that normative subjects do not know either normative texts or the norms expressed by them. And this is what I call the problem of connection. So, in this regard, I, see, I seek to answer the following questions. Uh, what corrections does the problem of connection demand on the concept of efficacy, it is plausible to argue that, uh, and this is a question I would like to remark, it is plausible to argue that knowledge of norms is mediated by knowledge of social norms. If so, how does the efficacy of legal norms interact with social norms? So, to conclude, it is important uh, to fix the concept of efficacy of legal norms in order to confront these difficulties. These challenges, I think, allow us to identify what needs to be explained regarding the uh, instrumental social dimension of law. And it is for these explanations that I think we need a corrected concept of uh, efficacy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Diego, for your elaborate presentation on this concept, which is something, of course, that now I had the opportunity to learn from you. And uh, I will now, just for the sake of time, give the, the word to the first commentator, if he is with us and he can hear us, uh, Professor Thomas Adams. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great, great. Um, Hi. So I understand I have about 10 minutes, is that right? Yes, yes. Okay, okay, sure. Well, thanks very much for, for this, D Diego. I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in your answers to, to, to these, these questions that you pose here. I, I don't yet have them before me, so I'll say something more about the, the questions themselves. But again, it, it would be really great when we have time for a little more conversation later to, to hear something if even tentative about where you think you want to go in exploring these various challenges to, to the Calcinian notion of, of, of efficacy. Um, but, but for now about the questions. So, so, so your first challenge, as it were, to the traditional notion of efficacy focuses around the role of interpretive activity in the production of law and the challenges posed to our understanding of efficacy 
um, by skeptical theses about legal interpretation. And you take these to be a challenge in particular to the idea of efficacy as application. So, so that's efficacy delivered by virtue of a court judgment applying a norm in the case where the subject has, 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 has breached the primary legal norm. Um, so, I, so whether or not this sort of challenge is in particular a challenge to the notion of efficacy of application, I think it's going to depend crucially here on the kind of skeptical thesis that we're considering, right? So it depends, I guess, upon what kind of realist claim we're thinking about here. And in particular, whether or not our skeptical norm is directed at the object of interpretation, that is the legal norm created by the legislature, or rather is directed at the practice of the actions of the interpreter. So I'll, I'll try and say something about that. If our skeptical thesis about legal interpretation is of the form, well, as and when the legislature enacts uh, a, a particular norm, that norm is, is, is subject to a range of different plausible interpretations, no one of which is, is uniquely determined by the norm itself. If that's the kind of skepticism we're considering, then I think that worry would infect not only efficacy as application, but also efficacy as obedience. Because if the norm itself doesn't provide determinate guidance, then it's very hard to say what counts as obeying the norm in the first place, as well as saying what counts as applying that norm. However, if our skepticism is focused less on the idea of the determinacy of the norm and more on the idea that very often judges will have a multitude of reasons to depart from the legal norm in concrete cases, well, then that sort of skepticism, I think, does very directly address the idea of efficacy as application. So I guess my question here is, well, what kind of skeptical theses do you consider to be central to the tradition you're working in here? And therefore, how does that relate to the different facets of, of efficacy that you've, that you've described? So that was my first question. Um, second challenge. So th this has to do with asking whether or not it makes sense for the efficacy, for our notion of efficacy to be expanded to consider not only um, prescriptions, but also perhaps permissions, norms constitutive of, of, of competence, so on and so forth. Um, well, here I'm just going to declare the fact that, that I sort of sit in the traditional camp in, in this regard. Um, and, and that I find it quite hard in some ways to pair the language of, of efficacy uh, with our understanding of a power conferring norm. So, so take the contractual example that, that, that you, you talked about. Um, so my question, I suppose, is, well, what would it be for that power conferring norm to be efficacious. And, and, and now a, a plausible answer, I suppose, is something like the, the power conferring norm, the norm within the legal system, which lays down what it is to create a binding contract is efficacious just in case it is widely used within the society or, or something like this. But, but actually, I, I, you know, in, in ordinary language, I don't think we would treat the institution of contractors efficacious or inefficacious depend upon the number of contracts formed. It, rather, we treat the, the institution of contractors efficacious or inefficacious dependent upon the extent to which people kept to do their contracts. And of course, that analysis depends upon us um, behaving in accordance with mandatory norms within the legal system. When I formed a contract, I now have a set of legal obligations, I have to satisfy them. If I fail to do that, and if people generally fail to do that, and the legal system doesn't respond appropriately, then it looks as though we have an issue in the efficacy of the law of contract. But not, it seems to me, as and when people choose not to contract. That seems to me to be an issue 
that I think falls outside of, 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 of the scope of an analysis in terms of efficacy. Here, I think I'm just repeating the, the standard lines. I'm not sure I'm helping you much, but just to say that I, 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 I wonder here uh, about this, and I'd like to hear more about the argument, and, and in particular, what it is about the notion of a power conferring norm that you think can in and of itself be captured in terms of the language of efficacy, because I'm, I'm somewhat skeptical about that idea. Um, final thought has to do with your last challenge here. This has to do with the unawareness on the part of ordinary people of, of normative texts um, of, 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 the, of, the, of the legal norms that form part of their legal system and what that does for our notion of efficacy in part premised on the idea of, of obedience by legal subjects. Um, and here I, I, I have to agree with you that, that, that this idea is something that those who worked on this subject haven't thought enough about. And I think it'll be really interesting to read the parts of your project that deal with this particular issue. Um, and, and in particular, it causes problems for the, the views of certain authors, which actually pay very little attention to the idea of norm application or the possibility of norm application in contexts where individuals aren't obeying the law. Some versions of, of the idea that law is necessarily efficacious, you know, cash that idea out completely in terms of obedience on the part of subjects, which is, as, as you say, implies knowledge on, on their part of, of the relevant legal norms. That's not how the legal system works for the most part, right? People go about their days largely in ignorance of the law uh, unless and until it's too late, right? Now, of course, certain sections of society, certain aspects of society, you, you'd expect a greater awareness of the law, but for the most part, most people don't know their legal obligations. And we have to be able to account for that consistent with the idea that the legal system exists and is efficacious. Um, so this, I think, is going to place a, a lot more emphasis in our account on the notion of, of law application, or I think also the possibility of, of norm application by competent legal organs. Um, your suggestion here is that, in fact, direct awareness on the part of legal subjects might not be necessary for us to count their actions as in some way engaging with the legal norms, provided legal norms bear the right relationship with social norms, which are uh, uh, widely known in a society. I think I'd want to know more about that idea before I could say too much about it. But certainly I agree with you that a picture of law uh, uh, as you know one which is a social practice that exists by virtue of you know, obedient citizens well aware of their legal rights and obligations is totally inconsistent with with the way in which law manifests in in modern society which leans i think much more heavily on the institutional dimension i'm interested in your idea that it leans on a sort of mechanism of social mediation but it'd be great to hear a bit more from you around that so so those are my three sets of thoughts around your three challenges or questions um this looks like a really interesting project and I'm, I'm i'm looking forward to reading more of your work uh thank you professor thank you for uh, your insights on on diego's uh, concept and on diego's norm application notion of uh, law application which he treated in his thesis and uh, i will now give the floor to professor carolina fernandez blanco and then afterwards maybe diego if he doesn't mind can answer to your maybe questions and comments and you can further on discuss Thank you, Professor. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I need to, I have a presentation. Uh, I've sent it to you by mail. Yes, thank you very much. We will just go and open it. Just a second.
Sorry, we had some technical issues. We will just continue in one second just to, to open your presentation. Sorry, and thank you for being patient. Sorry, Professor, and uh, sorry to the both to you, to you, Diego, as well, for taking your time. I will now give the floor to Professor Carolina to present her topic. Once again, apologize for these technical difficulties. Thank you. Don't worry. Thank you very much. Uh, do I need to, to ask you to change the, the slides? Yes, I will be the one in charge. Oh, okay. you tell me next slide. Thank you. So you, can, you can change the slide now. Uh, thank you, Diego, and thank you, everyone, for this invitation. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, I'm going to start with the, the other slide, uh, commenting some general uh, issues about your, your work. Uh, I like very much the way you approach the problem of efficacy, and I think it's an interesting topic. I worked a lot about it. <laughs> Uh, and not very explored. So I'm very happy that somebody is researching about this. Um, and also agree with the idea of the instrumental social dimension of law. I think it is fundamental. And we are, we are seeing now that they are gaining terrain, the communicati communicative approach to legislation or symbolic role of legislation. And I think it is very important to uh, defend to, uh, this idea of the instrumental social dimension of law. But if instrumental social dimension of law if, is the departing po point, efficacy alone is not enough. I think that effectiveness, or as uh, Liborio Hierro called, uh, efficacy as success, is an important part of the, uh, the social dimension of law. Uh, not only because the social dimension of law is not only composed by efficacy or it's not enough, but also because efficacy without, without effectiveness may produce an interference with autonomy without justification. So I think the idea of effectiveness of law is very important to address, at least in a, in a marginal way, in your research project. Uh, the next slide, please. So I, I took some of the questions that you uh, present in your in your summary, and I will uh, have a conversation <laughs> with you and uh, toward these questions. In some ways, I'm going to be agree with you, and on other uh, occasions, I will present uh, another. Uh, possibilities of research uh, to answer that questions. Uh, you present the, the, the one of the first questions, how are efficacy and applicability of, of norms related? And you present the first idea that efficacy as obedience that is related with the capacity of the norm to motivate the conduct of the subject. And then you present the idea of efficacy as application. I agree with you that there is a very problematic question in the idea of the efficacy as application. You know that the genesis of this idea was the, the, the detection from Kelsen, uh, the problem of the incommensurability of obedience 
that is when general norms requires passive conducts and they are erga omnes, and that tends to an immense number of possibility to comply with. So even the murder is not murdering all the time. So uh, this is the, the problem of the incommensurability of obedience. And I think the genesis of the idea of efficacy as application comes from that problem. When the norm is not possible to be evaluated as efficacy as obedience, we have the other side that is efficacy as application. But I agree with you that it's not uh, very convincing, this idea. So I propose you that another, another uh, answer to how efficacy and applicability of norms are related, that is efficacy in application. You know, that this is a very irregular relationship, but of course, in some cases, efficacy in application will trigger efficacy as obedience as a matter of uh, individual or general deterrence. And, but this is irregular because we will have a high relationship between efficacy in application and efficacy as obedience in some cases like parking meter. If you don't have a fine for, uh, for not putting the coin in your parking meter, you will not comply with the norm. In another cases, the uh, uh, efficacy in application is not very high related with efficacy as obedience. In the case of cannibalism, the efficacy in application will not trigger the efficacy as obedience. And this is related, I think, with another part of your dissertation that is social norms. When the legal norm is backed or supported by a social norm, efficacy in application is less important than in the other cases. The next slide, please. So the other question that you make is, uh, does it make sense to propose a concept of efficacy of norms other than prescriptions? Uh, I will call them anti-directives using a Shapiro uh, denomination, uh, and I will, I will include permission, competences, uh, power conference rules, etc. Many authors would say that it's not possible to assess the efficacies of anti-directives because any behavior complies with the norm. I usually agree with this uh, affirmation. But assuming that it's conceptually possible to, uh, to affirm the, the efficacy of anti-directives, anti -directive, uh, I ask myself if it is relevant to propound, propose a concept of efficacy regarding anti-directives. Because what is the, uh, the utility of or the importance uh, if I take the bus or I take the metro or if I live with my couple without married or married? So is, is in some way it's not relevant how efficacy or not is the use of anti-directives. But nevertheless, the idea of evaluating the use, I will call the use of an anti-directive, may be relevant if the anti-directive is part of a public policy. And therefore, we are interested in some way in, if, in its effectiveness. Hmm? For example, the case of vaccination. Vac vaccination is, is not mandatory, uh, so we can choose to va vaccinate ourselves or not. But it is important how high or low, or, or low is the use of this anti-directive, because it's a part of public policy. Uh, so another, another thing that I, I perhaps I misunderstand, but uh, you say the idea of granting the possibility of making use of a permission or a competence. And I think the, the idea of granting the possibility of make use of an anti-directive rule is not a problem of efficacy of the anti-directive, but a problem of efficacy of the other prescriptive norms that are necessary 
to grant the use of the permission or, or the power conferring rule, etc. Mm -hmm. The next slide, please. Um, another question that you, may, that you make is, is it plausible to argue that knowledge of norm is mediated by knowledge of social norms? Uh, first of all, I, I have to say that not all definitions of efficacy take for granted the knowledge of the norm. You know that the, the, the most uh, weak uh, concept of efficacy uh, as a correspondence is just the existence of a norm and the, and the existence of a conduct that correspond with the norm. Another, another thing is that it's not always adequate to assume that the law is not known. Hmm? Uh, I think that both extremes are fallacious. If you say that always is known, or if you say that never is known. So there are other ways to achieve knowledge that are not related to social norms, like the use of plain and simple language, government strategic of communication, etc. But my main question here is that there are a general assumption that legal norms supported by social norms are more efficacious. But that, that does not mean that the citizens know the legal norm, but only that they follow the social norm. So this is my first uh, uh, set of questions about your first question about social norms. So to end the next uh, slide, please. Okay. So the, your second question regarding social norms is how does the efficacy of legal norm norms interact with social norms. Again, there is a general assumption that legal norms supported by social norms are more efficacious. The problem is that this is the almost only approach to the interaction between social and legal norms. And I challenge you, I propose you to go far away from here and um, to explore this other topics. There is a more interesting field of research regarding to social norm as obstacles for efficacy. This is the case of gender inequality. All Western countries has legislation uh, enough to grant gender equality. But why there is no country that have reached a perfect equality is because social norms. And the other thing is to explore the idea that legal, norm, legal norms can create social norms. And here is the case, the case of tobacco, tobacco ban in public spaces that create a social norm that extend this ban to smoke inside houses. And this is all. Thank you very much. I hope it's useful for you. Uh, thank you. Thank you once again, Professor. Thank you for your thorough insight, insight on Diego's uh, questions and for trying to answer them. And of course, for preparing the presentations. Once again, I apologize for these technical issues that we had at the beginning. So now I will give the word to Diego just to maybe have a, a follow back or just an insight to the comments of Professor Adams and to your comments as well. Thank you. Um... I will, I will just uh, approach uh, some of the comments that you have provided me. Um, first, um, regarding the comments of uh, Thomas. Um, I have to recognize that um, the problem with which I have this clarity is the first challenge and the relationship between the efficacy and applicability. Um, I think I have uh, clarity regarding which is the challenge to the usual comprehension of the instrumental social dimension of law, but, but I am still I have no, no clarity about uh, how to how that challenge reflects on our understanding of the um, 
um, of the efficacy as uh, as application. Um, what I think is that. And the skeptical thesis regarding uh, legal uh, interpretation, uh, and I would say mainly the thesis assumed by the uh, Genovese realism, um, maybe will lead me to uh, change the concept or the role that the efficacy as application plays. Uh, in the explanation of the instrumental aspect of law for a concept of efficacy, uh, in English we could say as uh, in force, in Spanish we say vigencia, uh, uh, following the path of uh, Alf Ross uh, or uh, Bullying, depending on if uh, we understand the concept as a disposition of property or as a prediction. But I think. Uh, maybe that is the working hypothesis that I want to to explore. Um, regarding the second challenge, um, I am thinking in this regard to following the topic of the Kelsen in the 60s. Um, Kelsen in a response to a work of uh, Bullying uh, states, correcting his own thesis, that uh, the typical legal means are not just to prescribe, but also to empower and to permit. Um, and, and I will say that uh, efficacy uh, of permissions and norm of competence is uh, depends on the use of the permission or the competence, at least this is my intuition by the moment, but also on the efficacy of the prescriptive norms that are related to that use. For example, uh, the norm that sanctions the interference of the use uh, uh, of the uh, permission. Um, regarding the third, the third challenge, I am thinking, and with this I also uh, tackle the last comment of Carolina, I am thinking on the idea of a mediated efficacy proposed by uh, Postema first and then by uh, Tamanaja. And what I want to do, what I'm thinking is on how those reflections that, uh, how those reflections can be captured by the concept of efficacy uh, of legal norms. So I agree with Carolina that there are other uh, connections between social norms and legal norms that are interesting, for example, the competence, um, but uh, I need to select uh, some problems, <laughs> uh, and I will, and I think it will be useful to tackle uh, the idea of uh, um, if it's possible to have knowledge of legal norms through uh, social uh, norms. Um, to Carolina, also regarding the efficacy and anti-directives, I think it is relevant uh, because. I want to explain which means the law offers to realize any function. I think this is the question that uh, inquiring about, about the instrumental social dimension of law uh, means. So if the anti-directives plays any role in realizing or in the performing of functions by law, I think it is important to uh, to inquire that. Um, what about efficacy as of success? Um, I think that first I will be suspicious about the concept uh, uh, provided by Liborio Hierro. Um, I think that what has success is not the norm, but the normative text. Um, but I think uh, the, the idea of efficacy as success is important in the explanation of the instrumental aspect of law, but I think the, there is an explanatory priority between the um, investigation or the questioning about the concept of efficacy of legal norms uh, in relation uh, with the uh, concept of efficacy as success or effectiveness. Um, 
because if efficacy of success depends in any sense of the efficacy of legal norms, then I, need, I think we need to tackle first the problem that this concept uh, has. Um, that's it, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Uh, because um, we are short in time, but uh, I will just offer two commentators, maybe if you have uh, one minute to in response to Diego's uh, comments or, or not, you, you have the freedom to decide. Once again, I thank you because you had uh, elaborate suggestions and comments and maybe guidelines for his uh, further work. And uh, I, I saw that Diego was taking a lot of notes, which is great. Uh, so yeah, if you if you have Tom or maybe you Carolina, um, please do, uh, and then we will pass on to the other candidate. Thank you. No, I, I think I'm I'm I, 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 I'm I'm happy to just sort of take these questions up further with with Diego. I, I meant to use the clapping emoji instead. I used the raising hand emoji. So <laughs> apologies in that regard. Um, what one thing I suppose one final thought something I'd like to hear a, a little about in the final thesis perhaps is the relationship between the efficacy of individual legal norms and, and the legal system as a whole seems to me to be a question which is not explored in 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 the way in which you're setting up your problems here but seems very pivotal to at least certain aspects of 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 this literature, so I'd be, I would be interested in that as a, as a further question. If you will, you know, it, it, as part of an overall project, like how do we relate the question of the norm to the question of the system? But no, thanks very much for the opportunity, and thanks, Diego, for your thoughtful responses. Thank you very much, Professor Fernando Blanco. Before no we... comments, no oh. comment. Thank you, Diego, for your answers, and I hope it's useful for, for you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you once again to the both of the commentators for their participation and giving their, their wonderful insights to continuation of Diego's work. And now we'll, uh, I excuse our uh, part from the organization for this shorter break that we'll have. It'll take only five minutes and we'll continue to the next uh, candidate that is Agnes Diaz Castellano. Uh, Agnes, you're here with us. Agnes, do you have a presentation? Bye. Thank you. Yes. Thank you once bye again. Bye. Thanks, both of you. Yeah. Agnes will continue in five and if you have, if you don't, just in case you can send me to my uh, email that is in the chat box. Thank you. Perfect. Continue in five. Thank you everyone for your understanding. Uh, okay, I just we see your presentation. Thank you. Um, Perfect. Yeah, yeah. I will just go to my slash here and start with this session right now. Okay. Hi. Um, I see. Now you. <laughs> okay, perfect. Great. Um, now I cannot see the list of participants, but um, I was checking before starting. And Professor Linares is with us, and just to see if Professor A. Salamanca is, uh, is joining yes. us as well. Um, okay. Should I start? Let me just see uh, there on the participants list. Neko možemo mi pomogne možda eventualno vas da vidi. Neam. Ne. Dobro, dobro. Ne, pamti pa vrati. Okay, samo sam u svemu. Hvala ti, Ana. Re Salamanca. Ne, to je Sebastian. Ne. We'll see. Okay, uh, Agnes, if you agree, I'll write an email to Professor Salamanca, but you can start having in mind that Professor Linares is present and that mm -hmm. he will be the first commentating on your uh, doctoral thesis. And uh, we'll Great. see with Professor Ray Salamanca because he confirmed his participation just to see yes. if there are some difficulties in connection maybe or something. 
So, Perfect. okay, Agnes, I'll just announce you. So Agnes Diaz Castellano is a PhD candidate from the University of Genoa, Department of Law, and she will present her topic, how methodologies such as crowd law can improve the quality of legislation. And her uh, mentor is, if I'm not wrong, Professor Andrei Kristen as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And yes. of course, as commentators, we have Professor Sebastian Linares from the Universidad Nacional del Sur. And we are waiting for the second commentator, Professor Felipe Rey Salamanca from the Faculty of Legal Sciences of Pontificia Universidad Javeriana de Colombia. So, Agnes, I give you the floor. You have around 12 uh, to 15 minutes max, so we can have enough time for the commentators to give their insights. Thank you, Agnes. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am taking uh, just uh, 30 seconds from my time to thank you, uh, the organization of this amazing uh, colloquium. It is a wonderful opportunity for us, PhD students, to have the chance uh, to discuss our work with uh, professors with such a, a trajectory and reputation. So without further ado, well, I am going to thank as well my two commentators, Professor Felipe Rey and Professor Sebastian Linares for uh, being here and taking the time to discuss my work. And now I'm going to start. So, um, as you well presented, um, my PhD thesis revolves around um, innovative democracy, in particular, uh, a conception that's called crowd law. And um, the provisional title is something along the lines of how methodologies such as crowd law can in improve the quality of legislation. So, the structure of my talk will be something. Uh, like the following, I'm going to first discuss uh, or present the topic, then I'm going to talk about the structure of the thesis, and then I'm going to focus on some problems that I have found in the scholarship of crowd law and later on how to address said problems. So the general topic of my dissertation is better legislation. Better legislation sounds a bit like concepts that we have maybe heard now, like better regulation at the EU or the OECD level. But better legislation also raises other questions, in particular what better means or what legislation also can mean. What I am going to focus, though, is on this specific question. Does crowd law ensure better legislation? To address this question or to give uh, an answer to this question, I have divided my, three, my thesis in three uh, chapters. The first chapter revolves around the concept of better legislation. So at this point of my research, my idea is to give, um, to, to make an overview of the current literature, not only um, the academic literature, but also um, what the institutions are promoting as uh, standards of better regulation and legislation. And I'm going to suggest some standards um, for the process, but also for the outcome. So um, here you have a list. Uh, it, this is a very preliminary list. I am dividing also the outcome uh, with the text and the meaning. Um, so, yeah, um, the, the assumption that I'm using here is uh, the theory of um, um, rational legislation, um, but also I'm taking into, considering, uh, into consideration deliberative democracy as, uh, as a requisite. So this is why you can find elements such as deliberation in the process. So this would be the first chapter. The second chapter is what is crowd law? So crowd law is a collaborative legislation mechanism that aims to create laws which are more legitimate and with higher quality. There are two items within the crowd law scholarship that can be considered the main elements. One is the crowd and the other one is the role of technology within this method. So this is what I'm tackling in the second chapter. Later on, um, I will focus um, on specifically the crowd, which is what I am currently working on and what I would like to receive more feedback because uh, I'm getting a bit stuck in it. So it would be nice if I can get some some feedback from this part. And the third and last chapter of my thesis would be uh, would aim into answering the question of whether crowd law ensures good or better legislation. Um, I am going to analyze these standards presented in the first chapter and see whether they are strengthened, weakened, satisfied or preclude. So, I am now going to focus on the problems that I have found within the scholarship of crowd law. I have found two main groups of problems. 
the first one uh, relates to the concept, the meaning of crowd law itself. So what I have found reading the scholarship is that the term crowd law has been used in different ways. At the beginning, I was not sure if this was a problem of, of meaning, if the terminology was used in a different ways, or if crowd law, the concept of crowd law had different dimensions. So this is one set of problems. The other set of problems, when we hear about a, a concept such as crowd law, the first natural question that arises is, what is the crow? What, what do we refer with the crow? When digging into the scholarship, I realized that the crow was never really defined. Um, it was defined through examples. So we found examples of what a crow can look like. Um, we saw the qualities it should have, the values it brings to the table, and the relevance of bringing citizens, a group of citizens, into, um, into the policy and lawmaking process. But we never really found a clarification of what the crowd is. When we start to think, uh, when uh, authors start to talk about this, um, they start to use different terminology, mainly two different words, collective intelligence and expertise. But they never really explain what is the relationship between these terms and what do they have to do with the crowd and with the entire process. So now, how to address these problems? As I said, um, I think that crowd law has different dimensions instead of different meanings or the term being used in different ways. Why? Um, there are two dimensions within the, the, the terminology of crowd law, a descriptive one and a normative one. With the descriptive one, we find the literature that refers to cases that, or, or methods that have been already applied and that fulfill the requisites of crowd law. But we also have a different dimension, a normative one, that tries to explain how a perfect methodology, how citizens should be engaged in the process of participatory uh, of law and policy making should should uh, intervene so and the second uh, problem according uh, what is the crowd according to crowd law as i said we find here two words that are repeated throughout the entire um, scholarship but are not very clear um, in one hand, collective intelligence, and in the other hand, the word expert or expertise. So in one hand, being uh, collective intelligence um, is defined as a group of individuals acting collectively in ways that appear intelligent. Um, and in the other hand, uh, we find that the word expert is used in different ways depending on the author. So we find authors such as um, Marti and Alzina that use the word expert to refer to citizens that are knowledgeable. And also, and on the other hand, we find authors such as Novak that refers to experts in their traditional form. So how do all these wording relate to the word crowd and how do this um, puzzle um, helps us understand what the crowd is? So I have tried to, to understand the relationships between the concepts. Um, the, the meaning, the value behind the collective intelligence uh, idea is that there are groups of people that work and deliberate to bring an outcome. The outcome is what is of value. And this is what the crowd law scholarship refers to by groups that are collectively intelligent. So I have equated the crowd in crowd law as a form of collective intelligence. And on the second set of problems, um, expert and expertise, here um, I am suggesting to refer from using the term expert um, to talk about citizens, because this brings a lot of confusion and many criticism that I think it's not um, appropriate and uh, not useful for the theory in general. Um, so moving on, um, I think, however, that expert and the concept of, of expertise can be of usage in the whole crowd law scholarship because of two reasons. First, because, as I said, collective intelligence, what is relevant about the collective intelligence is the outcome of the deliberation. And this outcome, I think, can be considered expertise. This could be a normative uh, dimension. But then, um, we, so we have to keep in mind that 
in, in the collective intelligence intelligent crowd, it doesn't matter which kind of individuals are composing the group. Uh, it only matters that they are a group and that they work in a collective way. But still, sociologically, experts have value and they bring a sociological value to the table. Um, so for this reason, for descriptive purposes, I have uh, presented three um, kinds of crowd, um, depending on the, in the membership of traditional experts into this crowd. So first, the smart crowd, which would be a crowd entirely composed by experts, then a mixed crowd, which would be composed by experts and citizens, and then the citizen crowd, which would be entirely composed by citizens. Um, and lastly, to finish this part of my thesis, I think it is important to, this, to, to propose uh, a definition of what crowd should, should be in crowd law. And my definition, again, very preemptive, is that a group of individuals who, because of the expected value of their feedback, can bring to, they can bring to a discussion, help to improve the collective intelligence of the group, which is then used in one or more parts of a political or legislative process. And with these, I finish my intervention. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to the feedback from the commentators. And I'm just going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes. Thank you for your presentation and thank you for respecting the time. Uh, I will now <laughs> give the floor immediately to Professor Sebastian Linares for his comments and suggestions to your presentation and to the abstract that you have sent him. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this um, to this workshop uh, and to having the opportunity to comment on such an interesting topic and such an interesting um, PhD thesis. Uh, um, I just want to begin my comments uh, by um, encouraging Agnes. Uh, to delve into the, this topic because uh, I think it's a very hot topic. Uh, it's a very important one. Uh, it intersects uh, with many, many, many issues uh, that are very relevant for the theory of democracy, law, and um, politics in general. So I think uh, the, I mean, the, the, the topic of the thesis is of, of utmost uh, interest. Um, as Agnes, uh, uh, myself, I have many, many, uh, many um, doubts and, and many um, uh, problems uh, with, with, with the literature on uh, crowd law. Uh, and I want to share, share them with, with Agnes in order to try to find uh, some a constructive path uh, so uh, we we can make a contribution on this field um, I think it, it would be good for Agnes uh, if you start or, or you or you try to develop in your thesis a kind of theoretical chapter in which you can develop um, the theoretical literature on, on when a crowd could be smart. I mean, because crowd law uh, try, I mean, as a, as a main um, objective of, of, the, of this uh, enterprise uh, is the possibility to, to use the crowd in order to reach a smart objectives. So one of the, the main questions is when a crowd could be smart, in which conditions a crowd could be smart, because it's not, um, it's not uh, obvious uh, from the, from the outset that the crowd could, could be smart. I mean, and the conditions by which a, a crowd could be smart depend on many, many things. Uh, it depends on the, the target of the crowd, on the size of the crowd, on the process by which 
the inputs are aggregated. So there are many, many variables uh, at stake uh, for trying to answer that main question, when a crowd could be smart. And there, I think it could be very important for your project if you start reading the work of Scott Page and Lu Hong, that's very important for, for this topic because they, these two authors have made a great contribution by highlighting some conditions uh, under which a crowd or uh, could be smart uh, when addressing the, top, the, the, the target of uh, solving any problem. So this is, uh, I think, it could be a, a very, a, a very good um, start of, of your thesis. The, the be, trying to delve into the theoretical literature on on this uh, topic. So I I would also suggest you to uh, change the question of the of your PhD to, uh, I mean the the question is not does crowd law make better legislation I think the relevant question is under which conditions a crowd could make better legislation because it's not obvious that the crowd is always to uh, make better legislation the other uh, challenge uh, I think it's, uh, it's conceptual. I mean, because as you have said, Agnes, there are, it seems like the literature on crowd law is a kind of inductive enterprise, inductive uh, framework in which there are a lot of experiences, a lot of initiatives that they have a familiar, familiar resemblance. I mean, all of them uh, are text-based, text they use technology. All of them give participation to uh, many people that are not uh, selected, uh, or, or they are selective in a uh, quite uncontrolled way. Uh, but apart from those things, I mean, both are tech-based, and they give participation to many peoples. The other dimensions are vary in a huge way. I mean, the the objectives are very different. The the processes, the procedure, the aggregation phase, the way of communicating, all of the all of those dimensions seem to be very different. So so the 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 comparative, I mean, if you want to compare experiences that are so different, so different, and the, I mean, the, the, the purpose, the, you have a methodological problem. So I think one of the challenges is to unpack that big framework into uh, some, um, into a, conceptual framework that could make a contribution. And in order to do that unpacking, I suggest you to uh, take into consideration these three dimensions or conceptual dimensions. One is, what is a group, as you have said? Uh, I mean, the size of the group matters a lot, but not also the size of the group. It's also the way you recruit, you recruit the group. It's very important. It seems that crowd, the, all these experiences recruit a very large uh, body of, of people. It's, I mean, there's, there's something about the, the the, the size of the group that matters here is 
I mean, a, a citizen assembly, as, as far as I, I'm from my point of view, is not, uh, it shouldn't be considered or conceptualized as a crowd uh, initiative because the group is constrained into a, a, a quite, um, I mean, a small group. And it doesn't seem to be a crowd that. So I think the size matters a lot and, and, and the way, the uncontrolled way of recruiting can give you um, uh, um, um, a path in order to make a, a, a precise meaning of what a crowd is. The other, the other important dimension to take into consideration in order to, to build a much more ingrained concept of crowd law and to study experiences is the, the, the target of the, of, the, of the initiative, of the participatory process. And, and I think here you can, you have, you can constrain your, your research only to those experiences that have as a target, as, as a target the, the, the purpose to elaborate. I mean, you, you want to study how many people elaborate text or law text, because uh, there are a lot of crowd uh, movement, crowd experiences that are not um oriented to elaborate texts i mean if you take only that target you can uh, constrain your 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 research project much more and make a, a better contribution to the literature and the third dimension that you i think i suggest you to take into consideration is the tech the the, the, the technology how the technology is going to be used. And here you have a very, uh, I mean, a very challenging uh, dimension, very interesting, because that comes from the fact that there are, nowadays you have these uh, large language models by which you can augment uh, intelligence I mean, people intelligence in the, you can assist participants in uh, of participatory human agents uh, in the task of elaborating test, text. So one question is whether, I mean, here there are many questions that come, uh, that are coming with, 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 the, with this technology that could be very fruitful for your research project. Um, to what extent this technology is going to replace human agency? Uh, can we consider this technology, um, I mean, uh, uh, can, can we incorporate automatic participatory agents into the process of uh, crowd law or crowd law is only restricted to the human agency. I mean, there are many, many issues there that are very, very interesting to address and, uh, and will give you, uh, um, I mean, uh, a lot of, um, uh, will give you uh, hope to make uh, a, a huge contribution uh, in, in your PhD thesis. That's all. Uh, thank you very thank you. much. Thank you, Professor Linares. Uh, as we are waiting for Felipe Reis Salamanca, if you agree, and due to the lack of time, which we apologize once again, Agnes, if you agree that we just uh, let the next PhD candidate present her topic as Professor Duarte has to leave, and then we can go back to the your follow back and and uh, and to answer to the comments of Professor Linares. Do you agree with that? Is that all right with you? Thank okay. you very much for your understanding. We're just waiting for the other professor to join if he does. In the meantime, I have the honor to have here in Belgrade and to host 
Yunesi Boada Perez from the University of Genova Department of Law, uh, who will present her topic on normative hypertrophy. Am I, am I right? Okay. Yeah. Construction of a concept. And um, her uh, mentors are Pier Luisi Chassoni and Alessio Sardo from Genova. And she will briefly present her topic, and then we will give the word to the first commentator, Professor David Duarte from the University of Lisbon School of Law. And then afterwards to the doctor, postdoc fellow at the University of Belgrade um, Faculty of Law, Julieta Rabanos. So, Unesi, you have the floor. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for listening. And, and a special thanks to my commentators who will give me their feedback. So, thank you. Uh, today, I am presenting the first idea of my research project, uh, which is normative hypertrophy. And uh, I, I have called that construction of a concept because that is the first idea. Um, first, I want to make a theoretical study of the phenomenon through the analysis of some related ideas like the role of a rational legislator and a legal, at a legal system at an ideal level. This process, this principle should be coherent and reasonable and result in an ordinary normative system. However, this is not always the case, although there are areas of law with uh, limited regulations, such as the digital sector, there are others that are highly regulated, such as the financial and urban sector, which can seem like a jumble of legislation with uh, no discernible organization. I will also be developing my, uh, in my thesis the idea of the primacy of the law in the contemporary legal system and the hypertrophic jurisprudence. Then I will be present the manifestation of normative hypertrophy that I have identified so far, and even the cause and the consequences. And at the end, I pretend to carry out a comparative and practical analysis of an hypertrophical sector of law, like urban sector, the Cuban system and the case of Havana, the Italian system and the case of Milan, and the Portuguese system and the case of Lisbon. Uh, I will read my presentation in order to avoid a mistake with the language and in order to be more brief. Uh, but why is that a problem? Because juridical dispositions accumulate abnormally in law, like an excessive of promulgation that produce difficulties in the interpretation and application of law. Then it is necessary to determine the objectivity of the qualifier excessive for the promulgation of legal norm. First, there is no excessive regulation in law unless it is analyzed in a specific area, since the term is relative and does not allow generalization to the entire legal system. Second, normative hypertrophic is closely related to the complexity of the matter, which requires detailed regulation of its entire contents, like usually administrative law subjects. Third, the objectification of the concept depends on the subjective consideration of jurists, and how easy or difficult they can find the applicable law, the solutions they need for the particular case. So an excessive promulgation cannot be quantified. Fourth, excessive promulgation can be considered as unnecessary. And fifth element, it is the excessiveness can be attributed to the multiplicity of norm, to the multiplicity of legal provision or both. Uh, this last aspect will be taken up again when we talk about the hypertrophy manifestations. Uh, so the, um, the three main questions is uh, what are the manifestations, what are the causes, and what are the practical consequences of the phenomenon? Uh, the manifestation, I have, I have identified uh, hyperregulation, antinomies, and redundancy. In this subject, it is necessary to differentiate a legislative hypertrophy from normative hypertrophy, while a legislative hypertrophy refers to the multiplicity of legal texts that determines the dispositional basis. Um, this is understood as hyperregulation when we refer to the growing um, disproportionate increase of provisions as well as their constant modification. So this can be seen as a phenomenon, but also as a process related. Uh, that also increase the normative basis at the high level, which configure normative hypertrophy and the, and the greater occurrence of contradictions and redundancy in, uh, inside of the system. The, what could be the causes? First, the change of the government enforcing their policies. This point underlines the high level of state interventionism and a relationship between this and the poor legislative technique. 
Uh, the second one will be an over-reliance on right and law when other system of effective social regulations such as on right and law and, and morality are disregarded. Uh, this point is closely linked to the, pre to the previous point. Uh, on this subject, we can state that law as a basis of the contemporary legal system in opposition to the problem created by the nor excessive normative regulation, which is equally detrimental to the life in society because the greater number, excessive number of legal norms does not correspond to a better society. And it has uh, been identified in French doctrine as idealization of the law. The third cause could be the detachment from a coherent ideal regulatory process. This is significant in that normative hypertrophy can be caused by the direct action of legislators who brings about this functional change in the law that produces contradictions and both normative and linguistic redundancies. Also, the promulgation process falls, uh, although the promulgation process falls strictly in the area of the legal norms, the excessive of normative hypertrophy can be caused also by the action of legal interpreters that is judicial authority in the process of judicial promulgation of legal norms during their practical activities that have a direct influence on the positive law in force. Even those with more compressing conception of the concept of law might think that the hypertrophy could also be caused by the existence of different doctrinal positions in the sense of the multiplicity bibliography reference that a legal operator can find to argue his decisions. So if we think that the position of the academy can also generate normative hypertrophy, this would not be an unreasonable idea since the interpreter can lean on those ideas and create a new norm. However, for this study, this doctrinal hypertrophy will be considered only as an indirect influence for the phenomenon. Uh, the first consequence of normative hypertrophy is the chaos in the legal system, which is a high level of disorder consisting in profusions uh, of provisions and the continuous modification. And this makes it difficult to be sure uh, of how many provisions exist in a sector at a given moment, especially in highly regulated ones such as administrative law field. Another consequence is the difficult to operate in applying and interpre interpreting the law. This has a direct impact on the development of the process also if we think of the growing number of cases in court that will affect the delay in process causing slowness in justice. This, dif this difficulty can also be highlighted at the level of the citizens as a recipient of the provisions who may present difficulties in knowing and complying with the provisions and that could produce a devaluation of the law. Among other consequences, it is possible to find cases that they lead to redirection in the sense that one text leads to another and this to another, or even from an authority to another as a set of intermediate steps to achieve the solution of a case. This regulatory stratification is fundamentally <clears throat> the produce of a, bad, of a bad writing technique and can generate unnecessary regula <coughs> Sorry. regulatory details. These steps on science unfounded are known as bureaucracy. So it is time to enunciate the solutions or do the problem. The first one in a preventive way could be correcting the legislative policies if the verse of provisions is conditioned by a precise requirement of quality, coherence, organicity and simplicity. In this sense, it is necessary to provide a specific mechanism to the legislature, legislator, which won't be covered in this study, only enunciate a possible solution. And the second one uh, could be also a social reverse action um, the abrogation of legal norms, but we need to pay attention because uh, the phenomenon will modify the dispositional base and therefore the normative base and um, may cause more mm -hmm. antinomies and redundancies. So instead of the solution, it can become a problem. Uh, so for summarize, I can say that um, a sector of law is affected by normative hypertrophy is, if it's equivalent to saying that the sector is characterized by the existence of a very broad set of provision with in which, in combination with the legal, the judicial norms, excuse me, 
uh, taken from them, present redundancy and antinomies at the normal level and produce chaos in the legal system, difficulties in identifying regulatory gaps, difficulties in applying and interpreting the law, redirection, dif redirection difficult to manage and superfluous regulatory details. Uh, what uh, would be the main problem in my research and the main requests of your feedback? First, the construction of the normative hypertrophic concept that can effectively include legislative hypertrophic and normative hypertrophic as its expression in a normative system, as well as establishing a relationship system between the two of them. Second, the action of judicial interpreters creating normative hypertrophic and its relationship with the precedent, which I have not established yet, and the possible relationship between abrogation and normative hypertrophic and its use as a possible solution uh, for the problem. So this is so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nessie, very much for the short but very effective presentation on, leg on the concept of hypertrophy and legislative and normative hypertrophy. I will not uh, take any more time. I will give the word to Professor Duarte. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me for this. I think this is a very uh, fantastic initiative. And uh, thank you, Unessi, for your uh, short but interesting presentation. I will, I have a very brief time for this because um, I have to leave at uh, 7 p.m. Lisbon time, but I will address only two and a half points. My first point will be about the effects of hypertrophy. Uh, and in this list of effects, you make mention to redundancy, antinomies, hyperregulation, and uh, regulatory gaps. Well, I think it is clear that redundancy and antinomies are effects of hypertrophy. But I think hyperregulation is the same as hypertrophy. So I don't see, I, can, I really have difficult to see why something can be different from uh, its effects. Um, and I have difficulties to understand as well uh, how hypertrophy can lead to regulatory gaps. Um, I don't see uh, how this might happen since we are just di diagnosing a problem of excessive uh, number of norms and not exactly the opposite. My second point <laughs> is related to a much more substantial, uh, 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 but also in the in the first one still. Uh, one of the effects, I think it is very much connected with the hypertrophy, uh, normative hypertrophy, is the increased difficulty in discovering legal solutions. And I think you have also to consider this. The normative system becomes more complex and um, legal actors from uh, simple agents until the judge themselves have much more difficulty in order to find legal solutions for cases. Moving to the second point, I really do not see how interpreters in general and judges in particular can be um, actors of this hypertrophy. Uh, and I say so because irrespective of small of some legal systems in which um, judges can have the power to produce norms, uh, and I don't mean exclusively common law systems. For instance, in Brazil, there is a provision uh, whose content allows the Supreme Court to create norms, but without these kind of very specific situations, I, I think judges uh, are totally submitted to the provisions that were enacted by lawmaking authorities, and the most they can do is to choose among alternatives or meaning whenever law is undetermined or uncertain for some kind of circumstances. So um, I find it very difficult to understand that uh, outside these kind of situations in which judges can effectively produce because they have the power to produce norms, I don't see how they can be actors of this kind of phenomenon. Uh, mainly taking you in, into account because they are totally submitted to a specific frame. Of course, you can tell me that there are some cases in which there are gaps and judges will fill the gaps and create norms, but these are very, very, very specific situations. And in the general view, 
Um, I think this is a point in your work that has to be very careful thought about. My half point regards the first sentence of your summary when you speak about the adaptability of law. I think this term adaptability of law is quite misleading because law does not adapt. Law lives in a different uh, level, which is the level of the ought to be, and law is changed. It's changed by the actors who have the power to change it. And uh, to adapt and to change are two totally different things. Of course, I understand what do you mean? You mean that society becomes more complex and therefore law has to change as well in order to provide for solutions to new problems. But it is not adaptation. This is not something that law makes itself without the intervention of legal actors that exercise power. This is law changing, changing by direct action of these actors. And it is whole. Thank you very much. Thank you once again. Thank you, Professor, for taking the time to give very useful comments to UNESCO. Uh, once again, I, I think I should let Julieta speak now and then UNESCO will give the... Yeah, thank you. Julieta, you have the word. Yeah, thank you very much. Can you make me a presenter so I can share my screen? Of course. Just a second, Mila will do that. Yeah, thank well, you very much. And uh, hopefully without any technical difficulties, we will make you in just a second. Yeah, thank it's you. Okay, thank you. I think that you're a presenter now. Yes, just yes. leave me um, find my window. Is that okay? Yes, we can see your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I think this is a wonderful also opportunity and also initiative. So I'm really glad to be participating in this and also to be commenting on UNACE's work. So my comments, I have um, two comments and one challenge in a wide sense. So to go for the comments, I, I wanted to comment on the choice of the name of the concept that you're trying to reconstruct. In the sense of, I think that hypertrophy is an analogy from the biological term of hypertrophy or hypertrophy. And in this sense, I think that it should be um, better for you to use hyperplasia in this sense. I have consulting this with my sister, which is a physical therapist. And she was like, oh no, I think that she should use this other term because so when you talk about hypertrophy you talk about uh, this um, state of things in which uh, the thing or the size of the thing has um, incremented uh, in size because of uh, the incrementation of the elements and hypertrophy in biology it seems that it's the increase of the thing but because the the elements increase in size like for example a muscle and the other um the other thing the hyperplasia it seems that is the increasing of the thing because of an incrementation of the elements of the thing so just to like a very random comment about the analogy the biological analogy between the two of them what I think that really is important after this uh, random comment on, on the analogy is the fact that maybe you are taking hypertrophy or hyperplasia, this, this doesn't matter, in a really um, negative way. In the sense of, uh, for example, in biology, this hypertrophy is not necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't really necessarily have an, a negative connotation. In fact, for example, athletes like football players um, try to hypertrophy their muscles so to avoid further injuries. So in this sense, hypertrophy is not only not a bad thing, but it's also beneficial for them. So I would say that maybe this is just a thing to, um, to comment on maybe the reflection about using a term that is 
um, necessarily negative connotated in this sense. Um, and also because I think that um, you're assuming that hypertrophy is something that it's like um, some unconscious, no, unconscious, it's not uh, the word, it's unintentional outcome of, for example, um, a group of actions or a group of uh, disorganized uh, disorganized action by a multiplicity of actors. But hypertrophy can be, for example, in this analogy with biology, can be an intentional thing. Maybe a negative one or a beneficial one, but intentional. So maybe you can also think about this when you're trying to construct or reconstruct the concept. And the third comments about the choosing of the name that I that I came with this fact the fact that I think that these brief considerations about the analogy between uh, hypertrophy in biology uh, uh, hypertrophy in the normative science that you're trying to transplant in a wide sense um, I think that these considerations could be useful for you when you're trying to construct the concept that you're trying to construct for example, trying to first define whether you want a concept that is factual or normative, in the sense of do you want to just describe the situation or you want also to incorporate some ideal that, for example, law needs to aspire to. And so this concept allows you to also evaluate the situation you're trying to describe. This happens, for example, when you with concepts like authority and legitimate authority, in which you have some aim or some goals that the object that you're trying to define as an authority, for example, aspires to be. So this is something that I think that you should consider when you're trying to reconstruct the concept, because it will be useful also for you to know if uh, you need to consider within your thesis this second set of elements. Um, if you need to also have a theory, for example, of the ends and goals that a legal order aspires to, like, for example, it was discussed with Diego, with the instrumental social value or instrumental social use that law can um, represent as a means to uh, arrive to something. And if the legal order um, or how a legal order needs to be so to arrive or achieve these goals. The other thing that I may, um, may suggest you to consider is the methodology you are using to construct concepts. If you are defining concepts, for example, as a set of necessary and sufficient properties, if you just want some essential conditions, this changes a little. Or if you are more inclined, for example, um, with a methodology of central marginal cases or clusters of relevant properties, or um, the concept that I think that was mentioned by Sebastian Linares, this um, family resemblance, like uh, objects or um, situations that appear to be similar, but in a familiar way. They don't share all of them. We are, um, we are convinced that we can denominate all of them in this way, but they don't really share all the properties. So maybe also this is something that you can consider when you're trying to reconstruct the concept. And also, I think that this, this is a very interesting thing to consider you should consider also the temporal dimension of the phenomenon that you're trying to analyze. In your, um, in your summary, you said, for example, that a legal order does, doesn't really, um, is not born hypertrophic, but is um, converted. And this, I think that this temporal dimension that you can include in the analysis and then you can include in the, in the concept would be amazing for you. 
So my second comment is about the methodology that you are, I think, that proposing in the summary and that we um, we also spoke about in private conversations. And I think that it's a very interesting thing to try to reconstruct the concept in the sense, in this sense of uh, tutu, Rossian tutu, like um, a set of conditioning factors and then a set of consequences and having this normative hypertrophy to be the link between one and the other. My only comments with this is that at least in your summary, I have reconstructed a little more uh, in a more complex way in your presentation, but unfortunately my slides were based only on your summary and then I, we, can, we can talk about this uh, in private if you want. So I tried to reconstruct it um, using the things that you mentioned in the summary and then you divide it between these causes, consequences and manifestations of normative hypertrophy. And I try to represent it in an Alfrosian way. So to try to schematize the thing. Okay, so I think that this is something on the likes of what you, and I think that it's fantastic because I really, I'm really into this methodology, but I think there are some issues with this. So, I, for example, don't really know if the causes needs, need to be included in the concept, for example. I am not really sure if what you call the manifestations of um, normative hypertrophy are manifestations like examples of, if they are causes, if they are conditioning facts, or if they are effects. For example, David Duarte took um, antinomies and uh, redundancies as effects, but I think that they can be taken as causes. Uh, so sorry, causes not, uh, conditioning facts. And this is a second reconstruction, for example, that I think that might be made on the things that you were trying to reconstruct. So causes are outside the concept. It's something that you maybe propose, um, but it's a different question, I think. Here, I maybe, so something causes antinomies, hyperregulation, normative redundancy, excessive law stratification, blah, blah, blah. And this, all of these are conditioning facts for normative hypertrophy, and then we have a set of consequences, okay? My problems with this, and this is the things that maybe could be useful for you when you are trying to keep um, reconstructing the concept and keep with this methodology, is that all the, not all the conditions here, at least in this reconstruction, share the same consequences. For example, clearly antinomies have no connection to, with a difficulty to identify gaps. And I think that this, this was also mentioned, like widely mentioned by David before. The second thing would be that some conditions by themselves doesn't really seem problematic, like for example, normative redundancies. They have no connection with a difficulty to identify gaps, or this dispersion of legal solutions, or with under understanding what law is, for example. Then I think that, and this was also mentioned by, by David, I think that some conditions can be included in other conditions. For example, antinomies and redundancies can be seen as cases of hyperregulation. I am not going to say that hyperregulation is the same as normative hypertrophy. This was said by David. I don't think I agree, but okay. And, and this is my last comment that I think that I want to ask you or to, um, to take this into consideration when reconstructing it, is that are all these um, conditions or conditioning facts uh, necessary and nor sufficient for the concept? In the sense of, um, so in a very 
classical Russian uh, way, we have all these conditioning facts as um, necessary, con um, so sorry, sufficient conditions for the appliance of the concept, and then uh, all the consequences as conjunctions. But I think that, for example, I don't really know if all the conditioner conditioning facts that you are trying to identify are in this junction, in the sense of if they are sufficient conditions or if they are necessary conditions and the set of them is sufficient for normative um, hypertrophy. And this, and with this I conclude, this uh, conducts me to my challenges. So I think that one of the most interesting things about the concept that you're trying to construct here, this hypertrophy concept, is uh, to define what exactly is the characteristic that a hypertrophic ligar order has. Uh, this distinctive characteristic that is not completely a synonym of inconsistency and or incompleteness and or dependency and on uh, co incoherence, etc. But the thing is, if you conclude that this hypertrophic legal order is an inconsistent, incomplete, dependent, incoherent, and, 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 the question I would say would be, uh, why having an independent concept to encompass all these characteristics when it's perfectly possible to just characterize this legal order as the sum of these characteristics. But if you conclude, and I think that this is your point, that a hypertrophic legal order is the result of the conjunctions of at least some of these characteristics, then the question to be answered, I think that it's different, is how and in which sense the conjunction of all these character characteristics, I'm so sorry, makes it relevant to have an independent concept to apply to them. And taking your presentation into consideration, this last thing. You have said that you want to ask about uh, what are the manifestation causes and consequences of normative hypertrophy. My question here would be, are all these questions answerable by constructing or reconstructing a normative concept? Is it possible that maybe the scope of your investigation is just too broad. And so the final challenge should be this. What is the central question that you would like to ask and to in your dissertation? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Julieta, firstly, for this um, great presentation that you prepared for your effort, for the methodology, for the scheme, for the schema that you provided. Uh, for this, um, as a commentator, this was for me very fascinating and for the depthness of your insights and comments. I hope, uh, I saw that Unessi was taking notes as well, so I think I'll just give her a minute to answer to your comments and then we can go back to Agnes. Thank you once again, Julieta. Okay, thank you, Julieta. Thank you, David. Maybe the uh, the goal of my research is still a uh, why is a research that I start two months ago, so I starting to making this um, to making this research. Uh, just I seen that your comments uh, about the um, uh, conditioning facts. Uh, I really like maybe the manifestation does not um, express what I want to, to express and the condition in fact is the more adequate uh, term uh, about the um, judici uh, the, um, the interpreters by uh, actors to create normative hypertrophic in this sense. Uh, that depends of the concept that we have of norms because they also, they don't the issue is not to choose only between one or another uh, legal test or or, this, or disposition they can also create norm depending on the application or with the, his labor of interpreting 
Um, about uh, well, about the other stuff, I have to to emphasize well, as well in the cons in the construction of the consent. I told you before that this kind of instrumental consent style, uh, Alf Ross. I really like for my hypertrophic concept because I am having some problems to um, to choose the condition and the elements that include the concept that could be uh, all of these have the same consequences and have the same cost. So maybe this empty concept uh, uh, like Alfros would be the an excellent choice, but I'm still working on it. <laughs> Because to make a theoretical um, study from a phenomenon that I am constructing, because it's not controlled, it's, there is no a bibliography before, you, it's kind of difficult, but thanks, I will take in this into consideration. I will really appreciate if you send me also your comments. Yes, Julieta, can you send uh, Unesi? I think it will be great if she gets your, uh, your presentation, right? But of course. You did so great that I think it will be very helpful for her. We are both uh, delighted to have it. And the methodolo mm -hmm. methodological part as well, as I saw. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. yes. Thank you once again. Uh, and then, uh, Unesi, if you agree, I can now conclude your part. Mm -hmm. Yes. Julieta, is that all right with you? I saw that Professor Duarte had to leave a few minutes earlier. Okay. Then, uh, thank you once again. Mm -hmm. Julieta, and to you, Unesi, as well. I will just uh, take a few minutes to go back to Agnes uh, because uh, we were waiting for the second commentator. And, of course, we had the opportunity to hear from the first commentator, Professor Sebastian Linares, uh, who gave his insight on Agnes' work. Uh, and I would, if you agree with me, give just a minute or two to, uh, to Agnes uh, to give her feedback on the comments to professor, of Professor Linares, and then if Professor Ray Salamanca is with us, to hear uh, his comments as well. Uh, once again, uh, I apologize for this kind of uh, short notice we had in, uh, in the change of our agenda. This was just due to these uh, problems with connections, and that's why we had to reverse. Uh, thank you, and Agnes, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and do not worry, it's more than uh, understandable. Um, so regarding um, Professor Lin um, Linares uh, comments, um, there has been so much useful information in your uh, in your uh, comments. Um, I don't even really know where to start from. Um, but yes, a couple of comments. I think what you said about um, focusing on when a crowd can be smart is one of my main concerns. Um, I actually was planning on looking on um, kind of um, making some sort of comparison between individual intelligence and collective intelligence to kind of justify what this... Because I keep thinking that the concept of collective intelligence is what makes the the whole idea of crowd law um, stand out from maybe other initiatives and also what it makes it be something different from um, the general idea of crowdsourcing legislation, which is also, I think, um, a bit of an issue um, from what we have now in the in the scholarship. Um, regarding um, the three dimensions that you mentioned, size, target and technology, I have been working on the technological aspect and uh, your comments were very, very useful um, because so far there is not a lot of um, literature on the relationship between collective intelligence and artificial intelligence. And I think that is uh, something that needs to be tackled, not just for crowd law, but in general, um, because up to what point artificial intelligence is or can be a part of a, of a of a discussion because as we all are aware nowadays um technology is becoming uh, very very intelligent and and can do things that we did not think of um even a few months ago so um yes i was thinking on also providing um a classification or some sort of distinction between um 
the crowds in where technology was um, just a passive um, member. Um, this means uh, in where technology was just used um, for uh, facilitating um, the work of the humans in the crowd and crowds in where technology was actually active, uh, maybe by summarizing and, and or even being the voice of a, of a group. Um, I don't know, for example, of, uh, of, of groups that do not have a voice like animals or future generations. I don't know. I'm just brainstorming, brainstorming here. Um, also, the point about the target, I think this is very important because um, I don't think a crowd experiment can exist without having a goal. So this is something that can be very or, or, or has to have some sort of defining role in all this puzzle. And I did not think about the size of the group. Um, and I think it's going to be very useful. Uh, what you said about the, the mini publics, um, I think all these uh, other experiments on uh, participatory democracy or deliberative democracy have to be somehow differentiated from crowd law. And that could be a very useful, useful element. And uh, yeah, I think I think that's pretty much it. And I hope we have the chance to discuss this again. <laughs> Thank you, Agnes. Thank you for your feedback. And I will, as I see now, Professor Salamanca is with us. Uh, do you hear us, Professor? Yes, I do. I do. Do, do you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, we're well, very happy great, to have you here as a commentator. Uh, so we will just um, because Agnes had also the opportunity before to present her PhD thesis and Professor Sebastian Linares already gave her the comments. Now it is your turn, if you agree, to give your insight and your comments and suggestions to, to her thesis. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank first of, all, of course Agnes and, and the organizers for, for this wonderful event. And I have to apologize because I had a confusion with the time uh, because of the summertime uh, and the, the app that I, that I used really didn't, didn't work this time. So that's why I'm a little bit uh, late to do uh, these comments of a very interesting work. This is the first thing I would like to, I would like to say. And it's uh, Agnes' work is very important for, for many reasons. The first reason I would mention, and perhaps the most important, is that I, I feel, I don't know if Agnes shares this feeling with me, uh, that the democratic theory field still doesn't have um, addressed seriously the influence and the impact of technologies. I think that we are still writing democratic theory in some sort of way as if we were in the 80s or something like that, or in the 90s. So any work that addresses futures related with a technology, it's very, very welcome as Agnes work uh, does. That's the first thing I would like to, I would like to say. But the, the, the selection of the topic, it's also very important, the crowd law. And the question that Agnes is asking is crucial for the following reason, because the acts of parliament, the, the, what parliament does, has usually been understood as the expression of the popular will. So good law, good law in some sort of sense, very, very classic sense, is what actually parliament decides to do. That's good law because it's the expression of the popular will. So. We shouldn't need, from that classic perspective, any other uh, standard. But Agnes is trying to find these uh, different standards. She's trying to go from the view of Parliament as just a vehicle for expressing popular will to ask actually what makes a good law. And that is a very uh, ambitious, ambitious uh, uh, question. But I think that Agnes, we, we need to think more about an argument that we need to build to answer that classic form of thought that believes that good law is just what parliament does. We need to think to, we need to, to think to find we need to find good reasons about why do we need other standards, other normative criteria? Why do we need normativity 
or law different to the democratic legitimacy usual uh, arguments. And I think that you have an interesting argument and that is argue and that argument could be built in this some sort of way. You might say that uh, without some standards, without some other standards, there can't be a good expression of popular will. I think that this is the argument. So if, for example, as if law is really confusing or if law is actually very contradictory, if law is not transparent enough, then it doesn't count. It won't count as a truthful expression of popular will. So, so that's that's the argument, Agnes, that I think that we have to build. And after we build that kind of argument, then we can look for the other normative criteria that you are enlisting in your uh, paper. About this criteria, and this is my my, my second comment, Agnes. I, I think that we have to some sort of way shorten this list. It's, it's too long, and we need we need least. I don't know, maybe three normative criteria or something like that. And I think, Agnes, that we have to think of this criteria on what good law is beyond uh, linguistic aspects and, log and, and logical aspects. And I would like to propose two criteria that are not logical and are not linguistic. Um, the first one is a very obvious one. A constitutional uh, compatibility. So I wouldn't say that good law is a good is a law that contradicts both formally or materially the constitution of a given state. I think that that's an argument for uh, a normative argument, legal argument about what good law uh, is. And I would like to propose a second one. And of course, you might not, not agree with it, but we can think about parliament, and this is the topic that I'm now developing in my in my own work. Uh, we can think about parliament as an expression of the will from the majority of the majority, as we can think of, for example, as democracy of the gov as the government of the people. But there's an alternative to this thinking in, in political philosophy that treats democracy not as the government of the people, but as the government of everyone, of all. And that's different. It's different when you consider democracy and you consider the work of the legislature as the government of the people or the government of all. Because the government of the people is at the end the government of the majority. And the law of the people is at the end the law of the majority. That is a different understanding from the government of the people as the government of all in which for example, a piece of legislation should somehow find a good compromise between the majorities and the minority and the minorities also. So uh, the law, the law should be a reflection not just of what majorities want, but also of what minorities need. So laws should encompass some form of compromise. I think that is, this is a view of democracy that we could justify from a deliberative democracy perspective. And myself, I find it very interesting. And that could build, Agnes, a new norm, a powerful normative criteria for legislation in the sense that a good law is not only a good law that is uh, coherent and transparent from the point of view of a majority, a good law is a law, a piece of legislation that also includes in some sort of way the perspectives, the interests, the wishes of the political minority uh, um, with, with some forms of transaction, with some forms of concessions from the majority to uh, the... Uh, so, for example, I will, I will put an, an, an example, a very polemic one, uh, the Brexit. So the Brexit was supported by the, by the majority of the British people, the English people, in a referendum. Yes, but half of the population didn't want Brexit. So that means that maybe from a democratic perspective, a good outcome would be a Brexit, but not a hard Brexit, a soft Brexit, that would include also the feelings and the wishes and the preferences and the thoughts of the people who didn't vote for the Brexit. So that's a form of compromise that I see uh, very useful and, and, and normatively appealing from the point of view 
of democracy. And I will end my comment by saying that I think that it's very interesting, Agnes, the path that you are following when you say that crowd law has both a descriptive and a normative dimension. This is very often in democracy. Actually, the concept of democracy also has this both descriptive and normative, the concept of representation as well. So this is very common uh, uh, in the field. I would like to press you a little bit in, this, in the following sense. It's crowd law the concept that we are interested in, or is, cat, or is crowd law just a catchword for something else and something deeper? So do we really want to know what crowd means in the concept of crowd law, or we just have to admit that crowd, crowd law is a catchword, like a lima, like just do it for Nike or something like that, but actually the concept is much deeper than that. But in any case, I agree with you completely. I agree with you that the concept cannot be defined with normative qualities. And the reason for that is that we need a definition of crowd law. We need a concept of crowd law that allows us to define also and to include cases of bad crowd law, of wrong crowd law. And of course, if we define crowd law as something good, as something valuable, as something we won't, we won't account for bad practices of uh, a crowd law. So those were my, my, my three comments. Thank you very much, Agnes. This is a very interesting work, a very interesting topic, and a very interesting group of intuitions and very good developed ideas that you already already have. And I'm really so sorry for being one hour late. It was because of the summertime confusion. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Professor Salamanca. And uh, we're very happy that you actually managed to connect and to give your comments that I think will be very useful to Agnes further on. Uh, and Agnes, I hope, yes, you're still with us, that you had the opportunity to hear everything that Professor commented on your work. Uh, if you have any additional questions or comments to his expose, uh, I will uh, kindly ask you just to wait to the Q&A session. And now we will, due to shortage of the time, as it is the case uh, usually in our conferences, uh, give the word to the next uh, presenter and next candidate, PhD candidate. So just to share the, the, the screen, yes. So. My next candidate next to me is uh, Mila Georgievich, who is giving the instructions to her colleague how to put the presentation on. Yes. So Mila Georgievich is a teaching assistant at the Faculty of Law, University of Belgrade, a dear colleague of mine, and as well, she's a young academic researcher in the ALF project. Uh, Mila is currently the only PhD candidate who actually presented twice or will present twice in this third seminar as she had her presentation already in the morning session and uh, that's not the same presentation by the way so two research papers and now Mila will present her second research paper on the topic social inequalities in criminal proceedings in Serbia and we have the honor to welcome two commentators uh, for the Mila's paper is Dr. Ambrose Lee senior lecturer at the Surrey Center for Law and Philosophy Thank you very much for your participation. And secondly, Dr. Piotr Pistranovsky, a researcher at the Interdisciplinary Center for Ethics, Faculty of Philosophy, University of Krakow. So now Mila will shortly present her topic and then we will give the word to the commentators. Thank you very much, Mila. Uh, Maria, thank you very much for this uh, great introduction. So as Maria said, my name is Mila Djordjevic and uh, today I'm speaking uh, uh, about uh, my PhD thesis, and the working title is Social Inequalities in Criminal Proceedings in Serbia. Uh, the core idea of my dissertation is to conduct an empirical research and see whether social inequalities do have impact on the outcome of the criminal proceedings in Serbia. The main hypothesis of the thesis is that the offender from higher social classes have more benevolent treatment than offender from the lower social class in front of the courts. And in order to define the concept of social class, I will use the theory of Pierre Bourdieu, which recognized that except from material capital of the individuals, his cla uh, class can be defined through his social, 
capital and as well as through his cultural capital. The concept of social class in my empirical research will be operationalized through income of, of the individual, but also throughout his education or level of education and through his employment. But apart from testing social class attributes of the offender, I will test the impact of ethnicity, of gender, and on the, of previous convictions of the offender to the outcome of the criminal proceedings. And regarding the content of my presentation, just to move to the next slide. Uh, yes, here, here it is. So it will consist of six parts theoretical framework, then a little bit of context in Serbia, normative framework in Serbia, statistic reports, since we don't have any previous empirical research regarding this topic in Serbia, then suggestions for the methodolog methodological part of the research, and then some concluding uh, assessments. And theoretical framework starts from non-formalistic approach to legal in interpretation, uh, meaning that uh, law is deeply vague and that judges have a lot of discretion in deciding their cases and that is more often than not that non-normative factors do have impact on the outcome of the proceedings. And this idea was first brought up by American legal realists and afterwards it was proven by numerous sociological, psychological and in wider sense empirical research. And currently, currently in uh, United States of Amer America, there are four major theories in criminal law regarding the outcome of the criminal proceedings and judges' discretion. So it's conflict theory, uncertainty avoidance theory, causa causational attribu attribution theory, and focal concerns theory. And here I have some citations regarding some of them. So Turk is the representative of conflict theory which states that criminal justice system is a, in fact, criminalization process that transforms person into official criminals, but less on the basis of their behavior or, or what they have done, but more on the basis of their social ascriptions. And then we have Albonetti, uh, which recognized that judges are working in the uncertain surrounding and that they are, have to make, in this, make, make a decisions in the area when they are unable to predict accurately future criminal behavior of, the, of offenders in front of them. And then the, that's the reason why they're using defendants' characteristics, circumstances of the crime, and case processing outcomes in order to uh, assess the defendant's disposi disposition towards future criminal activity. And attributions of a stable and during disposition are expected to increase the sentence severity, while just in temporary or situational involvement in crime are expected to decrease senses, uh, sentence severity. So these attri attributions provide a basis for arriving at ra rational decision in a domain of responsibility characterized by uh, uncertainty. And just uh, the Stefan Meyer and De uh, Demut, which are the representatives of the uh, fourth um, theory, which is now uh, represent, um, uh, um, recognized in the United States of America, uh, they state that in order to reduce uncertainty, judges may rely not only on the defendant's present offense and prior criminal conduct, but also on attributions linked to defendant's gender, race, social class, or other social positions. And despite the fact that all these theories are used in America, mostly to explain disparities between lenient treatment of white collar crime, crimes and disparities between white people and black people uh, in uh, imprisonment, uh, in imprisonment population in America, I do believe that these theories can be applicable in Serbia and that they can explain uh, discrepancies which exist, and I will try to prove that in my uh, uh, thesis, as well in Serbian prisons. Uh, so now a little bit of the context in Serbia. So, um, yeah, in Serbia we have around 6 million people without Kosovo. It's important to recognize that ethnic structure is almost 80% of Serbs, but it's important that we have 2% of Roma people, which are uh, usually 
socially deprived. And one of my hypotheses is that they're overrepresented in prison population, so that there are more prison population uh, with Roma than uh, in overall population. Our in Gini index is 35, meaning that it's uh, higher than the, in majority of European states, which recognize the importance of realizing social inequalities in front of the law and the impact they have in front of the law. And it's important to mention that uh, every fourth person in Serbia, so around 24 uh, percent of the, our population is at risk of poverty and around 7% of our total population lives with less than 100 euros um, per month. Uh, and I'm just mentioning our educational structure since my hypothesis is that since literacy, literacy rate in Serbia is around 98%, I believe that uh, illiteracy rate is higher in prison uh, population. Uh, regarding the normative framework, so, uh, okay, yeah, uh, we have, uh, I'm just now highlighting the constitution provision of prohibition of discrimination, and it's important to mention that constitution do recognize the social origin can be a route for, for a discrimination, and Article 33 is also important since it states that if a person um, uh, without sufficient means to pay for a legal counsel shall have the right to free legal counsel when he, uh, the interest of justice so require. Um, and therefore, having in mind the context and the normative framework, uh, and the old theories previous mentioned, I will now just show you some statistics which are available right now on the internet uh, for 2021. And I will in this statistic, uh, I will in this uh, next slides compare two, ty two types of the offenses. So I will compare offenses against property and offenses against economic interests because offenses against property are typical street crimes and offenses against uh, against economic interests are typical white collar crimes and afterwards i will uh, highlight the theft and the tax avoidance as the most common uh, offenses for each from these uh, groups so now i will show you <laughs> or yeah yeah, so harder. Uh, now you can see two pie charts uh, with discrepancies between offenses against property and offenses against economic interests. So in 87% of all indictments against property, we have uh, convictions uh, in comparison to 73% uh, of convictions in offenses against economic interests. Uh, and, for example, it's important to mention that equatals are given in just 4% of the cases in offenses against property and in 11% of the cases in offenses against economic interest. And if we go further, um, okay, now we are going to analyze the judgments of the convictions for the same offenses for the same year. So the most typical uh, conviction is suspended sentence, which is the most lenient one, like most plausible for the offender, because the suspended sentence uh, court determines punishment of the offender. And, um, so uh, it states that uh, punishment will not be enforced unless the convicted person commit a new offense during a period set by the court. So it was given uh, in five, five, uh, 52% in the cases of offenses, uh, of offenses against economic interest and in 45% uh, percent of, uh, in the cases of offenses against property. Imprisonment as the most severe punishment was given in 36% in the cases of, uh, of offenses against property and in the 19% in, in the offense, in the cases of offenses against economic interests and 20% is give uh, of home incarceration is given uh, for the cases of offenses against economic interest in comparison to il just 11% of offenses against property and now if we go further and analyze only theft 
as the most common uh, offense from the group of uh, street uh, crimes and tax avoidance from the group of um, white collar crimes for 2021, we can see even bigger discrepancy. So in the case of theft, only each 10th offender got uh, the uh, didn't get the conviction in the comparison to 64% of uh, convictions uh, in the case of tax avoidance. And it's also interesting to point out that suspension of the proceedings was given in the 15% uh, of the cases for tax avoidance and only in 4% of the cases for uh, theft. And uh, in prison, you now see again the discrepancy. So, imprisonment uh, sentence was given in only one third of the cases for theft and only in 15% for the imprisonment, while 18% of home uh, imprisonment was given to tax avoidance and 8% for theft. And now I'm comparing the severity of imprisonment sentences for theft and for tax avoidance. And uh, you can see the difference in which the judges were using the, their discretion. So these orange line are explaining the minimum and maximum sentences which are given by the law. And you can see in the case of theft, judges were using the minimal sentences, the maximum sentences, uh, and the middle ones, while the case of the tax avoidance, uh, imprisonment sentences were giving all, given only for like minimum uh, minimal duration, and even in the ca cases of tax avoidance, judges were going uh, above the minimum prescribed by law, which is the opportunity which is given to them. But as you can see, they're using the using it only in the cases of tax avoidance, and this is the graph which I. Uh, we like uh, to show you again. So now I'm calculating uh, the exact duration of the sentences into percent. So 0% on this horizontal X represent minimal sentence and 100% the maximum one. And you can see that judges were giving uh, the harsher, uh, harsher, harsher sentence in the cases of tax avoidance was only like 20% of the whole uh, maximum which is given them uh, by the law. So these are just pre preliminary views since um, I have limited available data right now, but it was just to show you the where I'm going with my thoughts about the methodology. So I will now show you just quickly three uh, like directions in which I want to conduct my empirical research. So I want to compare offenses against property and economic interest in the way I did here, but with the concrete uh, judgments. And despite doing a qualitative research, I'm also interested in doing a qualitative one, since I'm uh, interested in the very words which are you were using used in the reasoning of the judgments, because I think that even in the way of they were explaining and reasoning their decisions, we can see the discrepancy between white collar crimes and uh, street crimes. Uh, second part of the methodology is quantitative research of data from imprisonment facilities. So this were the first part was from the judgments uh, from the courts. And now in the second part, I want to analyze uh, the structure, social structure of the uh, in imprisonment facilities in Serbia. So imprisonment facilities do have data about their offenders. And I'm interested if they're over representation of some social attributes of their offenders. So of, uh, regarding their nationality, if they're of over representation of Roma people, then in general population, then uh, regarding education, if there is over population with uneducated people, uh, without job as well, and without completed any training and specialization, uh, and do uh, previous convictions also have impact? And just quickly to mention the third part of the methodology. Oh, quickly, quickly. Yeah, very quickly. So, uh, okay, the interviews with the judges. Uh, 
regarding whether they are even aware of this discrepancy between street crimes and white collar crimes, how they're approaching these two different time, type of crimes, how they're approaching their defendants, uh, their offenders based on their educational level, social background, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So now in this concluding assessments, I just have the idea that even if I do not prove my main hypothesis, at least we have first empirical research on this topic in Serbia, and that these uh, PhD theses can help us understand the structure of Serbian imprisonment facilities, the, uh, under, uh, the process of judicial decision making and understand, understanding of white collar crimes uh, in Serbia by Serbian judges. So, I hope I was clear. So these are just my preliminary views of my thesis, and I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mila. Um, thank you for presenting some interesting aspects of your topic uh, that we had the opportunities to see, especially the statistics, and of course, the comparison of imprisonment sentences. And of course, I will tell you, don't be so pessimistic in your conclusion now, in your concluding remark, but um, I will give now the floor to the commentators and just to see if we have them online. Uh, uh, Ambrose Lee and Piotr, are, are you there? For example, Dr. Ashley, do you hear us and are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Um, can you hear me? Hi, we hear you. Thank you very much. Welcome. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Hello. Without further ado, I'll give you the floor. You can give your comments and insights to uh, Mila's presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Very nice to see everyone online again. Um, so I, I, I don't have anything as elaborate as what Julieta just presented. I mean, her thing was, was impressive, so there's no way I can I, I will provide anything close to that. Um, I don't really have a lot of comments, even more, just more questions, to be honest, about, about what you're doing here. Um, and, you know, I'll try to speak for 10 minutes, I might even fall short of that. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think, I think, uh, you know, the, you know, why, you know, what was worthwhile about this project, why you ought to do it, I think is, un you know, there's no question about why it's worth doing it. Uh, so I'm not even going to try to say anything. I think you, you sell the case by itself. So there's really no need to come in on that. I think for me, really, it's just a couple of questions about how you frame your project and how you're seeing it develop. Um, so I think the first thing is that, so I, I tend, so originally I thought it was quite interesting about how you, the thesis that you were trying to test was whether, you know, uh, whether or not the more well off a party is, the better the chance of the courts treating it with benevolence, right? So that's kind of the thesis that you were trying to go for. And originally when I read the abstract, I thought, oh, when you went well off, you were th thinking about economic well off, you're thinking about income and stuff. But now that I hear your presentation, is you, you're going for much something much broader than that, right? Well off in some general sense, cultural capital, education, income, even gender factors into it. And I mean, I think that's right, and it's important to know all these things, but just as a matter of testing your hypothesis, you might want to be slightly more narrow here. So you want to pick something that's really the determinant, because if the group is too large, then you're going to have difficulty trying to make sense of like, so what exactly is the determinant here? Is it income? Is it gender? Is it employment? Is it, you know, some form of, you know, you know cultural racial biases or whatever? Because if the social class you're testing includes too many considerations, and then you're going to struggle to highlight what exactly is doing the work in explaining the discrepancy in, 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 in outcomes, i.e. conviction rates and sentencing. Uh, so I think you might want to narrow it down or, or you know, or, 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 or to, to make it a bit more specific. And I think it doesn't, I mean, I think income is an interesting thing to focus on. Uh, I thought one interesting thing that might be worth thinking more about is, 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 you haven't mentioned that, but I thought in the abstract, you kind of compared, you know, uh, you talked about America. So I don't know much about, you know, your legal system, but one thing that comes out when it comes to income uh, in relation to criminal justice systems in America or UK is, is the fact that, you know, we have a, you know, adversarial system where, you know, people actually, you know, you need to employ lawyers to debate and all the other stuff. And, and one thing that income makes a difference here is that, if I don't have enough money, I can't hire good lawyers uh, to do that for me. Uh, and so that significantly affects 
the, the outcome of, of the judgment. I, I can't defend myself properly, so to speak, because I lack the money to do so. Um, and, and I think this is a problem that some people might think intuitively that uh, maybe a non-adversarial legal system might not suffer from. So if I, if I can, if we don't need to hire judges to debate stuff, but to present my case to the judge and the judge is supposedly impartial on it, then maybe income wouldn't make that much of a difference. So, so I think there's a question here. I'm not saying this has to be the issue to focus on, but I thought there might be differences in legal systems such that certain kind of socioeconomic factor might make a difference in one legal system, but not in another. And that might be interesting to think more about because, you know, it's just because you have this comparative aspect in your abstract that I thought might be interesting or worthwhile to think more about. Um, and, and I think the final point I want to add is really just about what you just presented. So I thought the statistic you presented was very interesting. I just, I think for me, I just not quite sure what to make with those statistics. Um, so, I mean, if the thesis that you want to test is that, you know, if someone is more well off, then it's a better, better chances of the cost cheating and benevolence. Then, then I take it that what you ought to be doing there is first specify what it means to be well off. And I already talked about how you need to be a bit more narrow on that, I think, for your project to be vi viable. But also just like, you know, keep your offenses <laughs> constant, right? So if we try to compare two different set of offenses and then try to compare what is making them conviction rates good and better, then many things can explain that. You might think that maybe because there's lower conviction rate in white collar crimes because white collar crimes are such that it's much harder to prove in court cases. And that has nothing to do with any social economic process. Or maybe white collar crimes are, you know, are not defined very well or, or thefts generally are, are such that they have certain kind of elements that makes it easier to prove, whatever. So there are many explanations. Once you, once you take into account different kind of offenses, and there's many explanations as to why there might be more conviction rates, less conviction rates. There's nothing to do with the situation, the socioeconomic situation of, you know, the defendant. Um, and so I thought the more interesting statistics was to basically to hold constant the offense in question and to ask, okay, whatever the difference you're looking at, be it, it can, you know, it can, uh, income or, you know, uh, uh, race or, or cultural capital or whatever, uh, whether those group of people for that same offense are treated differently. That I think would be a more, um, so the focus way of showing using the statistics to show the thesis that you're trying to establish, um, as opposed to what you seem to be aiming to do in, doing right now. So I think that's kind of all the, the thoughts that I had. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, and thank you very much for, for this. I, I, you know, it, it, it was very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambrose. And uh, thank you for your advice on uh, how to narrow and focus the thesis and, and the arguments that, uh, that Mila presented, as this is always very important and one of the most difficult tasks uh, in our research work, especially as young academic researchers. And uh, now, before I give Mila the word to, to continue and maybe have a feedback on your comments, I will just ask if uh, Piotr is uh, also available and with us to give his short comments and then we can join them together and Milak will give you a feedback if you agree. Thank you once again, Ambrose. Yeah, I'm here. Hi, everyone. It's, Hi. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's so great to see Mila, so great to see Ambrose and so many Hi. other familiar faces. Um, Hi. This is, this is a fascinating project. I, I'm super excited about it and I have so many thoughts to share that probably most of them I will share later over email and I will limit myself to two or three of them to stick to the time limit. And the first one was actually a thought I had while listening to the second part of the presentation. And this is something that Ambrose has already to some extent discussed towards the end of his comment much more eloquently than I will probably, but I, I think I, I still have something to add. So like there was this point where uh, Yumila said that um, uh, you have those white collar crimes. And of course there is like a lot of problems with defining white collar crimes. There's rather interesting literature on, on that in the American context, but rightly you said that we typically associate white collar crimes with people, offenders of higher social, social status, and you have those uh, more common offenses that you associated with the poor or in the Serbian context, you said perhaps you also associated them with uh, discriminated ethnic 
uh, minority. And those graphs, those plots that you presented, they were quite quite striking and they were cool. The, the distribution of of the severity of punishment that is so different for those two kind of offenses. This is something really telling. But again, uh, following to some extent Ambrose, I, I, I have some doubts whether you can easily prove your point just comparing uh, the distribution of punishment for different kind of offenses. Like the most straightforward kind of evidence you could present would be that you have the same offense. And after controlling for all re legally relevant factors, you can still see that the poor or uh, the Roma people, they still receive much noticeably harsher punishment than uh, uh, than people of, let's say, higher social status. But this would be very difficult for a number of reasons, so I, definitely I'm not recommending you to do it. Uh, uh, but, but, but again, the problem with um, comparing different kinds of offenses is that you have many ways of arguing why they might be different. And in the context of white-collar crimes, aside from many uh, aspects that Ambrose mentioned, you, you can also say that well, they typically don't harm a specific person, while, for example, theft by definition harms a specific person. So this is something that could be considered a relevant factor in sentencing uh, decisions, uh, and, and you, could, you could probably find more arguments like that. And this all leads me to one suggestion. I, I, I don't know if you would find it interesting, but as some of you know, I'm, I'm more of an experimentalist. And whenever we face a difficult question that is difficult to answer with existing data, it might be interesting to consider whether we could like produce some data by running a um, controlled experiment. Like uh, I, I just had that idea that you could pr present you know, part some participants, perhaps legal officials from Serbia, with uh, one of two kinds of offenses and manipulate something. Like for example, manipulate the information of what part of the Serbian population typically engages in that kind of behavior. So obviously with tax evasion, you can easily uh, and plausibly tell them that uh, it's mostly, I don't know, like businessmen or business owners or, or I don't know, higher management or, or who not. But perhaps you could convincingly, uh, uh, convincingly tell the other group of participants that suddenly it happened that poor people started engaging in tax evasion. And if you're right, as you likely are that uh, so many of uh, Serbian legal officials um, might be might be discriminating against uh, such social groups. Then it would be, in my opinion, very interesting to see that having the same offense and asking them like what kind of uh, punishment should typically be imposed for that kind of offenses, that you would uh, get an effect of uh, of that information of which social group would typically engage in it. So this is just one suggestion. Uh, my other comment is slightly more general, I guess. Uh, namely, like you start with that hypothesis that the greater the social inequality is, uh, as I understand it, the greater is the social injustice that results from the operation of the criminal law system, uh, which, which sounds right to me. But then you say that you would uh, address that hypothesis or try to, I don't know, provide some evidence in favor of it by analyzing judicial decisions. And this is behind this choice, this methodological choice. I, I think that there is a strong, there is a strong theoretical assumption that, that I would like to perhaps challenge a bit, because this assumes that uh, social injustice resulting from the operation of the criminal law system typically uh, has its origin at the criminal trial stage, which might be not, not exactly true. And uh, I don't know, here, perhaps I would like to refer to one specific author who has influenced uh, very much the way I think about the American criminal law system, but also any kind of criminal law system, I guess, uh, William Stunt. And in particular, his most famous paper, uh, The Pathological Politics of uh, Criminal Law, I guess is the title. If, if, you, if you haven't read it, Mila, I think it would be, could be helpful in your project. The basic point of stance in that paper is that the main source of social injustice in the operation of the criminal law system is uh, judici not judicial discretion, prosecutorial uh, discretion. Like so, so, so much of injustice results from the fact that we let prosecutors to some extent greater in America, but in Europe, in continental Europe, we also let uh, prosecutors to enjoy 
a lot of discretion. We allow them to decide whether they want to investigate some crime or not, whether they want to press charge somebody with an offense, whether they want to indict somebody. And the result is that indeed, for example, they might choose to, uh, uh, to charge the poor, but not necessarily, let's say, middle class offenders. Like uh, in any country, uh, um, to give you an example in which uh, the possession of weed is, is, is a crime, I, I, I think quite typically we know that like a middle class kid found possessing weed probably doesn't face a really huge risk of uh, facing some legal problems. While on the other hand, if you're poor and you found with weed, uh, you cannot say the same. Like, there, there is a chance, there is a risk that uh, you will be criminally punished, punished for, for, for that. And this, this creates a lot of uh, pathological, pathological uh, dynamics, as Stans would say. For example, that middle class is no longer interested in limiting the scope of criminalization because they are not affected. Uh, by it because like prosecutors would typically mm, mm, use their discretion not to let's say charge for example middle class offenders so all of that uh leads me to one question like don't you think that by focusing on the uh, on the mm, mm, on the context of judicial decisions you might be missing a lot that it is conceivable to me i'm not saying that this is the case but this is conceivable that like at the criminal trial stage like all the decisions are super fair and every defendant uh, has uh, the same rights and so on and so forth. But still the system as a whole is unjust because of so much stuff that happens outside the criminal trial. Again, I'm not saying that this is the case, but again, again this is a, a challenge and I would be curious to hear uh, what, you, what you think about it. So probably I should, I should stop here. Again, a great project and I guess in a couple of days I will send you an email with my <laughs> other loose thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Piotr. Thank you uh, for your comments. And of course, it's always great to challenge some theoretical assumptions which we uh, present in our PhD thesis. And of course, to challenge every every part maybe uh, in in our presentation so we can uh, advance in our research. And of course, uh, thank you for the examples given and suggestions of literature, which uh, I hope that uh, Mila will use of. And one of the ideas of this PhD colloquium, as I already said, is actually this to uh, make a connection uh, between the PhD candidate and experts or uh, members of the academia who will help them in their research work uh, by giving them comments and by later on uh, being involved in the later stages of the writing and hopefully finalizing uh, the thesis. So uh, I will just give Mila a minute or two to give a, a sorry for the minute or two, but that's the lack of time, uh, uh, to, to give her feedback on your comments to Ambrose and to Piotr. Once again, thank you very much. Uh, so thank you once again from my side, uh, as it's obvious from your comments. So I'm like right now at the beginning of discussing the ideas and it's based on your ideas. Top uh, comments that it's too broad and too uh, note focused on certain stages. So, but when I was thinking about all these differences and social inequalities in, in front of the criminal courts, even when they are not directly connected to the offender's economic status, they always work in favor of the wealthy ones and never in the favor of, for example, uh, the poor ones. So even when it's hard to prove some offenses, uh, and it's really, it's true that they are not connected uh, to the offender's economic status, but they as well, uh, but they're like doing in the favor of more lenient treatment of the rich ones. So that was like, even my idea that why it is connected, even when we're comparing white collar crimes and street crimes, uh, all works always in the favor of uh, the ones from the higher status of the social ladder. So, but uh, I will just like uh, thank you again for your comments. I wrote them every, uh, all of them. So I will just think whether like that, as Piotr said, that focusing on the uh, the the phase in front of the courts is the right one. Since in America, really, there is a lot of literature regarding, for example. Uh, discriminatory uh, works of police, for example, and 
So, but uh, I didn't find anything similar in Serbia, but yeah, I will just think uh, more of it of all of your comments and then I will uh, write to Ambros and uh, probably answer to Piotr's email as soon as possible. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mila, and thank you to the both of commentators. And this is just the beginning, I, I would hope, of a fruitful cooperation in order to, to progress Mila's uh, paper. Thank you, Mila. Uh, thank you uh, once again. So um, I have the honor to next. I hope that uh, pa uh, Pablo Rivas is with us. Pablo, hi, hi. Do you hear us? Yes, you do. Can we just see if you can, uh, if we can hear you? Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, Pablo, just a question. Do you have a presentation? Oh, uh, sure. Um, can you give? Can you can you yes. make me a moderator? Or? Yes, of course, Mila. Molite, može samo Pablo da bude prezente. Just a second to make Pablo as a presenter. Oh. Yeah, brilliant. Now I can. Uh, let's Hi, we hear you. Share something. We can, can you share now? Yep. Uh, now I can present. Yes. Yes, we see. We see your presentation. Okay. So okay. Pablo, we well, will start now. So uh, Pablo Rivas Robledo is a PhD candidate for the University of Genova, Department of Law, and his mentors are uh, Andre Cristan and Valeria Ottonelli. And he will present his topic of his research and PhD thesis, if I'm not wrong, a revision and extension of List and Gooden's model of epistemic democra democracy, pardon. And uh, we have uh, an honor to have a commentator with us, uh, a professor, full-time professor at the Faculty of Political Science at the University of Belgrade, Professor Jorge Pavicevic. So, uh, Pablo, I will give you now the floor to present your topic in 12 to 15 minutes, and then Professor Giorgio will give his comments to your topic. Pablo? Yeah, thank you very much for the organization and um, for the commenters, because I initially didn't send any commentators because I didn't know how it was supposed to work, but thank you for the university, thank you to the University of Belgrade for finding uh, a commentator. So uh, I have to say that I am funded by uh, the uh, European Union and, uh, and uh, the Maria Skoldorowska Curie, uh, the Chloe Coffund, which is the, which the organization funding my research. And yeah, I'm a lawyer and a philosopher. I am at the University of Genova with professors Cristian and Ottonelli. And what I'm going to focus on today is just a short excerpt of the uh, research I've been doing so far. It is a tiny part of my, present, of my uh, dissertation. The whole thing is about how to improve the quality of participatory legislation through voting. That is how to improve decision in participatory policy making by, make, uh, by choosing the best voting rules. So, if you want to see the slides for this talk, they are available at the website that, that I'm listing at the end of the slide. If you want to keep them to, to, or to follow them uh, more closely, it's there. And I'm basically going to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to present today. I will run through the model that I'm going to discuss, then its limitations, the improvements that I'm going to present, and my, the limitations of my own model, and the open questions that I have for this. Uh, so, briefly, there is an existing model that generalizes the Condorcet jury theorem. I'm going to explain what's that. And the model has a computational limitation that I wish to overcome and a philosophical conclusion that I want to reject. So, the original model that you can find in this paper is called Epistemic Democracy Generalizing the Condorcet jury theorem by Christian List and Robert Gooding. 
uh, it starts with the basic premises for the Condorcet so jury theorem. That is, if given a choice between two alternatives, each member of a group has the probability of choosing the correct option that is better than random, but worse than perfect. So if these two things, if we meet these two things, there is a group, there is half a probability of greater than chance to, of choosing the correct um, option. The majority of the group has a higher probability than being correct than any member of the group and the probability of the majority choosing the correct option approaches one as the size of the group increases. I will show you, I will show you a little graph, a plot that summarizes this. Don't worry about it, about the specific details. But what basically this proves is that groups perform better than individuals and the larger the group, the better the group is. So if we have the size of the group, but they start with only 0.5 probability of arriving at the correct answer. They become better and better and better. And if we, you know, we um, abstract out this, we can see the how powerful it, uh, group decision making becomes. So with that in mind, basically this only works, of course, um, in uh, the in the situation I described: two alternatives, one group. And basically what the list I included in made was to extend the Condorcet jury theorem to more than two alternatives and to several other voting rules, especially uh, specifically pairwise Condorcet, the board account, Coombs, and her the hair quota. So the observation that they make in their work, is, among other things, this is just one of the uh, what I'm trying to analyze, is that they show that in general, all voting rules analyzed are similarly as good as any other. And their conclusion here is we don't have to say which is the best voting rule because they're equally good. And basically they conclude that if you just pick the voting rule that it's maybe logistically better for you to implement. Um, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to, before this, I'm going to throw some tables with some figures at you. I will explain what you, you should focus on. So basically this is part of the results of list and good in. This is um, basically where I'm going to discuss. And I want you to notice this missing values. Uh, I have received um, this missing values. This missing values, they could not compute because of computational limitations. That's why um, I'm going to get at. And basically, it's this and these two tables that I want you to uh, check this for a moment. So basically, from this table, just think that this is the extension that List and Gooding did. Uh, unfortunately, they couldn't arrive at the whole picture because they were missing these values. And this is basically measuring groups with a certain probability of arriving at the correct uh, answer, how good they perform when they are uh, at size of 11 agents, 51 agents, 101 agents, 301 agents, and so on. And from this table, which is the other main result from List and Gooding, is that if you shuffle around scenarios with different options, different probabilities, the boring rules seem to behave very similarly. That is, they are not much, there's no clear winner. And you can say, oh yeah, you know what? Board account is the best voting rule because in general, they perform, it, it performs better than any other voting rule. So uh, the limitations is one technical, one philosophical, as I've been like, saying. The technical, what I told you, there are missing values. The philosophical, I think that this does not give us a great picture because it's just telling us, hey, there is a number that we can associate with some a scenario, but it's not telling us what that number means. So what I'm going to try to do is to make some improvements. So I basically, I'm going to write a computational uh, a computer program that is better than the one that was created 20 years ago. That's the easy part, but the harder part will be like to compute the other values and of course, to give a sound philosophical argument. So the solving the technical issue, it was quite simple to reproduce the original model. Then I revise all the values provided cal and calculate the, uh, the missing values directly. And when not computationally possible, I use machine learning. Pablo, are you with us? 
I think that he's gone. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Julieta. No, this was so dramatic. No, just that's why we're laughing. It was so dramatic. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, he's gone. We lost him. Okay, we lost him. Okay. I sent him a message. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are just oh he, is he back? No, it's fully at No, we see Julieta and this was doing well, I think. We saw the, the presentation. He was the I one think there was a technical issue. On our side or their side? Yeah, it's it's on our side. He's back. He's back. He's back. Thank you. Julieta. See, I, I see that he was moving his mouse as, as, as the mouse is moving on the screen. Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, make fun of me, but this is not. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Uh, okay, you can continue, Pablo. Yes, we're waiting for you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Thank sorry. You. Uh, uh, on. I don't know where I lost the connection. Uh, you lost the co you. We had some technical issues while you were actually explaining us your technical issues in solving your thesis dilemma. So yeah, okay. that's, that's when we so lost. So I'll just get it back from here. Basically, what I did was to reproduce the original model, revise all the values provided, and when uh, it was not computationally possible to calculate the missing values, I just used um, logarithmic regression. So, which is one of the caveats of this project as you will see so what i some results here so the original model was very accurate i have some corrections here just basically because maybe we were using different software and so originally where most of the time so the original paper said this you know converged to zero i just prefer to say that it's 0 0.999 just to make the, when it gets to actually one, to make it more meaningful. There is one, uh, a small mistake here, but that doesn't matter. When it's really interesting, it's like I was able to calculate the missing values and go beyond the original model. And I can see that it's pretty accurate for the, for the, um, for the model that I'm analyzing. So it has extremely low p-value, at least for the, first two cases, which are these cases, by the way, if you're wondering. And for the last value, it's not as accurate as you can see, but well, it's still kicking. So I'm very satisfied with, um, with what I was able to achieve. So here you can see a full picture of what I did basically with, a, with, with everything with an asterisk is was, was computated, sorry, was approximated with the machine learning model. And the bottom line of this, if you want to skip the technical details, is like we can go now well beyond the original, the initial model using this mixed methodology of trying to calculate analytically when we can and using the machine learning model where we cannot. So good thing, the original model still holds and we can expand it as much as we can. And this is supposed to signify that there is like, you know, an empty road ahead of us and we have lots of this to discover it yet. Um, and on the philosophical side, I told you that originally all voting rules were the same. Sorry, that's a typo. That's a huge typo. Were the same because they perform similarly under the same circumstances. But we can reassess these criteria by analyzing not only in terms of how well they perform in these circumstances, in these cases that they threw at us, but also how fast can a group in those circumstances be as good as possible. So at which point they become infallible. Let me explain this a little bit better. I mean that uh, the following. So imagine a group that has a certain level of competence and there are rules that make this group. Uh, so we, now we ask ourselves, are the rules that will make this group wiser than other rules? So we need to add less people for the group to perform as good as they can. That's the question. And, and I love this from Canva. I can have this from and the answer is yes, uh, we can have it and we can calculate it straight 
if we just change the criteria and start focusing on when does a group become infallible with a certain level of competence. So if I have a group that has to choose between three options and they have a, a 0.6 probability of arriving at the correct option, which voting rule will get uh, will, is the fastest at becoming infallible. So this means that we're looking for the lowest value here at this, um, in this chart. So what I mean in this is like, let's take, for example, K, uh, case two, this is the minimum that we can perform. Well, oh, sorry, uh, no, uh, no, yeah, let's go with case two in this case, they have the group has a 0 0.51 probability of arriving at the correct answer. So we can say, hey, which is the voting rule that makes this group arrive at a probability of 0 0.99 the fastest? And well, it takes plurality vote with priority vote, they will need to have they will need they will sorry, they will need to be a hundred hundred and fourteen people for this to work, but only 74 in the case of border and 83 in the case of pay West Condorce. So the main idea for this is that the board accounts, uh, board account performs relatively better. And all the values that have an asterisk have been calculated using the machine learning model that was mentioned earlier. And well, some limitations of the work that I've sketched so far. So there are some intrinsic to the model. So whatever you can throw at the original Condorcet Jury theorem applies here, of course. All the discussion about there's nothing as the correct option. There is um, there is no infallibility in the real world. There's no empirical evidence for that. You can throw all of that. I agree. We can discuss about it. So I got, regarding the methodology, I was very lucky to discuss this with one of the authors of the original paper, namely with Christian List. And uh, he thinks the use of logarithmic regression is ad hoc at best. So it's just me to do uh, where I'm going to focus my efforts in the coming weeks is to make this same model, but using uh, Monte Carlo simulations, which is another method um, in the, that we can do to that we can use in philosophy to have like really cool results. And there is another limitation of this, which is the voting rules. I am being extremely narrow in the voting rules that I am analyzing. I am just basically analyzing for, and that it's not very good when it comes to this, because of course there are inf there are many many voting rules that deserve to be analyzed in this context, and I recognize this as a limitation. But it's also because I haven't been able to expand the model that much to other voting rules that have like ridiculous um, claim. Sorry, no, they are ridiculously difficult to compute. So well. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I This is the email where you can find me. I'm also at Twitter with that username. And again, if you are interested in the slides for this talk, you can find them at the website that is there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pablo, very much for your presentation. Even though we, we had some technical issues, we, we actually succeeded in resolving them. And I will immediately give the floor to Professor Giorgi Pavicevic, who will give you your comments. Thank you, Professor, once again, for being part of this PhD seminar. Thank you for giving me opportunity to give these comments. Uh, I have to admit that I'm not fully familiar with all these, these technical details of your calculation, especially about uh, this computing uh, uh, calculation, for example, uh, how you are using Monte Carlo simulation of warting for establishing prob probabilities and so on. Uh, and uh, the abstract was highly technical and it, it was impossible to see from the, the abstract uh, uh, how uh, it is possible uh, how uh, precisely you are using using that calculations uh, but uh, uh, beside that I have uh, I uh, will give some comments I'm not sure I'm right about 
uh, this comment, but uh, uh, I have a three or four comments. One is about limitation limitations. You already said that uh, there are uh, the same limitation as uh, in uh, original model, but uh, you said also uh, in your abstract that uh, you are going to extend the scope uh, uh, of application in terms of range of decisions and uh, group size. Uh, uh, I'd, I'd like you to know uh, what do you think, what do you expect, how much you can extend, uh, especially about the group size uh, uh, and because it is uh, applicable in some cases, but in some, some it, is, uh, it is not. Uh, the other uh, comment uh, is uh, uh, is more philosophical than than uh, mathematical in this uh, sense. Uh, it is about uh, exact moment when group when group became infallible infallible group. Uh, it was not present in in the abstract, but you said in your presentation that. Uh, this uh, uh, logarithmic uh, regression uh, is uh, uh, ad hoc, uh, it, it is a best ad hoc met method, uh, because uh, when you fill uh, this formula of uh, logarithmic regression, uh, you have to add some values there, figures, and uh, uh, you are assume you are using some databases and uh, uh, picking uh, how you are choosing uh, uh, correct decision from errors or incorrect incorrect uh, incorrect decision and then apply uh, a, a rule uh, then apply a logarithm how to establish the moment when uh, group Became became uh, became uh, infallible in this uh, in this uh, meaning, uh, and uh, and the next one is about. Uh, I was surprised uh, that uh, uh, from epistemic point point of view, uh, the method of aggregation of votes or. Uh, is uh, have almost the same value uh, in uh, <clears throat> uh, same, episte same epistemic value uh, because uh, when it comes to uh, some uh, to elections, for example, or some other uh, 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 we, 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 we obviously have. Uh, different uh, different results uh, concerning different method method of counting uh, counting references uh, or, or aggregation of aggregation of of words. Uh, and uh, does that mean that, for example, uh, different results can set, can have uh, the same epistemic value in, in, in this uh, in this sense uh, and uh, the last comment is about uh, 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 this uh, Monte Carlo simulation of what you are mentioning there uh, and uh, some uh, independent criteria or analytical criteria for uh, establishing uh, correctness of uh, of this of decision uh, because uh, even Boutin uh, in his book on epistemic uh, epistemic democracy uh, at the end said that, that, that uh, he relied on Monte Carlo uh, Monte Carlo simulation of voting but uh, uh, he said that in the large number of the decisions, uh, it is reliable, but uh, uh, if you like to establish correctness of one, two, or 
that uh, particular decision, uh, you need some independent analytical analytical tools. I'm asking that because uh, I'm now not completely in academic career. Uh, I have also political career, and I'm uh, making this group decision almost uh, every day. Uh, in practice, it means something. It means something different than. This is this is obvious. It is not necessary to explain that it is completely uh, different. But, but uh, uh, value of uh, majority voting voting uh, 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 in your model have to be compared to some in the in independent epistemic route to uh, establish value value of decision and. Uh, thank you for your efforts, and it's it's very valuable. And uh, uh, I'm really expecting to see and uh, how it's going, uh, how it is possible to improve uh, this uh, model, and uh, also how far you can go in your uh, calculations. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Professor, and thank you for actually. Um, uh, answering this very complex topic for us, for lawyers especially, uh, and for giving your comments and insights on Pablo's uh, presentation and his research uh, topic. Pablo, I will give you just because of the lack of the time, a minute or two to have a feedback on Professor's comments. And then, of course, uh, if you have any additional questions, I'll be free to forward you if your Professor agrees uh, his email address. Thank you. Pablo, you have the floor. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm looking for a table here. One of the tables. Yeah. So um, you asked one of the first things that you asked was about how much I can get into the group size. Well, um, granted that the functions stay below, since I am I'm calculating very low values. So interestingly enough, that makes that makes calculating this very, very simple once you have the training set. So I just want to point you to this number, for instance. I mean, as I know it's absurd, and that is one of the problems with the original model, but this says that a group of uh, more, um, that has more members that all the particles of the universe is going to be infallible if they have this probability. So I know this is outrageous and it's like yeah, not feasible, but I'm going with the calculations as I can. So what's the limit? I don't know. I can get pretty high high numbers here, but I think they're a mistake. So initially, I will tell you I can go to very, very, very high numbers, but that doesn't mean they are correct. So uh, there are like more conservative numbers that I think are consistent with this. Um, I'm gonna try. No, I don't have this table here. And I can't. No, I, I won't lose time with that. So I can go very high. So some so, something like yeah. This I think this this number, for instance, will be like this is like a group with thirty four or with point thirty four probability will have to be at as large as three hundred and fifty million to arrive at the correct answer if they only have this probability. So this is like a more like reasonable thing. So. Yeah, to, to narrow it down, how far can I get? Uh, really, really d down the rabbit hole. Um, so then you ask about the, yeah, the, I, I agree, like the use of the logarithmic regression, it's complete, sometimes completely unwarranted, and that's why I get these very bizarre uh, results. But I am looking into changing that into have a, like a more, conservative approach to this. I don't know if you could look into the into the abstract, but one of the problems here is like normally I have to to artificially cut the logarithmic function because it goes below one when it, sh it shouldn't, it should not. And well, there's that. And from an epistemic point of view, I mean, that's exactly what I'm trying to 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 argue against about at least with this model that they present, they said, hey, there are different methods that are going to have 
similar results, and this is the proof for that. The proof for that is that they perform similarly. But what I'm trying to tell you is, yeah, but you're not telling me how much, how much, how many people are here, how many people are here, and how many people are here. You're just telling me, hey, they perform the same under these scenarios with 51 voters. But you don't are not telling me, hey, how how fast can we get at 0 0.999 if we use this rule? So that's what I'm trying to do, basically, with the new criteria. With the new criteria, I'm trying to to say, OK, that's interesting that under these circumstances, we can have that. But uh, the interesting thing will be, will, will be to see where, how they, uh, at what point they become infallible. And um, yeah, so in the uh, last but not least, and in the day, uh, Bob Gooding yeah, mentions the use of the color simulations. And, but I still cannot comment on that because I'm working on it. So I agree with you. It looks very promising. But at the moment, I cannot say anything more that um, maybe read the paper in two years when it's published because I cannot comment. Um, I just started working on that. So thank you very much for the comments. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo, and good luck with your further research. And hopefully, maybe we can hear from you in two years with some novelties in your research in this part that you addressed to. Thank you, Professor Pavicevic. We will continue to last, but not the least, this is my favorite part, uh, to Brano Hladjustevic. Is Brano here? Hi, Brano. Uh, Brano is with us. He is a PhD student at the Faculty of Law, University of Belgrade, and his mentor is our esteemed Professor Goran Dajovic. But today we'll have the opportunity to have two professors, one from Sarajevo, one from Belgrade, to comment on his paper. It's Professor Miodra Jovanovic and Professor Damir Banovic, who will give your comments on the paper that you will present now. I will just move to make room for both the professors. Brano is today presenting uh, the topic legal reasoning and judicial activism, the case of Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Brano, do you have a presentation that you want to share? No, no. Brano, very well. Uh, uh, okay, Brano, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, we will just, you know, listen to you very carefully and you have the floor. Thank you once again, Brano. Respect the time and will be yours. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to participate in this great conference. So, as Maria said, my PhD thesis deals with legal reasoning and judicial activism. More precisely, it deals with legal reasoning and judicial activism of constitutional courts. And constitutional court of Bosnia and Herzegovina is just a case study. So, my PhD thesis. Uh, is divided into three parts. First part is devoted to legal reasoning. Second part is deals with the question um, what is judicial activism and uh, what are differences between judicial activism and similar judicial activities. And the third part is that case study uh, because I want to answer the question does the Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, act in an activist manner. So, uh, first part, as I said, deals with uh, legal reasoning. More precisely, I want to uh, answer the question, is the reasoning of constitutional courts legal reasoning or it is legal political reasoning? So, uh, <clears throat> in that part, it is important to uh, make difference between, uh, in my opinion, uh, institutions that create law and on one side and on the other side, there are institutions that apply the existing law. So, uh, legal reasoning is uh, on one side and political reasoning is on the other side. But in the case of constitutional courts, that difference uh, is not so obvious because constitutional courts uh, reasoning have both of those elements. Uh, I will try now just briefly to uh, explain the difference between legal reasoning and political reasoning. So legal reasoning is uh, constrained. There are many limits of uh, constitution of legal reasoning. As Frederick Schauer says, uh, 
interpretation and legal reasoning in general, that is like a frame. You have some space to interpret some constitutional provision, for example, but you don't have absolute freedom. On the other side, uh, when we speak about uh, political reasoning, uh, there are no such constraints or limits. So uh, I will argue in my PhD thesis that legal reasoning is based on legal reasons. And on the other side, uh, political reasoning is uh, based on non-legal reasons, for example, values, goals, and so on. Uh, when I say that legal reasoning is based on legal reasons, uh, it is important to also to stress that not any argument is acceptable in the case of legal reasoning. Only legal arguments are acceptable. So uh, legal texts, then methods of interpretation and so on. Those are legal reasons. Uh, also, it is important to stress that there is different difference between uh, decision making process on one side and justification of decision because uh, some decision can be uh, justified only by legal reasons. Uh, and that is the problem with constitutional courts, uh, because constitutional courts uh, decisions are not only based on legal reasons, in my opinion. So also there are some, <clears throat> let's say, uh, facts that cause that way of constitutional courts reasoning. For example, uh, constitution is very specific act, then constitutional provisions are uh, very broad. They are indeterminate. And those are some of the reasons uh, why constitutional courts uh, not only reason legally, but also politically. Uh, also, I will uh, try to, uh, in my PhD thesis, uh, I will try to say, what is judicial activism? And in order to give the concept of judicial activism, I think it is important to make the difference between judicial activism on one side and other uh, activities that are similar or connected with judicial activism. For example, uh, how to make difference between judicial activism on one side and interpretation. Then uh, what's the connection between judicial activism and uh, application of law creation of law, interpretation of law, and so on. Because uh, every constitutional court will say, uh, we, our decision is based on interpretation. But in my opinion, there are many constitutional court decisions that uh, cannot be, uh, they are not result of interpretation. I will uh, give you some example. Good uh, example of judicial activism are many decisions of Constitutional Court of Germany and Constitutional Court of Italy. For example, uh, a German federal constitution, constitutional court said it is unconstitutional. Political parties act is uh, unconstitutional because it stipulates that uh, only political parties that win more than 2.5% of the vote have rights to the compensation of campaign expenses. Uh, they said uh, that is unconstitutional because it would be constitutional if uh, instead of 2.5%, it um, was prescribed 1%. So uh, in this case, constitutional courts do not reason legally. In my opinion, legal reasoning in this case is just to say, this is unconstitutional and to give some legal arguments why uh, and but constitutional courts often make one step more as in this case because they do not only want to say what is unconstitutional they want to change uh legislator they want to sub substitute the legislature uh, also uh, i will try in my dissertation in my phd thesis to uh, give the concept of judicial activism uh, uh, in order to connect judicial activism with uh, political reasoning and uh, also with 
uh, creation and application of, of law. It is on one side um, creation of law because uh, constitutional courts often want to substitute, for example, legislator. Even uh, there are some cases where constitutional court wants to uh, substitute constitutional maker. There are different ways of, of how constitutional courts uh, are doing this. For example, uh, constitutional courts uh, often derive new constitutional principles from existing constitutional text, then they create new constitutional rights, then they uh, also are trying to reduce the normative context, uh, content of legal provision. For example, they expand the number of persons to whom constitutional provision apply, then, then uh, they often create a legal framework for the future activity of a uh, legislator that is case in Germany, for example. Uh, so, uh, reason, only legal reasoning, in my opinion. It is legal and political reason, or even in some cases, just political reasoning, because uh, I will, in my PhD thesis, uh, use the term institutional role of constitutional court. And I think that institutional role of constitutional court is to say this statute is not in accordance with constitution. But uh, constitutional courts are, they do not stop at the moment because they want to substitute the uh, legislator. So that is the problem. Also, uh, as I said, Bosnia and Herzegovina Constitutional Court will be a case study. And I will give you an example of their uh, judicial activism, in my opinion. So uh, Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, about 20 years ago, uh, made a decision related to the names of the cities in Republika Srpska. Uh, uh, because uh, there were some some cities called Serbian, for example, Serbian Sarajevo, and constitutional court said uh, that is not in accordance with constitution because it is discrimination of other peoples. So Bosniaks, Croats, and others are discriminated because uh, some town is called Serbian Sarajevo, and they 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 decided. Uh, to give opportunity to assembly of Republic of Srpska to change that name, but they didn't uh, fulfill the, uh, that. And so constitutional court made next step. And that is, in my opinion, uh, example of judicial activism. They said, okay, uh, you didn't uh, done your job, so we will uh, do uh, the next step in order to uh, make uh, that statute uh, in accordance with the uh, Constitution of Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, uh, Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina decided to apply geographic criterion, and instead of Serbian, uh, new cities got prefix East. So, Serbian Sarajevo uh, become East Sarajevo, and so on. There are several cities. So, in my opinion, this is a, a good example of judicial activism of constitutional court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, because the institutional role of any constitutional court uh, is not to uh, change existing uh, statutes or even constitution, uh, but only to say this is not in accordance with constitution. Uh, also, in uh, case law of Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, there are some examples that they do judicial review of political acts. For example, uh, I think last year they uh, reviewed the con constitutionality of declaration. And declaration is a political act. And also that is example uh, of judicial activism because uh, the in the concept of judicial, because the concept of judicial review is related to judicial review of legal acts, not polit political acts. 
And that is briefly the key points about my PhD thesis. Thank you. Thank you, Brano. Thank you very much. Especially thank you for the, the, the case law that you mentioned at the end. It was very interesting for me to hear about it. And without further ado, I will give the floor to Professor Mia Dragivanovic, who will no, no, no. be no, it will be Damir. Sorry, sorry once again. Sorry, it will be Damir. Damir, Professor Damir, who will now give you your comments and and hopefully. I'm very sorry, but this is the end of my session and I'm very tired. So if I made some mishap, it's my fault. Sorry, Professor Banovic will now give you the comments and Professor, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Maria. Maria. <laughs> and thank, uh, thank you, Brano, for, um, uh, for your um, short and clear presentation. And actually, I'm quite welcoming this um, research within the area of legal reasoning, um, because in my uh, mother's opinion, we don't have enough um, literature on this, especially in also in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also in Serbia. And I think you have a good uh, basis with the work of uh, also Professor Dajovic and uh, Professor Spajic, who wrote on this um, on these matters. And uh, also special welcome this idea to uh, to focus on the work of the Constitutional Court of Bosnia, oh, okay. because there is a uh, I think more political debate whether the uh, uh, Constitutional Court of Bosnia Herzegovina is uh, creating norms or just interpreting norms, and I think it's it's um, it's it's a good way uh, within the legal theory to uh, somehow demystify this uh, these concepts or to make it more clear. Uh, and I think it's also like um, that's why I think it's it's very important to uh, to continue this work within the uh, idea of legal reasoning. Um, but there is something which um, you also introduce something which is political reasoning, um, and I think also it's, it's in, in, somehow it's important to um, to make this um, in accordance with what 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 is difference between the political reason and legal reasoning, and. Um, Especially if you're um, um, putting this within the context of the constitutional law and constitutional court. So is this some kind of, so can we make this um, completely separate legal reason from political reasoning? I'm more clear, I mean, I'm more convinced what legal reasoning means, but I'm not really sure what this political reasoning actually means. But, and I think it's somehow very important to make these uh, conceptual differences, but also to put it in the context of the, I wrote it something which is constitutional law slash legal reasoning. So is, is constitutional law reasoning is different from the legal reasoning in the sense of like this national courts or first, first um, or appellate courts or Supreme Court. And then bringing this with uh, this idea of uh, judicial activities and ju judicial activism. So one, like to have this concept of legal reason, political reason, and then constitutional law reasoning, and then how to combine this. This is more a, co a comment or my my um, uh, my ideas on this, and then how to combine this with the, this idea of uh, judicial activism, and then. Um, is it possible to uh, somehow apply this uh, concepts uh, already made uh, in, within the area of constitutional court? So if constitutional court delivers a decision, is this a form of judicial activism? Or is this just a form of constitutional law reasoning? So can we make these differences between something which is political reasoning and then judicial activism slash constitutional law reasoning? And I think that if we make this clarification clearer, then we will have the path or methodological way to differentiate what is a political decision of the social court and what is judicial activism, or is this something which is within the scope of constitutional law reasoning? And I think it's I, I'm probably you're gonna you, you're already working on this, like to define what's legal reason, political reason, judicial activism. That's something which you have probably started with this. And then what I think is also quite important, like besides this defining concepts, is also defining the context of, uh, first, you also mentioned within your um, uh, proposal, uh, this idea of constitutional democracy. 
uh, this formal limitation of the legal reasoning and how we can actually oppose these uh, limitations uh, when it comes to the constitutional court. Um, third, I also wrote it, um, I think you also put it somewhere, um, the social political limitation of the legal reasoning, e.g. constitutional law reasoning. So if, if there are some kind of limitations or social context or political context, uh, some of the politi um, uh, uh, politi uh, not political uh, scientists actually wrote on the on the, on this more uh, more than actually um, uh, legal theorists on this uh, how actually political context can limit uh, this idea of legal reason or slash constitutional law reasoning, and then of course maybe to define what's the nature of constitutional law reasoning. So if you have these first concepts of uh, Different kind of legal reason, political reasoning, judicial activism, and then maybe to define what's constitutional law reasoning as a concept from, from which you're going to start analyzing the, the Bosnian uh, uh, case law. And then there's some, I, mean, I think, some concerns or some um, um, questions. Like um, I was writing uh, for some encyclopedia uh, an entry on law. It's actually a bit of comparative constitutional law. And one of the commentators actually uh, asked me to elaborate again if the constitutional law is law in the sense how we understand it in the, in the legal theory. So um, maybe this is, this is some, um, some window in, uh, in which you can also work. Um, so uh, can we actually apply this the same way of legal, re like this idea of legal reason when it comes to national courts, like in this within the framework of the national law or folk idea of what law is? And can we also uh, apply this to the to constitutional law? If there are still concerns, theoretical concerns of whether uh, constitutional law is law in this traditional or, um, I mean, traditional, let's say traditional sense. And then, uh, or more, to be more concrete, what are the sources of uh, constitutional law? So these are these are some kind of um, if if we say that sources of constitutional law are also values, then of course there are values and there are different ways of interpreting them and also creating norms which can be then applied to different cases. Then can we say that this is a creation or interpretation of specifically related to the constitutional law? Uh, I'm going to skip some things and then maybe maybe just to. Um, um, I also, I mean, I wrote some some comments regarding this this idea of judicial uh, judicial activism, and maybe to um, uh, um, uh, um, to compare concepts of activism versus interpretation, and also like judicial activism versus constitutional interpretation. So if um, it's much easier if you have like one on one side is interpretation or application, but if we bring these ideas of constitutional law interpretation. Maybe this there's going to be some overlapping within, between the concepts, and uh, and the last one I'm not going to take. Uh, I think I'm already talking ten minutes, and the last one um, cons uh, has some concerns when it comes to the case law of the constitutional court. Uh, first is this um, political and social context of the Boston society, but maybe. You don't I mean, you don't have to um, take this in, into consideration, but maybe this the nature of the Bosnian Constitution. Um, you, I mean, you're pro, I mean, you're, not, you're definitely we are all aware the how the Bosnian Constitution was written, and it is actually based on the American legal tradition. And the Brano disappeared. Is he here? Brano. Ah, okay. And you have I mean, you know that. Um, Just a second, sorry, professor. Brano, okay, he was freezed, that's why. Uh -huh. Are you there? Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so this nature, I mean, uh, when, we, when, we, when we make this step towards the case law, so we also have to have in mind this context, I mean, political, social context, but also the context of the Bosnian constitution, how short the constitution is. So it was written within the American legal tradition, so it needs some kind of activism. And I think uh, this should be put in the context in, uh, so if you're claiming that uh, constitutional court was active or created some norms, I think it's also because it, it was the need to create. You also said, for example, the constitutional law of Germany uh, was very active after the Second World War. 
And I think also there is this need for our constitutional court to be active in order to develop these uh, norms. And then um, maybe, uh, I, I mean, I, probably you're, go, you're gonna work more precisely on this, like um, when, you, when you pick the cases, uh, so what case law, how much, I mean, you pick these cases when the, um, uh, regarding the names and regarding the declaration of, of uh, actually this is a referendum case. So how many cases do we need? So this is more methodological in sense of how many cases do we need in order to establish this idea whether um, constitutional court created norms or were just marginal cases. So this is my some of my concerns and which criteria we're going to pick in order to to see uh, whether a constitutional court was active or not. Or but this is also of course. If when and how you um, uh, uh, define this concept of activism, of course, and legal reasoning, constitutional law reasoning. So this, this, I mean, this last actually part depends on the on the on the, on the first uh, uh, defining concepts. And uh, yeah, and I'm um, uh, congratulations for for this, and I'm quite uh, looking forward for your dissertations. Yes. Thank you, Professor Banovic. Um, I gather myself because I was very focused on your um, excellent feedback on Brano's um, presentation. And uh, now, before Brano giving you the chance to maybe give a feedback or comment to Professor Banovic, now I'll have the honor to announce the last commentator of this PhD colloquium and this ALF international session, Professor Miodrag Jovanovic. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Maria. First of all, maybe we should clarify why three of us are speaking in English in this uh, session, because it doesn't uh, look uh, uh -huh. in a way, uh, a natural way to proceed. But in a way, this is a kind of symbolical that Brano's uh, presentation is the last one, because we started exactly from uh, his application to the seminar as the first one, and then there was idea let's make an ALF uh, session and then we persuaded uh, Brano to uh, to deliver in English and I think that was a good idea because now uh, a number of other people uh, can also hear what he's working about and it's very valuable and interesting and since I'm the last one I will uh, use the opportunity to thank uh, to the masterminds of this operation, to Maria, Valeria, Anna, helping hand of other Anna, Mila, and others who invested their time, energy, efforts uh, to produce this great PhD colloquium. Uh, uh, Brano and I uh, have extensively uh, spoken about some aspects of his uh, PhD dissertation, so I will not go that much into detail uh, in this uh, particular uh, address. I would like to uh, just share my thoughts with the rest of the rest of the audience, and it's a considerable audience having in mind how late uh, it is. Uh, when you when you pick up the the, the introduction of Brano's uh, uh, kind of extended abstract to, to his dissertation, you have the impression, oh, this looks really uh, wonderful. From these three points, you can straightforwardly go to the end of the dissertation with, uh, without, uh, without uh, much difficulties. But on a more closer look, it transpires that each of these three questions, or at least the, the first two questions, uh, has to be uh, furthermore analytically unpacked. And then it turns out that uh, this is a very difficult task because as you uh, continue to read this uh, contribution, you... Uh, end up with more and more concepts that were introduced and and although they uh, they are intended to be clarificatory concepts for the main concepts like legal reasoning 
and judicial activism, it turned out that they are problematic themselves. So they are controversial themselves. So uh, in that respect, uh, I would like to give you a couple of suggestions. Maybe some of them I didn't mention while we were speaking last time. It was like 10 days ago. Uh, First suggestion is really to try to reduce as much as possible the number of concepts that you are introducing in the thesis. Uh, because to my mind, some of them need not be indispensable in your research. For instance, you have at the very beginning, you have judi uh, judicialization of politics, politicization of law. I mean, they need further kind of unpacking and i'm not sure whether they are of the essential relevance to the to what is uh your main uh, project and your main topic of of research and that that leads me to to the second to the second suggestion so even if you introduce some con concepts try to discuss them only to the extent that is necessary for the main topic of your presentation, because it's clear that these concepts are themselves uh, big enough to be the topics of a separate research. So you can obviously extend or go uh, in, in, in kind of in, uh, not only in depth, but going uh, far beyond what is necessary for your research. So try to restrict because it's one of the of the clear things when you are writing a PhD thesis, you have to put some limitation and to say, OK, now I should stop. And there is always a tendency that when you find some concept and you start to dig and you go uh, then in that direction more and more and more. And then eventually you lose yourself in, in doing in doing that thing. Uh, uh, and then there is a third suggestion. I think I, I haven't mentioned it uh, uh, or we haven't raised it in our discussion. Sometimes we were together, Goran Boyan and I, with you discussing this topic. And I think that you haven't mentioned it. No, I don't think. I'm sure you haven't mentioned it in this extended uh, abstract. And that's uh, the question of different functions of constitutional courts. Uh, what I have in mind is nowadays uh, two clearly uh, developed functions of constitutional courts, at least at the, at the European soil, uh, where a number of constitutional courts follow German model. So you have the traditional role of assessing constitutionality of lower legal acts, but you also have, as we know, the role of constitutional court in addressing constitutional complaints. So these two functions of the constitutional court are quite different. And as far as I know, you haven't tackled these problems, having in mind specificities of these two separate functions of the constitutional court. Just to, to bring one uh, obvious uh, uh, specificity, for instance, when constitutional court has to address the constitutional complaint, very often you have some very important factual elements of the case uh, that are sometimes crucial for deciding whether constitutional right or freedom was violated or not. Obviously, constitutional courts do not act as regular courts. They do not assess facts. But uh, in a certain uh, cases, this is a very important uh, element. They sometimes rely on certain, you know, like factual ground, with which uh, furthermore may be uh, of relevance for your uh, distinction between what is legal, what is political reasoning, what is judicial activism, and what is not. Uh, just to, to give you uh, 
two examples that uh, come to my mind, although I think you maybe even mentioned it. For instance, uh, you have the problems that you mentioned, you can, uh, they could be raised in both uh, operation of the constitutional courts. For instance, Serbian constitutional court was called upon to assess the constitutionality of the so-called Brussels agreement that were uh, made between uh, uh, Serbian government and Kosovo government. And the court found itself uh, on, the, on, the, on the terrain in which it decided that it's a political, it's a political act, not a legal act. It's a political agreement, not a legal agreement. So it was not entirely in line with the political question doctrine, but you can kind of filter this decision even through this political question doctrine. Or on the other hand, you mentioned that sometimes constitutional courts deciding on certain constitutional provisions uh, kind of create new rights and freedoms. And you mentioned German constitutional court and just uh, crossed my mind the, the one of the, it's not now a recent decision, uh, maybe 10 or some 10, 12 years ago, when they uh, basically, in a way, invented a new constitutional right to informatical uh, uh, self-determination and informatical privacy, which was uh, uh, kind of established as a part of the constitutional right to privacy. And it was very much elaborated as a, uh, as a part of this constitutional freedom. Of course, these cases also uh, pinpoint the main problem that you will have, and we discussed this uh, uh, quite extensively. What is the threshold for deciding uh, what counts as activism? That's that's the key uh, kind of problem that you you will have to solve. But I will not take more of your time because uh, Damir also brought some of the issues. Uh, some of the issues we were talking about, that would be enough uh, for, for this evening. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Jovanovic, once again for your remarks and uh, especially for the suggestions that you made for Brano. And Brano, now, uh, if you want, you can have a minute or two just to give a feedback on the comments of both of our professors. Okay. Thank you, professors, for these very useful comments. Uh, I will try to be uh, very short and to answer the some questions you mentioned. Uh, first, difference between legal and political reasoning in my PhD thesis. Uh, in first part, that is the central question. I will uh, extensive, ex extensively try to make that difference between legal reasoning and political reasoning. reasoning. Uh, I said difference is in one sentence. Uh, difference between legal reasoning and political reasoning is uh, that legal reasoning is based on legal reasons and on the other si side there are non-legal reasons. For example, values. Legislat legislator uh, reason politically. They want to uh, get some value, some goal, for example, and so on. And but uh, legal and political reasoning are similar because they are practical reasoning. And I will try to explain uh, not only differences but also that that similar point, uh, practical reasoning. Also, you mentioned uh, constitutional law reasoning as new term. It has a uh, significant place in my PhD thesis also. And in order to describe constitutional law uh, reasoning, I will try to uh, explain those political reasoning elements and legal uh, reasoning elements. And also, uh, you said it is important to uh, get something, uh, it is important to take into uh, consideration social contexts. In my um, but the definition of judicial activism, uh, one of the typical elements is that constitutional court tries to uh, get some uh, legitimate aim. But uh, my dissertation is not devoted to, uh, uh, to say what it should be. I just want to stay on descriptive 
uh, not on normative field. And so uh, on some places, there will be some uh, social context import, uh, facts, and I will try to explain those legitimate aims, but um, also we mentioned constitutional complaints. Uh, it is uh, important that we have in mind that not only uh, human rights are uh, important with, uh, without taking into consideration other values. In my opinion, uh, in order to keep human rights, it is also important to uh, take into consideration that separation of powers is also one value. Uh, and uh, constitutional court, uh, in order to protect one value, for example, some human right and freedom, uh, they uh, they uh, does not uh, take in, into consideration that separation of powers is also a uh, value. So I don't know, we should some proportion, proportionality test maybe do here in order to say what is more important. But in my opinion, uh, separation of powers is very important. And that is the main reason because I have some maybe critics of that acting of constitutional uh, courts. Uh, also, I would like to comment uh, Professor Jovanovic's uh, uh, comment about uh, uh, my concept. There are many concepts. I will try to reduce them, but um, I think that, for example, uh, judicaliz judicalization and politicization, they are important questions, although I understand uh, that it is important to write several pages about them. For example, one footnote or one page is enough and in uh, I will try to uh, incorporate all these useful comments you said in my PhD thesis and thank you once again for great comments. Thank you. Thank you, Brano. And uh, do you professors have anything else or maybe a follow up on Brano's comments? Not. Okay, uh, one thing I wanted to say for the end, it is um, just to comment on what Professor Jovanovic said. It is very um, good that, Brano, you were the last, but actually you were the first, the one that we uh, wanted to start this international ALF session. So it's in a way symbolic. And you were the one who submitted the Serbian concept of your paper and, of course, the English one. And now we had nine PhD uh, candidates and afterwards 20 commentators. So I would say that this was a successful session and uh, hopefully it was useful uh, for you, PhD candidates, as this was the main point and main purpose of this session and the PhD colloquium as well. Uh, for the end, uh, I would like to thank really everyone who firstly participated in the organization, uh, my colleagues behind me, uh, 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 Valeria and Anna, and of course my colleagues from the ALF team, and of course finally to the PhD candidates and PhD commentators, our esteemed professors and colleagues from the academic uh, world. Uh, I really thank you for your time, for your patience, for uh, your comments and useful feedback that really help our PhD candidates in their, I would say, a difficult path, but successful pa path, hopefully, to finish their thesis and to defend it and to progress further on in their researcher career. So, if you don't mind, I will now officially and solemnly close this session and close the PhD, the third seminar for the PhD students and candidates. Thank you very much again and hope to see you last <laughs>